and by a regiment of Georgian cavalry, eager to strike against the infidel capital. At the end of 1257, the Mongol army moved down from its base at Hamadan. Bhikkhu with his troops crossed the Tigris at Mosul and marched down the west bank. Kitbuka and the left wing entered the plain of Iraq due east of the capital while Hulagu and the center advanced through Kermanshah. The caliph's main army started out under Abeg to meet Hulagu, when it heard of Bhikkhu's approach from the northwest. Abeg recrossed the Tigris, and, on 2 January 1258, he came upon the Mongols near Anbar, about 30 miles from Baghdad. Bikhu feigned to retreat and so lured the Arabs into a low marshy terrain. He sent engineers to cut the dikes of the Euphrates behind them. Next day the battle was renewed. Abeg's army was driven back into the flooded fields. Only Abeg himself and his bodyguard managed to escape through the waters to Baghdad. The bulk of his troops perished on the battlefield. The survivors fled into the desert and dispersed. 1258, the Mongols sacked Baghdad on the 18th of January. Hulag appeared before the east walls of Baghdad, and by the 22nd, the city was completely invested, with bridges of boats constructed across the Tigris just above and just below the city walls. Baghdad lay on both sides of the river. The western city, which had contained the palace of the earlier caliphs, was now less important than the eastern, where the government buildings were concentrated. It was against the eastern walls that the Mongols made their heaviest attacks. Almustasim began to lose hope. At the end of January he sent the vizier, who had always advocated peace with the Mongols, together with the Nestorian Patriarch, who, he hoped, might intercede with Dokyuz Katun, to try to treat with Hulagu, they were sent back without obtaining an audience. After a terrible bombardment during the first week of February, the eastern wall began to collapse. On the 10th of February when Mongol troops were already swarming into the city, the caliph emerged and surrendered himself to Hulagu, together with all the chief officers of the army and officials of the state. They were ordered to lay down their arms and then were massacred. Only the caliph's life was spared until Hulagu entered the city and the palace on Is February. After he had revealed to his conqueror the hiding place of all his treasure, he too was put to death. Meanwhile massacres continued throughout the whole city. Those that surrendered quickly and those that fought on were like slain. Women and children perished with their men. One Mongol found in a side street forty newborn babies whose mothers were dead. As an act of mercy he slaughtered them, knowing that they could not survive with no one to suckle them. The Georgian troops, who had been the first to break through the walls, were particularly fierce in their destruction. In forty days some eighty thousand citizens of Baghdad were slain. The only survivors were a few lucky folk whose hiding places in cellars were not discovered, and a number of attractive girls and boys who were kept to be slaves, and the Christian community, which took refuge in the churches and was left undisturbed, by the special orders of Dokyu's Katun. By the end of March the stench of decaying corpses in the city was such that Hulagu withdrew his troops for fear of pestilence. Many of them left with regret, believing that there were still objects of value to be found there. But Hulagu now possessed the vast treasure accumulated by the Abbasid caliphs through five centuries. After sending a handsome proportion to his brother Mongka, he retired by easy stages back to Hamadan, and thence into Azerbaijan, where he built a strong castle at Shaha, on the shore of Lake Ermaya, as a storehouse for all his gold and precious metals and jewels. He left as governor of Baghdad the form of his ear, Muad, who was closely supervised by Mongol officials. The Nestorian patriarch, Makika, was given rich endowments and a former royal palace as his residence and church. The city was gradually cleaned and tidied, and forty years later it was a prosperous provincial town, a tenth of its former size. News of the destruction of Baghdad made a deep impression throughout Asia. The Asiatic Christians everywhere rejoiced. They wrote in triumph of the fall of the Second Babylon and hailed Hulagu and Dokyu's Katun as the new Constantine and Helena, God's instruments for vengeance on the enemies of Christ.
To the Muslims it was a ghastly shock and a challenge. The Abbasid Caliphate had for centuries been shorn of much material power, but its moral prestige was still great. The elimination of the dynasty and the capital left the leadership of Islam vacant, for any ambitious Muslim leader to seize. The Christian satisfaction was short-lived. It was not long before Islam conquered its conquerors. But the unity of the Muslim world had suffered a blow from which it could never recover. The fall of Baghdad, following half a century after the fall of Constantinople in 1204, put an end forever to that old balanced ducky between Byzantium and the Caliphate under which Near Eastern humanity had flourished for so long. The Near East was never again to dominate civilization. 1259 the Mongols enter Syria after the destruction of Baghdad Hulaga turned his attention to Syria. The first step was to strengthen the Mongol hold over the Jazeera and in particular to repress the Ayyubite prince of Maya Farrakhin, Al-Kamil, who refused to accept Mongol suzerainty and had gone so far as to crucify a Jacobite priest who had visited him as Hulaga's envoy. Before he left his encampment near Maraga Hulaga received envoys from many states. The old Atabeg of Mosul, Badrad Din Lulu, came to apologize for past misdeeds. The two Seljuk sultans, sons of Khosrau, Kaikaus II and Kilij Aslan IV, arrived soon afterwards. The former, who had opposed Baku in 1256, vainly tried to placate Hulaga by fulsome flattery which shocked the Mongols. Finally in Nazir Yusuf, ruler of Aleppo and Damascus, sent his own son, Al-Aziz, to pay humble duty to the conqueror. Mayyaf Arakin was besieged and captured early in 1260, largely thanks to the help of Hulaga's Georgian and Armenian allies. The Muslims were massacred and the Christians spared. Al-Kamil was tortured by being forced to eat his own flesh till he died. In September 1259, Tulaga led the Mongol army out for the conquest of northwest Syria. Kitbuka led the van, Biku the right wing, another favorite general, Sunjak, the left, while Hulaga himself commanded the center. He advanced through Nisabin, Haran and Ilissa to Bayrajik, where he crossed the Euphrates. Saruj attempted to resist him, and was sacked. Early in the new year the Mongol army closed in round Aleppo. As its garrison refused to surrender, the city was invested on the 18th of January. The Sultan and Nazir Yusuf was at Damascus when the storm broke. He had hoped that the presence of his son at Ulaga's camp would avert the danger. When he found that he was wrong, he made the still more humiliating move of offering to accept the suzerainty of the Mamluks of Egypt. They promised him help, but were in no hurry to provide it. In the meantime he gathered an army outside Damascus, and summoned his cousins of Hama and Kerak to his aid. But while he waited there some of his Turkish officers began to plot against him. He discovered their plans in time, and they fled to Egypt, taking with them one of his brothers. Their defection so weakened his army that he gave up all hope of going to the rescue of Aleppo. Aleppo was bravely defended by a Nazir Yusuf's uncle, Tarantia. But after six days of bombardment the walls crumbled and the Mongols poured into the town. As elsewhere, the Muslim citizens were given over to be massacred and the Christians spared, apart from some of the Orthodox whose church had not been recognized in the heat of the carnage. The citadel held out for four more weeks under Tarantia. When at last it fell Hulaga showed himself to be unexpectedly clement. Tarantia was spared because of his age and his bravery and his suite was untouched. A vast hoard of treasure fell into the conqueror's hands. Tulaga allotted Aleppo to the former emir of Horns, Al-Ashraf, who had had the foresight to come as a client to the Mongol camp a few months before. Mongol advisors and a Mongol garrison were provided to keep him in control. 1260, the fall of Damascus the fortress of Hank, on the road from Aleppo to Antioch, Next had to be punished for refusing to surrender unless Hulaga's word was guaranteed by a Muslim. When it had been captured with the usual massacre, Hulaga came to the frontier of Antioch. 
the king of Armenia and his son-in-law the prince of Antioch visited his camp to pay him homage. Hethum had already provided him with auxiliaries and had been rewarded with some of the spoil from Aleppo, while the Seljuk princes had been ordered to retrocede to him their father's conquests in Cilicia. Bohemond was also rewarded for his deference. Various towns and forts that had belonged to the Muslims since Saladin's day, including Latakia, were given back to the principality. In return, Bohemond was required to install the Greek patriarch, Euthymius, in his capital in place of the Latin. Though King Hethum was not well disposed towards the Greeks, Tulago understood the importance of their element at Antioch. It is possible that his friendly relations with the Emperor at Nicaea gave him a further inducement. To the Latins, a take of Bohemond's subservience seemed disgraceful especially as it involved the humiliation of the Latin church at Antioch. Venetian influence was still paramount in the kingdom, and the Venetians were on good commercial terms again with Egypt. Their interest depended on the trade from the Far East traveling by the southern route, up the Persian Gulf or the Red Sea. They watched with growing concern the Mongol caravan routes across Central Asia to the Black Sea, where the Genoese, with their alliance with the Greeks were strengthening their control. The government to take a look round for a lay protector. It was known that Charles of Anjou, the French king's brother, had Mediterranean ambitions and was already intriguing for the Sicilian throne. An anxious letter was sent in May 1260, to describe the dangers of the Mongol advance and to beg him to intervene. By the time that the letter was written, the Mongols were masters of Damascus. The Sultan and Nazir Yusuf made no attempt to defend his capital. On the news of the fall of Aleppo and the approach of a Mongol army he fled to Egypt, to take refuge with the Mamluks, then changed his mind and was captured by the Mongols as he rode northward again. Hama sent a delegation to Hulagu in February 1260, offering him the keys of the city. A few days later the notables of Damascus followed suit. On the 1st of March Kitbuko entered Damascus at the head of a Mongol army. With him were the king of Armenia and the prince of Antioch. The citizens of the ancient capital of the Caliphate saw for the first time for six centuries three Christian potentates ride in triumph through their streets. The citadel held out against the invaders for a few weeks, but was reduced on the 6th of April. With the three great cities of Baghdad, Aleppo, and Damascus fallen it seemed that the end of Islam in Asia had arrived. In Damascus, as everywhere else in Western Asia, the Mongol conquest meant the resurgence of the local Christians. Kitbuka, as a Christian himself, made no secret of his sympathies. For the first time since the 7th century the Muslims of Inner Syria found themselves a repressed minority. They burned for revenge. During the spring of 1260, Kitbuka sent detachments to occupy Nablus and Gaza, though they never reached Jerusalem itself. The Franks were thus completely surrounded by Mongols. The Mongol authorities had no intention of attacking the Frankish kingdom, provided that it showed them sufficient deference. The wiser Franks were ready to avoid provocation, but they could not control their hotheads. The most irresponsible of the barons was Julian, Lord of Sidon and Beaufort, a large, handsome man, but self-indulgent and foolish, with nothing of the subtle intelligence of his grandfather, Reynold. His extravagance had already forced him to pledge Sidon to the Templars, from whom he had borrowed vast sums, and his bad temper had involved him in a quarrel with Philip of Tyre, who was his half-uncle. He had married one of King Hethum's daughters, but his father-in-law had no influence over him. The wars between the Mongols and the Muslims seemed to him to offer a good opportunity for a raid from Beaufort into the fertile Bika. But Kitbuka was not going to have the newly established Mongol order upset by raiders. He sent a small troop under a nephew of his to punish the Franks. Julian then summoned his neighbors to his aid, and they ambushed and slew the nephew. Kitbuka then angrily sent a larger army which penetrated into Sidon and ravaged the town, though the castle of the sea was saved by Genoa's ships from Tyre. King Hethum when he heard of it was furious, and blamed the Templars, who had taken advantage of Julian's losses to foreclose on Sidon and Beaufort. 
a raid conducted shortly afterwards by John II of Beirut and the Templars into Galilee met with equally severe treatment at the hands of Mongol auxiliaries. 1259, death of the great Khan Mongka Kitbuka, however, was unable to embark on greater enterprises. On 2 August 1259, the great Khan Mongka had died while campaigning with his brother Kubilai in China. His sons were young and untried. The army in China therefore pressed for the succession of Kubilai. But Mongka's youngest brother, Arik Boga, controlled the homeland, including Karakoram and the central treasury of the empire, and he desired the throne for himself. After several months of maneuvering and discovering who was his friend, each of the two brothers held a guerrilla in the spring of 1260, which elected him as Supreme Khan. Arik Boga was supported by most of his imperial relatives who were in Mongolia, while Kubilai had the stronger support amongst the generals. Neither Arilte was strictly legal as all the branches of the family were not represented. Neither side was prepared to wait until Hulagu and the princes of the Golden Horde or even of the House of Jagatai were informed and sent their delegations. Hulagu himself favoured Kubilai, although his son Shomagha was of Arik Boga's party, while Burke, Khan of the Golden Horde, sympathized with Arik Boga. It was only at the end of 1261 that Kubilai finally crushed Arik Boga. In the meantime, Hulaga cautiously remained close to his eastern frontier, ready to move into Mongolia should it become necessary. He had reasons for anxiety. Arik Boga intervened autocratically in affairs of the Turkestan Khanate, displacing the regent Organa by her husband's cousin, Alghu whose later defection and marriage with Organa contributed largely to Kubilai's victory. Hulaga feared a similar intervention into his own dominions. He was moreover on worsening terms with his cousins of the Golden Horde. While his court showed strong Christian sympathies, the Khan Burke was definitely moving into the Muslim camp and disapproved of Hulaga's anti-Muslim policy. There was friction in the Caucasus which was the frontier between Burke's and Hulaga's spheres of influence. Burke and his generals continually persecuted the Christian tribes, but Hulaga's attempt to establish his authority on the north side of the mountains was thwarted when one of his armies was severely defeated by Burke's grand-nephew Nogai near the river Tirik in 1269. With these preoccupations, Hulagu was obliged to withdraw many of his troops from Syria as soon as Damascus was taken. Kitbuka was left to govern the country with a greatly reduced command. Unfortunately for the Mongols, their advance into Palestine provoked the one great unbeaten Muslim power, the Mamluks of Egypt, and the Mamluks were now in a fit state to take up the challenge. The first Mamluk Sultan, Abek, had been unsure of his position. To legitimize himself, he had not only married the Dowager Sultana Shajar ad Dur but had appointed an infant Ayyubite prince as co Sultan. But the little Al Ashraf Mus accounted for nothing and soon was found to be a useless expense, and in 1257 Abek quarreled with the Sultana. She was not prepared to be insulted by an upstart, and on the 15th of April she arranged for his murder by his eunuchs as he was taking his bath. His death almost provoked a civil war, some of the Mamluks crying for vengeance against the Daija, others supporting her as the symbol of legitimacy. Eventually her enemies won. On the 2nd of May 1257, she was beaten to death, while Abek's 15-year-old son, Nair ad-Din Ali, was made sultan. But the youth neither represented a respected dynasty nor had himself the personality of a leader. In December 1259, he was deposed by one of his father's former comrades, Saif ad-Din Qutuz, who became sultan in his place. On his accession various Mamluks such as Bayibuz, who had fled to Damascus from dislike of Abek, returned to Egypt. 1260, the Mamluks asked for help from the Franks early in 1260 Hulaga sent an embassy to Egypt to demand the Sultan's submission. Qutuz put the ambassador to death and prepared to meet the Mongols in Syria. It was at this moment that news of Mongka's death and of the civil war in Mongolia obliged Hulaga to remove the greater part of his army away to the east. The troops left with Kitbuka were considerably fewer than those which Qutuz now collected. 
Besides the Egyptians themselves there were the remnants of the Khwarezmian forces and troops from the Ayyubite prince of Kerak. On the 26th of July the Egyptian army crossed the frontier and marched on Gaza, with Bayibaz leading the van. There was a small Mongol force at Gaza, under the general Bayida. He sent to warn Kitbuka of the invasion, but before help could arrive, his men were overwhelmed by the Egyptians. Kitbuka was at Baalbek. He prepared at once to march down past the Sea of Galilee into the Jordan Valley, but he was held up by a rising of the Muslims in Damascus. Christian houses and churches were destroyed, and Mongol troops were needed to restore order. Meanwhile Qutuz decided to march up the Palestinian coast and strike inland further north, to threaten Kitbuka's communications if he advanced into Palestine. An Egyptian embassy was sent therefore to Acre to ask for permission to pass through Frankish territory and to obtain provisions on the march, if not active military aid. The barons met together at Acre to discuss the request. They were feeling bitter against the Mongols owing to the recent sack of Sidon, and they were distrustful of this oriental power with its record for wholesale massacre. Islamic civilization was familiar to them, and most of them much preferred the Muslims to the native Christians to whom the Mongols showed such favor. They were at first inclined to offer the Sultan some armed auxiliaries. But the Grand Master of the Teutonic Order, Anno of Sanjahorsen, warned them that it would be unwise to trust the Muslims very far, especially if they were to become elated by victory over the Mongols. The Teutonic Order had many possessions in the Armenian Kingdom, and Anno probably appreciated King Hethum's policy. His prudent words had some effect. The military alliance was rejected, but the Sultan was promised free passage and victualling facilities for his army. During August, the Sultan led his army up the coast road and encamped for several days in the orchards outside Acre. Several of the emirs were invited to visit the city as honored guests, and amongst them was Bayibaz, who on his return to the camp suggested to Qutuz that it would be easy to take the place by surprise. But Qutuz was not ready to be so perfidious nor to risk Christian reprisals while the Mongols were still unbeaten. The Franks grew somewhat embarrassed by the number of their visitors, but were consoled by a promise that they should be allowed to buy at reduced prices the horses that would be captured from the Mongols. 1260, the Battle of Ain Jalad While he was at Akakchus learned that Kitbuka had crossed the Jordan and had entered eastern Galilee. He at once led his army southeastward through Nazareth, and on the 2nd of September he reached Ain Jalad, the pools of Goliath, where the Christian army had defied Saladin in 1183. Next morning the Mongol army came up. The Mongol cavalry was accompanied by Georgian and Armenian contingents, but Kitbuka lacked scouts, and the local population was unfriendly. He did not know that the whole Mamluk army was close by. Qutuz was well aware of his own superiority in numbers. He therefore hid his main forces in the hills nearby, and only exposed the vanguard led by Bayibaz. Kitbuka fell into the trap. He charged at the head of all his men into the enemy that he saw before him. Bayibaz retreated precipitately into the hills, hotly pursued, and suddenly the whole Mongol army found itself surrounded. Kitbuka fought superbly. The Egyptians began to waver, and Qutuz entered the battle himself to rally them. But after a few hours the superior numbers of the Muslims made their effect. Some of Kitbuka's men were able to cut their way out, but he refused to survive his defeat. He was almost alone when his horse was killed and he himself was taken prisoner. His capture ended the battle. He was taken bound before the Sultan, who mocked at his fall. He answered defiantly, prophesying a fearful vengeance on his victors and boasting that he, unlike the Mamluk emirs, had always been loyal to his master. They struck off his head. The Battle of Ain Jalad was one of the most decisive in history. It is true that owing to events that had occurred 4,000 miles away, the Mongol army in Syria was too small to be able, without great good fortune, to undertake the subjection of the Mamluks. And it is true that had a greater army been quickly sent after the disaster, the defeat might have been retrieved.
but the contingencies of history forbade the reversal of the decision made at Ain Jalad. The Mamluk victory saved Islam from the most dangerous threat that it has ever had to face. Had the Mongols penetrated into Egypt there would have been no great Muslim state left in the world east of Morocco. The Muslims in Asia were far too numerous ever to be eliminated but they would no longer have been the ruling race. Had Kit Buka, the Christian, triumphed, the Christian sympathies of the Mongols would have been encouraged, and the Asiatic Christians would have come into power for the first time since the great heresies of the pre-Muslim era. It is idle to speculate about the things that might have happened then. The historian can only relate what did in fact occur. Ain Jalad made the Mameluk Sultanate of Egypt the chief power in the Near East for the next two centuries, till the rise of the Ottoman Empire. It completed the ruin of the native Christians of Asia. By strengthening the Muslim and weakening the Christian element it was soon to induce the Mongols that remained in Western Asia to embrace Islam. And it hastened the extinction of the Crusade states, for, as the Teutonic Grand Master foresaw, the victorious Muslims would be eager now to finish with the enemies of the faith. The Mongols in Syria five days after his victory the Sultan entered Damascus. The Ayyubite al Ashraf, who had deserted the Mongol cause, was reinstated in Horns. The Ayyubite Emir of Hama, who had fled to Egypt, returned to his emirate. Aleppo was recovered within a month. Tulagu, angry as he was at the loss of Syria, could do nothing till order was restored in the heart of the Mongol Empire. He sent troops to recover Aleppo in December, but after a fortnight they were forced to retire, having massacred a large number of Muslims in reprisal for the death of Kit Buka. But that was all that Hulaga could achieve to avenge his faithful friends. The Sultan Qutuz set out on the return journey to Egypt covered with glory. But, Though Kitbuka's prophecy of vengeance was never wholly fulfilled, his taunt of the disloyalty of the Mamluks very soon was justified. Qutuz had grown suspicious of his most active lieutenant, Bayibuz, and when Bayibuz demanded to be made governor of Aleppo, the request was brusquely refused. Bayibuz did not wait long to take action. On the 23rd of October 1260, when the victorious army reached the edge of the delta, Qutuz took a day's holiday to go hunting hares. He set out with a few of his emirs, including Bayibuz and some of his friends. As soon as they were well away from the camp, one of them came up as though to make a request of the Sultan, and while he firmly held him by the hand as though he was going to kiss it, Bayibuz rushed up from behind and dug his sword into his master's back. The conspirators then galloped back to the camp and announced the murder. The Sultan's chief of staff, Akhtai, was in the royal tent when they arrived and at once asked which of them had committed the murder. When Bayibuz admitted that it was he, Akhtai bade him sit on the Sultan's throne and was the first to pay him homage, and all the generals in the army followed his example. It was as Sultan that Bayibuz returned to Cairo. Chapter If Sultan Bayibuz and the Egyptians will I give over into the hand of a cruel lord, and a fierce king shall rule over them. Isaiah 19, 4 Ruknad Din Bayibuz Bundukdari was now approaching his 50th year. He was a Kipchak Turk by birth, a huge man with a brown skin, blue eyes and a loud resonant voice. When he came first to Syria as a young slave, he was offered for sale to the Emir of Hama, who examined him and thought him too coarse a lout. But a Mamluk Emir, Bundukdar, noticed him in the market and sensed his intelligence. He was bought for the Sultan's Mamluk guard. Thenceforward he had risen rapidly, and since his victory over the Franks in 1244 he had been marked as the ablest of the Mamluk soldiers. He now showed that he was a statesman of the highest caliber, unimpeded by any scruple of honor, gratitude or mercy. His first task was to establish himself as Sultan. In Egypt he was accepted without demur, but at Damascus another Mamluk Emir, Sinjar al-Halabi, seized the power. Sinjar was popular in Damascus, and the simultaneous attack of the Mongols on Aleppo threatened Bayibuz's control of Syria. But the Ayyubite princes of Horns and Hama defeated the Mongols, while Bayibuz marched on Damascus and routed Sinjar's troops outside the city on 17 January 1261. 
the citizens of Damascus fought on for Sinja, but their resistance was stamped out. Bayibuz went on to deal with the Ayubites. The prince of Kerak was induced by pleasant promises to put himself into the sultan's power and was quietly eliminated. Al Ashraf of Horns was allowed to retain his city till his death in 1263, when it was annexed. It was only at Hama that a branch of the family was able to last on, closely supervised, for another three generations. Bayibaz also wished to give his government a religious sanction. Some Bedouins brought to Cairo a dark skinned man called Ahmet, whom they declared to be the uncle of the late caliph. Bayibaz pretended to verify his genealogy and saluted him as caliph and religious leader of Islam, but deprived him of any material power. Ahmet, who was renamed al Hakim, was soon sent to recover Baghdad from the Mongols. When he was killed during his attempt, to which Bayibaz gave very little support, a son of his was raised to the nominal caliphate. This shadowy line of doubtful Abbasids was preserved in Cairo so long as the rule of the Mamluks lasted. 1263, Bayibaz in Palestine The Sultan's next task was to punish the Christians who had helped the Mongols. His particular resentment was reserved for King Hethum of Armenia and Prince Bohemond of Antioch. In the late autumn of 1261 he sent an army to take control of Aleppo, whose Mameluk governor had been insubordinate, and to carry out extensive raids in Antiochian territory. Further raids were made next summer, and the port of Saint Simeon was sacked. Antioch itself was threatened, but Hethum appealed to Hulagu and arrived with a force of Mongols and Armenians in time to save it. The Mongol power in northeast Syria was still strong enough to deter Bayibuz, so he had recourse to diplomacy. The Khan Berk of the Golden Horde had by now come out openly as a Muslim and was ready to ally himself with Bayibuz. One of the two Seljuk sultans of Anatolia, Kaikaus, who had been deprived of his lands by an alliance between the Mongols, the Byzantines and his own brother Kilij Arslan had fled to Burke's court and had been sent back with aid from the Golden Horde and from Bayibuz, while a Turkoman chief called Karaman, now established southeast of Konya, could be used to put permanent pressure on the Armenians. The Franks of Acre had hoped that their friendliness to the Mamluks at the time of the Angelad campaign would preserve them from hostile attentions. But when John of Jaffa and John of Beirut went to his camp late in 1261 to attempt to negotiate for the return of Frankish prisoners made during recent years and for the fulfillment of a promise made by Sultan Abek to restore Zion in Galilee, or else pay an indemnity for it, Bayibuz, though he seems to have liked John of Jaffa, refused to listen to them and instead sent off all the prisoners to labor camps. In February 1263, John of Jaffa paid a second visit to the Sultan, who was then encamped by Mount Daba, and obtained the promise of a truce and an exchange of prisoners. But neither the temple nor the hospital would then agree to give up the Muslims in their possession, as they were all trained craftsmen and of material value to the orders. Bayibaz himself was shocked by such mercenary greed. He broke off negotiations and marched into Frankish territory. After sacking Nazareth and destroying the Church of the Virgin he made a sudden swoop on Acre, on the 4th of April 1263. There was severe fighting outside the walls, in which the Seneschkel, Geoffrey of Sargines, was badly wounded. But Bayibuz was not yet ready to besiege the city. He retired after sacking the suburbs. It was suspected that he had arranged to have the cooperation of Philip of Montfort and the Genoese from Tyre, but at the last moment their Christian consciences held them back. Raids and counter raids continued on the frontier. The Frankish towns in the maritime plain were constantly threatened. As early as April 1261, Balian of Ibelin, Lord of Asuv, leased his lordship to the hospital, knowing that he could not afford its defense. Early in 1264 the temple and the hospital consented to unite forces to capture the little fortress of Lizan, the ancient Mejdo, and a few months later they made a joint raid down to Escalon, while in the autumn the French troops, paid for by St. Louis, penetrated very profitably as far as the suburbs of Bees. 
but in return the Muslims so ravaged the Frankish countryside south of Carmel that life was no longer safe. The dot at the beginning of 1265 Bayibas set out from Egypt at the head of a formidable army. The Mongols had shown signs of aggression in northern Syria that winter, and his first intention was to counterattack. But he learned that his troops in the north had held them. He could therefore use his army to attack the Franks in the south. After feigning to amuse himself with a great hunting expedition in the hills behind Arsuf, he suddenly appeared before Caesarea. The town fell at once, on the 27th of February, but the citadel held out for a week. The garrison capitulated on the 5th of March and was allowed to go free, but the town and castle alike were razed to the ground. A few days later his troops appeared at Haifa. Those of the inhabitants that were warned in time fled to boats in the anchorage, abandoning both the town and the citadel, which were destroyed, and the inhabitants that had remained there were massacred. Baibas himself meanwhile attacked the great Templar castle at Athlit. The village outside the walls was burned, but the castle itself resisted him successfully. On the 21st of March he gave up its siege and marched on Arsif. The hospitals had garrisoned and provisioned it well. There were 270 knights within the castle, who fought with superb courage. But the lower town fell on the 26th of April, after its walls had been broken down by the Sultan's siege engines, and three days later the commander of the citadel, who had lost a third of his knights, capitulated in return for a promise that the survivors should go free. Bayibas broke his word and took them all into captivity. The loss of the two great fortresses horrified the Franks, and inspired the Templar troubadour, Recount Bonimal, to write a bitter poem complaining that Christ seemed now to be pleased by the humiliation of the Christians. 1265, death of Hulagu. It was now the turn of Acre. But the regent, Hugh of Antioch, who had been in Cyprus, had already hurried across the sea with the men that he could raise in the island. When Bayibas moved north again from Arsif he found that Hugh had landed at Acre on the 25th of April. The Egyptian army returned home, after leaving troops to control the newly conquered territory. The frontier now was within sight of Acre itself. Bayibas hastened to write news of his victories to Manfred, king of Sicily, with whom the Egyptian court kept up the friendship forged with his father Frederick II. It had been a good year for Bayibas. On 8 February 1265, Tulaga died in Azerbaijan. His brother Kubilai had given him the title of Ilkhan and the hereditary government of the Mongol possessions in southwestern Asia, and, though his difficulties with the Golden Horde and with the Mongols of Turkestan, who also were converts to Islam, had kept him from resuming a serious offensive against the Mamluks, yet he was still formidable enough to deter the Mamluks from attacking his allies. In July 1264 he held his last guerrilla at his encampment near Tabriz. His vassals were all present, including King David of Georgia, King Hethum of Armenia and Prince Bohemond of Antioch. Hethum and Bohemond were both in disgrace with Hulaga for having, the previous year, kidnapped Euthymius, the orthodox patriarch of Antioch, on whose installation Hulaga had insisted in 1260, and carried him off to Armenia. The Latin epism had then been introduced into Antioch. To Hulaga the alliance of the Byzantines was important as a means for keeping the Turks of Anatolia in control. He was negotiating for a lady of the imperial family of Constantinople to be added to the number of his wives, and when the Emperor Michael selected for the honor his bastard daughter, Maria, she was escorted to Tabriz by the Patriarch Euthymius, who found refuge at Constantinople and who returned to the east no doubt at Hulaga's express invitation. But the Mongols remained broad-minded and would not allow sectarian quarrels amongst the Christians to interfere with their general policy. It seems that Bohemond was able to excuse himself and that Euthymius was not received back in Antioch. Hulaga's death inevitably weakened the Mongols at a critical moment. The influence of his widow, Dokyas Katun, secured the succession for his favorite son, Abaga, who was governor of Turkestan. But it was not till June, four months after his father's death, that Abaga was formally installed as Ilkhan, 
and several more months passed before the redistribution of fiefs and governorships was completed. Dokyuz Katun herself died during the summer, deeply mourned by the Christians. Meanwhile Abaga was continually threatened by his cousins of the Golden Horde, who actually invaded his territory next spring. It was impossible for the Mongol government to intervene for the time being in western Syria. Bayibuz, to whose diplomacy the Ilkin's troubles with his northern neighbors were mainly due, could resume his campaigns against the Christians without fear of interference. 1266 Bayibuz conquers Galilee in the early summer of 1266. While Abaga's armies were occupied in beating off the Khan Berks invasion of Persia, two Mamluk armies set out from Egypt. One, under the Sultan himself, appeared before Acre on the 1st of June. But the regiment maintained that by St. Louis had recently been reinforced from France. Finding the city so strongly garrisoned, Bayibuz turned aside to make a demonstration before the Teutonic fortress of Montfort, then marched suddenly on safed from whose huge castle the Templars dominated the Galilean uplands. The fortifications had been entirely reconstructed some twenty-five years before, and the garrison was numerous, though many of the soldiers were native Christians or half-breeds. The Sultan's first assault, on the 7th of July, was beaten back, nor was he more successful with his next attempts, on 13 and the 19th of July. He then announced through heralds that he offered a complete amnesty to any of the native soldiers that would surrender to him. It is doubtful how many of them would have trusted his word, but the Templar knights at once grew suspicious. There were recriminations, which came to blows, and the Syrians began to desert. The Templars soon found it impossible to hold the castle. At the end of the month they sent a Syrian sergeant whom they believed to be loyal down to Bayibuz's camp to offer surrender. The Syrian, whose name was Leo, returned with the promise that the garrison should be allowed to retire without hurt to Acre. But when the Templars handed over the castle to Bayibuz on these terms, he had them all decapitated. Whether Leo had been a conscious traitor was uncertain but his prompt conversion to Islam was evidence against him. The capture of Saft gave Bayibuz control of Galilee. He next attacked Tehran, which fell to him with hardly a struggle. From Tehran he sent a troop to destroy the Christian village of Gara, between Homs and Damascus, which he suspected of being in touch with the Franks. The adult inhabitants were massacred and the children enslaved. When the Christians from Acre sent a deputation to ask to be allowed to bury the dead, he roughly refused, saying that if they wished for martyrs' corpses they would find them at home. To carry out his threat he marched down to the coast and slaughtered every Christian that fell into his hands. But, once again, he did not venture to attack Acre itself, where the regent Hugh had just arrived from Cyprus. When the Mamluks retired in the autumn, Hugh assembled the Knights of the Orders and the French regiment under Geoffrey of Sargines and made a counter-raid through Galilee. But on the 28th of October the vanguard was ambushed by the garrison of Saft, while local Arabs attacked the Frankish camp. Hugh was obliged to retire with heavy losses. 1266, the Mamluks ravaged Cilicia while Bayibuz campaigned in Galilee, the second Mamluk army under the ablest of his emirs, Caloan, assembled at Horns. After a lightning raid towards Tripoli, during which he captured the forts of Clayat and Halba and the town of Arca, which controlled the approach to Tripoli from the Bukaya, Caloan hurried northward to join with the army of Al-Mansur of Harma. Their combined troops then marched to Aleppo and turned westward into Cilicia. King Hethum had expected a Mamluk attack. In 1263, on the news of Hulaga's death, he had attempted to come to terms with Bayibuz. The Egyptian navy depended for its shipbuilding on wood from southern Anatolia and the Lebanon. Hethum and his son-in-law Bohemond controlled these forests and hoped to use their control as a bargaining point. But the attempted blockade only made Bayibuz the more determined on war. In the spring of 1266, knowing that a Mameluk attack was imminent, Hethum set out for the court of the Ilkhan at Tabriz. While he was there, pleading for Mongol help, 
the storm burst on Cilicia. The Armenian army, led by Hethum's two sons, Leo and Thuras, waited by the Syrian gates, with the Templars at Bagras guarding its flanks, but the Mamluks turned northward to cross the Amanis mountains near Sarventica. The Armenians hastened to intercept them as they descended into the Cilician plain. A decisive battle took place on the 24th of August. The Armenians were outnumbered and were routed. Of their two princes, Thuras was slain and Leo taken prisoner. The victorious Muslims swept through Cilicia. While Kalorun and his Mamluks sacked Ayas, Adana, and Tarsus, Almanzur led his army past Momistra to the Armenian capital at Sis where he plundered the palace, burned down the cathedral and slaughtered some thousands of the inhabitants. At the end of September the victors retired to Aleppo with nearly 40,000 captives and great caravans of booty. King Hethum hurried back from the Ilkhan's court, with a small company of Mongols, to find his heir a captive, his capital in ruins and his whole country devastated. The Cilician kingdom never recovered from the disaster. It was no longer able to play more than a passive part in the politics of Asia. After eliminating the Armenians, Bayibas sent troops in the autumn of 1266 to attack Antioch. But his generals were sated with loot and were unenthusiastic. Bribes from Bohemond and the commune induced them to abandon the attempt. Bayibas was furious at his deputy's weakness. He himself allowed the Franks no respite. In May 1267, he appeared once more before Acre. By displaying banners that he had captured from the Templars and the Hospitas he was able to approach right up to the walls before the ruse was discovered. But his assault on the walls was repulsed, and he contented himself with ravaging the countryside. The headless bodies were left in the gardens round Acre till the citizens ventured out to bury them. When the Franks sent ambassadors to ask for a truce, he received them at Saft, where the whole castle was encircled with the skulls of murdered Christian prisoners. Life at Acre was not made easier by a renewal of the war between the Venetians and the Genoese for the control of the harbour. On the 16th of August 1267, the Genoese Admiral Lucciato Grimaldi forced his way into the port with 28 galleys, after capturing the Tower of Flies, which stood at the end of the breakwater. But after 12 days he took 15 of his ships to tire for repairs. During his absence a Venetian fleet of 26 galleys appeared and attacked the remaining Genoese. Five Genoese ships were lost in the battle. The others fought their way through to Tyre. Early in 1268, Bayibas set out once more from Egypt. The only Christian possessions south of Acre itself were the Templar castle of Athlet and the lawyer John of Iblin's town of Jeffa. John, who had always been treated with respect by the Muslims, died in the spring of 1266. His son Guy had not the same prestige. He had hoped that the Sultan would honour the truce that his father had made. In consequence, when the Egyptian army appeared before the town on the 7th of March, it was in no state to defend itself. After twelve hours of fighting it fell into the Sultan's hands. Many of the inhabitants were slaughtered, but the garrison was allowed to retire unharmed to Acre. The castle was destroyed, and its wood and marble were sent to Cairo for the great new mosque that Bayibas was building. The dot 1268, the fall of Antioch. The Sultan's next objective was the castle of Beaufort, which the temple had recently taken over from Julian of Sidon. After ten days of heavy bombardment, the garrison surrendered on the 15th of April. The women and children were sent free to Tyre. But the men were all kept as slaves. The castle itself was repaired by Bayibas and strongly garrisoned. On the 1st of May, the Mameluke army appeared suddenly outside Tripoli, but, finding it well garrisoned, turned equally suddenly towards the north. The Templars from Tortosa and Safita sent hastily to beg the Sultan that their territory might be spared. Bayibas respected their wishes and marched swiftly down the Unz Valley. On the 14th of May he was before Antioch. There he divided his forces into three parts. One army went to capture St. Simeon, thus cutting off Antioch from the sea. The second army moved up to the Syrian gates, to prevent any help reaching the city from Cilicia. The main force, under Bayibas himself, 
drew closely round the city. Prince Bohemond was at Tripoli, and Antioch was under the command of its constable, Simon Mansell, whose wife was an Armenian, related to Bohemond's princess. Its walls were in good repair, but the garrison was hardly large enough to man their long extent. The constable had rashly led out some troops to try to dispute the investment of the city, and had been captured by the Mamluks. He was ordered by his captors to arrange for the capitulation of the garrison, but his lieutenants within the walls refused to listen to him. The first assault on the city took place next day. It was beaten back, and negotiations were opened once again, with no greater success. On the 18th of May the Mameluk army made a general attack on all sections of the walls. After fierce fighting a breach was made where the defences ran up the slope of Mount Silpius, and the Muslims poured into the city. Even the Muslim chroniclers were shocked by the carnage that followed. By order of the Sultan's emirs, the city gates were closed, that none of the inhabitants might escape. Those that were found in the streets were slaughtered at once. Others, cowering in their houses, were spared only to end their days in captivity. Several thousands of the citizens had fled with their families to the shelter of the huge citadel on the mountain top. Their lives were spared, but their persons were divided amongst the emirs. On the 19th of May, the Sultan ordered the collection and distribution of the booty. Though its prosperity had been declining for some decades, Antioch had long been the richest of the Frankish cities, and its accumulated treasures were stupendous. There were great mounds of gold and silver ornaments and coins were so plentiful that they were handed out in bowlfuls. The number of captives was enormous. There was not a soldier in the Sultan's army that did not acquire a slave, and the surplus was such that the price of a boy fell to twelve dirhams and a girl to only five. A few of the richer citizens were allowed to ransom themselves. Simon Mansell was set free and retired to Armenia. But many of the leading dignitaries of the government and of the church were killed or were never heard of again. The Principality of Antioch, the first of the states that the Franks founded in Outrema, had lasted for 171 years. Its destruction was a terrible blow to Christian prestige, and it brought the rapid decline of Christianity in northern Syria. The Franks were gone, and the native Christians fared little better. It was their punishment for their support, not of the Franks but of those more dangerous foes to Islam, the Mongols. The city itself never recovered. It had already lost its commercial importance, for, with the frontier between the Mongol and Mamluk empires running along the Euphrates, trade from Iraq and the Far East no longer came through Aleppo but kept to Mongol territory and debouched to the Sea at Ayas in Cilicia. The Muslim conquerors had therefore no interest in repopulating Antioch. Its importance now was only as a frontier fortress. Many of the houses within its great walls were not rebuilt. The hierarchs of the local churches moved to more lively centers. It was not long before the headquarters both of the Orthodox and of the Jacobite churches in Syria were established at Damascus. 1268, Q. King of Cyprus and Jerusalem with Armenia weakened and Antioch destroyed, the Templars decided that it was impossible to hold their castles in the Amanus Mountains. Bagras and the lesser castle of La Roche de Russell were abandoned without a struggle. All that was left of the principality was the city of Latakia which had been restored to Bohemond by the Mongols and was now an isolated enclave, and the castle of Qudah whose lord had made friends with the Muslims of the neighborhood and was allowed to remain on there for seven more years as vassal to the Sultan. After his triumph at Antioch Bayibas rested a while. There were signs that the Mongols were ready to play a more active role, and there were rumors that St. Louis was preparing a great crusade. When the regent Hugh sent to ask for a truce, the Sultan replied with an embassy to Acre to offer a temporary cessation of hostilities. Hugh had hoped for some concessions and tried to threaten the ambassador, Muaddin, by showing his troops in battle array, but Muaddin merely replied that the whole army was not so numerous as the host of Christian captives at Cairo. Prince Bohemond asked to be included in the truce. He was offended when the Sultan's reply addressed him merely as Count, because he had lost his principality, 
but he gladly accepted the respite offered to him. There were minor Mamluk raids into Christian lands in the spring of 1269, but on the whole the truce was observed for a year. Meanwhile the Franks tried to set their house in order. In December 1267, King Hugh II of Cyprus died at the age of 14, and the regent Hugh of Antioch Lusignan succeeded to the throne as Hugh III. He was crowned on Christmas Day. His accession gave him a surer authority over his vassals, for there was no danger now that his government would abruptly end when his ward came of age. But he was unable to overcome their claim that they were not obliged to serve in his army outside the limits of the kingdom. Whenever he wished to take troops to the mainland he was dependent on men from the royal estates and on volunteers. On the 29th of October 1268, Conradin of Hohenstaufen was beheaded at Naples by the orders of Charles of Anjou, from whom he had vainly tried to wrest back his Italian inheritance. His death meant the extinction of the elder line of the royal house of Jerusalem, which descended from Queen Maria, Lamarck's. Next in the line came the house of Cyprus, descended from Maria's half-sister, Alice of Champagne. King Hugh III's claim to be heir had been tacitly acknowledged by his appointment as regent, when his cousin, Hugh of Brienne, whose hereditary rights were legally better than his own, had been passed over. Hugh of Brienne had gone to seek his fortune in the Frankish Duchy of Athens, whose heiress he married. He did not now challenge his cousin. But before King Hugh could receive his second crown there was another competitor to be considered. Queen Maria's second half-sister, Molisend of Luke Signan, had married as his second wife Prince Bohemond IV of Antioch, and their daughter Maria was still alive. While Hugh could claim to be descended from an earlier marriage of Queen Isabella than Maria, Maria was one generation closer to Queen Isabella. She appeared before the High Court, maintaining that the succession should be decided by the degree of kinship with Queen Isabella, who was the common ancestress of Conradin, Hugh and herself. A granddaughter, she argued, took precedence over a great grandson. Hugh replied that his grandmother, Queen Alice, had been accepted as regent because she was the next heir, and that her son, King Henry of Cyprus, had been accepted as regent on her death, and after Henry his widow and then Hugh himself as guardians of the young Hugh too. He now represented Alice's line. Maria accounted by saying that there had been a mistake, her mother, Molly's end, should have succeeded Alice as regent. After some argument, in which Maria was upheld by the Templars, the lawyers of our dreamer supported Hugh's claims. Had they refused, they would have been forced to admit that they had been previously in error. Public opinion was on their side, for the vigorous young king of Cyprus was obviously a more desirable candidate than a middle-aged spinster. Maria would not accept the verdict. She issued a formal protest on the day of Hugh's coronation, then bustled off to Italy to lay her case before the papal curia. She arrived at Rome during an interregnum, but Gregory X, who was elected in 1271, showed her sympathy and allowed her to bring up the question at the Council of Lyon in 1274. Representatives from Acre appeared and argued that the High Court of Jerusalem alone had jurisdiction over the succession to the kingdom, and the matter was dropped. Before he died in 1276, Gregory arranged for Maria to sell her claim to Charles of Anjou. The transaction was completed in March 1277. The princess received a thousand gold pounds and an annuity of four thousand pounds to her noise. The annuity was confirmed by Charles II of Naples, but it is doubtful how much money Maria, who was still living in 1307, actually received. 1269, Hugh's coronation. Hugh was crowned on the 24th of September 1269 by the Bishop of Lydda, acting for the Patriarch. His first task was to try to restore some unity to his new kingdom. Already before his coronation he managed to compose the old quarrel between Philip of Montfort and the government at Acre. Philip's pride had been humbled by the loss of Turon, he was no longer so anxious to play a lone hand. When Hugh proposed that his own sister, Margaret of Antioch Lusignan, the loveliest girl of her generation, should marry Philip's elder son, John, Philip was glad to accept the offer. 
Q was thus able to go to Tyre to be crowned in its cathedral, which had been since the fall of Jerusalem the traditional crowning place of the kings. Soon afterwards Philip's younger son, Humphrey, married Ischiva of Ibelin, younger daughter of John II of Beirut. This reconciliation between the Montforts and the Ibelins was easy or as the older generation of Ibelins was extinct. John of Beirut had died in 1264, John of Jaffa in 1266 and John of Asuf in 1268. After Bayibaz's recent campaigns the only Ibelin fief left on the mainland, and, indeed, the only lay fief in the kingdom other than Tyre, was Beirut, which had passed to John's elder daughter, Isabella. She had been married as a child to the child king of Cyprus, Hugh II, who died before the marriage was consummated. Hugh III hoped to use her as an eligible heiress to attract some distinguished knight to the east. In Cyprus the Iblins were still the most powerful family. The king soon afterwards won their loyalty by marrying another Isabella of Ibelin, daughter of the constable Guy. Though he managed to make peace between his few remaining lay vassals, it was less easy to secure cooperation of the military orders, the commune of Acre, or the Italians. Venice and Genoa were not going to give up their quarrels at any monarch's bidding. The Templars and the Teutonic Knights resented Hugh's reconciliation with Philip of Montfort. The Commune of Acre was equally jealous of any favour shown to Tyre and disliked to see the end of the absentee monarchy under which their own power had increased. Nor could Hugh call in his Cypriot vassals to enhance his authority. His attempt to make his rule effective was doomed to failure. Foreign affairs were hardly more encouraging. The shadow of Charles of Anjou lay darkly across the Mediterranean world. Great hopes had been built in the East on St. Louis's forthcoming crusade, but in 1270 Charles diverted it to suit his own interests. Louis's death at Tunis that year released Charles from the one altruistic influence that he respected. He was on friendly terms with the Sultan Bayibas, but he was personally hostile to King Hugh, against whom he encouraged the claims of Hugh of Brian to the throne of Cyprus and of Maria of Antioch to that of Jerusalem. It was, indeed, fortunate for Outrema that Charles's main ambitions were directed against Byzantium, for it was clear that any crusade that he assisted would be turned to suit his own selfish ends. 1269 the crusade of the infants of Aragon The crusading spirit was not, however, entirely dead in Europe. On the 1st of September 1269, King James I of Aragon sailed from Barcelona with a powerful squadron to rescue the East. Unfortunately it ran almost at once into a storm, which caused such havoc that the king and the greater part of his fleet returned home. Only a small squadron, under the king's two bastards, the infants Fernando Sanchez and Pedro Fernandez, continued the journey. They arrived at Acre at the end of December, eager to fight the infidel. Early in December Bayibas broke his truce with Hugh and appeared with 3,000 men in the fields before Acre, leaving others concealed in the hills. The infants wished to hurry out at once to attack the enemy, and it needed all the tact of the military knights to restrain them. An ambush was suspected. Moreover, the Christians' numbers were depleted, as the French regiment, which the Seneschal Geoffrey of Sargines had commanded till his death that spring, had gone with its new commander, Oliver of Termes, and the new Seneschal, Robert of Cresex, on a raid beyond Montfort. These raiders caught sight of the Muslim forces as they were returning. Oliver of Termes wished to slip unobserved through the orchards back into Acre but the Seneschal Robert insisted on attacking the enemy. The Frenchmen fell straight into the ambush laid for them by Bayibas. Very few of them survived. When the troops inside Acre clamoured to go to their rescue, the infants of Aragon, who had learned their lesson, restrained them. Soon afterwards they returned to Aragon, having achieved nothing. Though help from the west was inadequate, there was still hope from the east. The Ilkin of Persia, Abaga like his father Hulagu, was an eclectic shamanist with strong Christian sympathies. The death of his Christian stepmother, Dokyuz Katun, had robbed her co-religionists of every sect of their chief friend, 
but they found a new protector in the Byzantine Princess Maria. She had arrived at the Ilkins court to find Hulaga dead, but was married at once to Abaga, who soon conceived a deep respect for her, and all his subjects, to whom she was known as Dispina Katun, revered her for her goodness and her sagacity. News of the Ilkins' goodwill induced the King of Aragon, in conjunction with Pope Clement IV, to send James Alaric of Perpignan on a mission to him in 1267, to announce the forthcoming crusade of the Aragonese and of King Louis and to suggest a military alliance. But Abaga, who was fully occupied by his war against the Golden Horde, would only make vague promises. His inability to do more was shown by his failure to rescue Antioch from the Mamluks next year. He was soon faced with a new war, with his cousins of the House of Jugatai, who invaded his eastern dominions in 1270 and were only driven back after a tremendous battle near Herat. For the next two years Abaga's main task was to reopen communications with his uncle and overlord, the great Khan Kubilai in China. But in 1270, after his victory at Herat, he wrote to King Louis undertaking to grant military aid as soon as the crusade appeared in Palestine. King Louis went instead to Tunis, where the Mongols could not help him. The only practical assistance that the Ilkhan was able to give to the Christians was to provide Hethum of Armenia with a distinguished Mamluk captive, Shams ad-Din Sonkar al the Red Falcon, whom the Mongols had captured at Aleppo. In return for his release Bayibaz agreed to free Hethum's heir, Leo, and to make a truce with Hethum on condition that the Armenians ceded the fortresses of the Amanus, Darbsak, Behesni, and Roban. The treaty was signed in August 1268. Early next year Leo, who had been permitted to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, returned to Armenia. His father at once abdicated in his favor and retired to a monastery where he died the following year. Leo's title as king was confirmed by Abaga, to whom he went personally to pay homage. 1270, murder of Philip of Montfort throughout the summer of 1270 Bayibas remained quiet, fearing that he might have to defend Egypt against the king of France. But, in order to weaken the Franks, he arranged for the assassination of their one leading baron, Philip of Montfort. The assassins of Syria were grateful to the Sultan, whose conquests freed them from the necessity of paying tribute to the hospital, and they strongly resented the Frankish negotiations with the Mongols, who had destroyed their headquarters in Persia. On Bayibaz's request they sent one of their fanatics to Tyre. There, pretending to be a Christian convert, he penetrated on Sunday, the 17th of August 1270, into a chapel where Philip and his son John were praying and suddenly fell upon them. Before help could arrive Philip was mortally wounded, surviving just long enough to learn that his murderer was captured and his heir was safe. His death was a heavy blow to our dreamer, for John, though he remained devoted to King Hugh, his brother-in-law, lacked his father's experience and prestige. King Louis's death before Tunis greatly relieved the Sultan, who had been ready to march to the assistance of the Tunisian Emir. He knew that he had nothing to fear from Charles of Anjou. In 1271 he marched again into Frankish territory. In February he appeared before Safita, the white castle of the Templars. After a spirited defense the small garrison was advised by the Grand Master to surrender. The survivors were allowed to retire to Tortosa. The Sultan then marched on the huge hospital a fortress of Crac de Chevaliers, Calat al -Hosn. He arrived there on the 3rd of March. Next day, contingents joined him from the assassins, as well as Al Manzur of Hama and his army. Heavy rain for some days prevented him from bringing up his siege engines, but on the 15th of March, after a brief but heavy bombardment, the Muslims forced an entry into the gate tower of the outer enceinte. A fortnight later, they broke their way into the inner enceinte slaughtering the knights that they met there and taking the native soldiers prisoner. Many of the defenders held out for ten more days in the great tower at the south of the Encinti. On the 8th of April they capitulated and were sent under a safe conduct to Tripoli. The capture of Crack, which had defied even Saladin, gave Bayibas control of the approaches to Tripoli. 
he followed it up with the capture of Akka, the hospital or castle on the south of the Bukaya, which fell on the 1st of May, after a fortnight's siege. Prince Bohemond was at Tripoli. Fearful that it was to share the fate of his other capital, Antioch, he sent to Bayibas to beg for a truce. The Sultan mocked at his lack of courage, and demanded that he should pay all the expenses of the recent Mamluk campaign. Bohemond had enough spirit left to refuse the insulting terms. Bayibas had meanwhile made an unsuccessful attack on the little fort of Marukali, built on a rock off the coast between Balunias and Tortosa. Its lord, Bartholomew, had gone to seek help from the Mongol court. Bayibas was so furious at his failure that he tried to induce the assassins to murder Bartholomew on his journey. At the end of May, Bayibas suddenly offered Bohemond a truce for ten years with no other terms than the retention of his recent conquests. On its acceptance he set out to return to Egypt, pausing only to besiege the Teutonic fortress of Montfort, which surrendered on 12 June, after one week's siege. There were now no inland castles left to the Franks. About the same time he sent a squadron of seventeen ships to attack Cyprus, having heard that King Hugh had left the island for Acre. His fleet appeared unexpectedly off Limassol, but owing to bad seamanship eleven ships ran aground and the crews fell into the hands of the Cypriots. 1271, arrival of Edward of England The Sultan's forbearance towards Bohemond was due to the arrival of a new crusade. Henry III of England had long ago taken the cross, but he was now an old man, worn out by civil wars. In his stead, he encouraged his son and heir, Prince Edward, to set out for the east. Edward was in his early thirties, an able, vigorous and cold-blooded man who had already shown his gifts as a statesman in dealing with his father's rebels. He decided on his crusade after he heard of the fall of Antioch, but he planned it carefully and methodically. Unfortunately, though many of the English nobles had agreed to accompany him, one by one they made their excuses. It was with only about a thousand men that the prince eventually left England in the summer of 1271, together with his wife, Ellen of Castile. His brother Edmund of Lancaster, one time candidate for the Sicilian throne, followed him with reinforcements a few months later. He was also accompanied by a small contingent of Bretons, under their count, and one from the Low Countries, under Tadaldo Visconti, Archdeacon of Liege. Edward's intention had been to join King Louis at Tunis and sail on with him to the Holy Land, but he arrived in Africa to find the king dead and the French troops about to return home. He wintered in Sicily with King Charles, whose first wife had been his aunt, and sailed on next spring to Cyprus and then to Acre, where he landed on the 9th of May 1271. He was joined the soon afterwards by King Hugh and Prince Bohemond. Edward was horrified by the state of affairs in Outrema. He knew that his own army was small, but he hoped to unite the Christians of the East into a formidable body and then to use the help of the Mongols in making an effective attack on Bayibas. His first shock was to find that the Venetians maintained a flourishing trade with the Sultan, supplying him with all the timber and metal that he needed for his armaments while the Genoese were doing their best to force their way into this profitable business and already controlled the slave trade of Egypt. But when he reproved the merchants for thus endangering the future of the Christian East they showed him the licenses that they had received from the high court at Acre for this purpose. He could do nothing to stop them. Next, he hoped that the whole chivalry of Cyprus would follow its king to the mainland. But, though some feudatories had come, they insisted that they were volunteers, and when King Hugh demanded that they should stay in Syria as long as he was there, their spokesman, his wife's cousin, James of Ibelin, declared firmly that they were only obliged to serve in the defense of the island. He arrogantly added that the king could not count it as a precedent that Cypriot nobles had gone to fight on the mainland, for they had done so more often at the bidding of the Ibelins than at any king's bidding but he hinted that if Hugh had made his request more tactfully it might have been granted. The argument was carried on till 1273, when, in a rare spirit of compromise, the Cypriots agreed to spend four months on the mainland, if the king or his heir in person were present with the army. 
it was by then too late for Edward's purpose. 1272, truce between Edward and Bayibas the English prince was not much more successful with the Mongols. As soon as he arrived at Acre he sent an embassy to the Ilkin, consisting of three Englishmen, Reginald Russell, Godfrey Wells and John Parker. Abaga, whose main armies were fighting in Turkestan, agreed to send what aid he could. In the meantime Edward contented himself with a few minor raids just across the frontier. In mid-October 1271, Abago fulfilled his promise by detaching 10,000 horsemen from his garrisons in Anatolia. They swept down past Ain Tab into Syria, defeating the Turkoman troops that protected Aleppo. The Mameluk garrisons of Aleppo fled before them to Hama. They continued their course past Aleppo to Marat and Newman and Apamea. There was panic amongst the local Muslims. But Bayibas, who was at Damascus, was not unduly alarmed. He had a large army with him, and he summoned reinforcements from Egypt. When he began to move northwards, on the 12th of November, the Mongols turned back. They were not strong enough to face the full Mamluk army, and their Turkish vassals in Anatolia were restive. They retired behind the Euphrates laden with booty. While Bayibas was distracted by the Mongols, Edward led the Franks across Mount Carmel to raid the plain of Sharon. But his troops were too few for him even to attempt to storm the little Mameluk fortress of Kakun which guarded the road across the hills. A more effective Mongol invasion and a larger crusade were needed if any territory was to be reconquered. By the spring of 1272, Prince Edward realized that he was wasting his time. All that he could do without greater manpower and more allies was to arrange a truce that would preserve Outrema for the time being. Bayibas on his side was ready for a truce. The pathetic remnant of the Frankish kingdom lay at his mercy so long as he was not hampered by external complications. His army's first task was to ward off the Mongols, who must further be restrained by diplomatic action in Anatolia and on the steppes. Till he felt secure on that front it was not worthwhile to make the effort necessary for the reduction of the last Frankish fortresses. In the meantime he must prevent intervention from the west and for that purpose he must maintain good relations with Charles of Anjou, the only potentate who might have brought effective help to Acre. But Charles's main ambition was the conquest of Constantinople. Syria was for the moment of secondary interest to him. He already had vague thoughts of adding out Rima to his empire. He therefore wished to preserve its existence but to do nothing that would enhance the power of King Hugh, whom he hoped some day to displace. He was willing to mediate between Bayibas and Edward. On the 22nd of May 1272, a peace was signed at Caesarea between the Sultan and the government of Acre. The kingdom was guaranteed for ten years and ten months the possession of its present lands, which consisted mainly of the narrow coastal plain from Acre to Sidon, together with the right to use without hindrance the pilgrim road to Nazareth. The county of Tripoli was safeguarded by the truce of 1271. Prince Edward was known to wish to come back to the east at the head of a greater crusade. So, despite the truce, Bayibas decided to eliminate him. On the 16th of June 1272, an assassin disguised as a native Christian penetrated into the prince's chamber and stabbed him with a poisoned dagger. The wound was not fatal. But Edward was seriously ill for some months. The Sultan hastened to dissociate himself from the deed by sending his congratulations on the prince's escape. As soon as he had recovered, Edward prepared to sail for home. Most of his comrades had already left. His father was dying. His own health was bad, and there was nothing more that he could do. He embarked from Acre on the 22nd of September 1272 and returned to England to find himself its king. 1272 for Gregory X collects reports on the Crusades the Archdeacon of Liege, who had accompanied Edward to Palestine, had left the previous winter on the unexpected news that he had been elected Pope. As Gregory X he never lost his interest in Palestine, and he made it his chief task to see how the crusading spirit could be revived. His appeals for men to take the cross and fight in the East were circulated throughout Europe, 
as far as Finland and Iceland. It is possible that they even reached Greenland and the coast of North America. But there was no response. Meanwhile he collected reports that would explain the hostility of public opinion. These reports were tactful. None of them touched on the essential trouble, that the crusade itself had become debased. Now that spiritual rewards had been promised to men who would fight against the Greeks, the Albigensians and the Hohenstaufen, the holy war had merely become an instrument of a narrow and aggressive papal policy, and even loyal supporters of the papacy saw no reason for making an uncomfortable journey to the east when there were so many opportunities of gaining holy merit in less exacting campaigns. Though the reports sent into the Pope were discreet in their criticism of papal policy, they were frank enough in pointing out the faults of the Church. Four of these reports deserve consideration. First, the Collectio de Scandalis Ecclesiae, probably written by a Franciscan, Gilbert of Turn, while it mentioned the harm done to the Crusades by the quarrels of the kings and nobles, made its main themes the corruption of the clergy and the abuse of indulgences. While prelates spent their money on fine horses and pet monkeys, their agents raised money by the wholesale redemption of crusading vows. None of the clergy would contribute to the taxes levied to pay for the crusades, though St. Louis, to their age, had refused them exemption. Meanwhile the general public was taxed again and again for crusades that never took place. The report sent in by Bruno, Bishop of Olmutz, took a different line. Bruno also spoke of scandals in the church, but he was a politician. There must, he said, be peace in Europe and a general reform, but this could only be achieved by a strong emperor. He implied that his master, King Otto Carr of Bohemia, was the proper candidate for the post. Crusades in the East, he maintained, were now pointless and outmoded. Crusades should be directed against the heathens on the eastern frontiers of the empire. The Teutonic Knights were mishandling this work by their greed and lust for power, but were it properly directed by a suitable potentate, it would provide financial as well as religious advantages. William of Tripoli, a Dominican living at Acre, submitted a more disinterested and constructive memoir. He had little hopes for a holy war in the East conducted from Europe but he was impressed by prophecies that the end of Islam was near at hand and believed that the Mongols would be its destroyers. The time had come for missionary activity. As a member of a preaching order he had faith in the power of sermons. It was his conviction that the East would be won by missions, not by the sword. In this opinion he was supported by a far greater thinker, Roger Bacon. 1274, the Council of Leon the fullest report came from another Dominican, the ex-master general of the order, Humbert of Romans. His opus tripartitum was written in anticipation of a general council, which should discuss the crusade, the Greek schism and church reform. He had no faith in the possibility of converting the Muslims, though the conversion of the Jews was divinely promised and that of the East European pagans should be feasible. He held that another crusade in the Orient was essential. He mentioned the vices that kept men from sailing eastward, their laziness, their avarice and their cowardice. He deplored the love of the homeland that kept them from traveling and the feminine influences that tried to anchor them at home. Worst of all, few now believed in the spiritual merit that was promised to the crusader. This incredulity which Humbert sadly reports was certainly widespread. Numerous popular poems made it their theme, and there were many among the troubadours who frankly declared that God had no more use for the Crusades. Humbert's suggestions for combating it and rousing fresh enthusiasm were not very helpful. It was useless to go on maintaining that defeats and humiliations were good for the soul, as St. Louis believed. It was too late to try to persuade men that the Crusade was the best penance for their sins. The reform of the clergy, which Humbert strenuously advocated, might be of some help. But as a practical guide for the reform of public sentiment, Humbert's advice was of little value. In consequence his recommendations for the running of the crusade were premature. There should be a program of prayers, fasts and ceremonies, history must be studied, there should be a panel of godly and experienced counselors, 
and there ought to be a permanent standing army of crusaders. As for finance, Humbert hinted that papal methods of extortion had not always been popular. He believed that if the church were to sell some of its vast treasure and superfluous ornaments, it would have a good psychological as well as material result. But the princes as well as the church must play their part. Armed with all this advice, which cannot much have reassured him, Gregory X summoned a council to meet at Lyon. Its sessions opened in May 1274. There was good attendance from the East, led by Paul of Seni, Bishop of Tripoli. William of Bugé, newly elected Grand Master of the Temple, was there. But the pressing invitations sent to the kings of Christendom were ignored. Philip III of France declined to attend, and even Edward I, on whom Gregory specially relied, pleaded business at home. Only James I of Aragon appeared, a garrulous old man whose first attempt at an Eastern Crusade had come to nothing but who was genuinely eager in a swashbuckling way to set out on another adventure, but who was soon bored by the discussions and hurried back to the arms of his mistress, the Lady Berengaria. Delegates from the Byzantine Emperor Michael promised the submission of the Church of Constantinople, for Michael was terrified of the ambition of Charles of Anjou. But it was a promise that could not be fulfilled, the Emperor's subjects would have none of it. The abortive union of the churches was the only success of the Council. Nothing of any value was achieved for the reform of the Church, and while everyone was ready to talk about the Crusades no one came forward with the offers of practical help that would be necessary to launch it. Nevertheless Gregory persevered, seeking to make the rulers of Europe carry out the pious resolutions passed by the Council. In 1275 Philip III took the cross. Later that year Rudolf of Habsburg followed his example, in return for the promise of a coronation by the Pope at Rome. In the meantime Gregory tried to prepare the Holy Land for the arrival of the Crusade. He ordered that fortresses should be repaired and more and better mercenaries sent out. From his personal experience in the East it seems that he had concluded that there was nothing to be hoped from King Hugh's government. He therefore was sympathetic to the claims of Maria of Antioch and encouraged her to sell those claims to Charles of Anjou, whom he wished to take a more active interest in Outremer not only for its own welfare but also to divert him from his Byzantine ambitions. But all Pope Gregory's plans came to nothing. When he died, on 10 January 1276, no crusade had left for the East, and none was likely to leave. 1275, the regency at Tripoli King Hugh in Cyprus had a more realistic vision. He neither expected nor desired a crusade but merely wished to preserve the truce with Bayibas. Yet the truce did little to ease his position. In 1273 he lost control of his chief mainland fief, Beirut. Its lordship had passed on John II of Iblin's death to his elder daughter, Isabella, Diage Queen of Cyprus, who had been left a virgin widow in 1267. Her virginity was of short duration. Her notorious lack of chastity and, in particular, her liaison with Julian of Sidon, provoked a papal bull, which strongly urged her to remarry. In 1272 she gave herself and her lordship to an Englishman, Hamo Lestrange, or the foreigner, who seems to have been one of Prince Edward's companions. He distrusted King Hugh, and on his deathbed next year he put his wife and her fief under the protection of Bayibas. When Hugh tried to carry off the widow to Cyprus, to remarry her to a candidate of his choice, the Sultan at once cited the pact that Hamo had made and demanded her return. The High Court gave the King no support. He was obliged to send Isabella back to Beirut, where a Mamluk guard was installed to protect her. It was only long after Bayibaz's death that Hugh resumed control of the fief. Isabella married two more husbands before her death, in about 1282, when Beirut passed to her sister Ischiva, the wife of Humphrey of Montfort, who was a loyal friend of the king. Hugh's next rebuff was over the county of Tripoli. Bohemond Vi, last prince of Antioch, died in 1275, leaving a son, Bohemond, aged about 14, and a younger daughter, Lucia. King Hugh, as the next adult heir of the house of Antioch, claimed the regency of Tripoli. 
but the princess dowager, Sibylla of Armenia, at once assumed the office, as the custom of the family entitled her to do. When Hugh arrived at Tripoli to maintain his claim, he found that the young Bohemond Seven had been sent to the court of his uncle, King Leo III of Armenia, and that the city was administered in Sibylla's name by Bartholomew, Bishop of Tortosa, who seems to have belonged to the great Antiochian family of Mansell. No one in Tripoli supported Hugh, for Bishop Bartholomew was for the moment highly popular. He was a bitter enemy of the Bishop of Tripoli, Paul of Seni, Bohem and Vi's maternal uncle, and of all the Romans that he and Lucine had installed in the county. With the support of the local nobility, Sibylla and Bartholomew put some of the Romans to death and exiled others. Unfortunately, Bishop Paul had the support of the temple, whose master he had met at the Council of Leon. When Bohemond VII came from Armenia in 1277 to take over the government, he was faced by the implacable hostility of the order. It was only further north, at Latakia, that Hugh's prestige won a minor victory. Latakia was all that remained of the Principality of Antioch, and Baibus did not consider it to be covered by his treaties with Tripoli or with Acre. His armies were closing round it, when its citizens made a direct appeal to King Hugh. He was able to negotiate a truce with the Sultan, who called off his troops in return for an annual tribute of 20,000 dinars and the release of 20 Muslim prisoners. It was not long before Hugh's difficulties extended to Acre itself. The commune of Acre had always resented his direct rule, while the Order of the Temple, which had disliked his reconciliation with the Montforts and had opposed his accession to the throne, grew steadily more unfriendly to him. The hospital, on whose goodwill he might have counted, had declined in importance after the loss of its headquarters at Crack. Its only remaining great castle was Markab, on its high hill overlooking Balunias. Already in 1268, the Grand Master, Hugh of Revel, wrote that the order could now only maintain 300 knights in Outrema, instead of 10,000 as in the old days. But the temple still possessed its headquarters at Tortosa as well as Sidon and the huge castle of Athlet, while its banking connections with the whole Levantine world increased its strength. Thomas Berard, who was Grand Master from 1256 to 1273, had in his earlier days been loyal to the Cypriot regents, and, although he had grown to dislike Hugh, he had never openly challenged him. But his successor, William of Bugey, was of a different caliber. He was related to the Royal House of France and was proud, ambitious and energetic. When he was elected he was in Apulia, in the territory of his cousin Charles of Anjou. He came to the east two years later, determined to further Charles's projects and opposed, therefore, from the outset to King Hugh. 1276, King Hugh retires to Cyprus in October 1276. The Order of the Temple purchased a village called La Forcury, a few miles south of Acar, from its landlord, Thomas of St. Bertin, and deliberately omitted to secure King's consent to the transaction. Hugh's complaints were ignored. In his exasperation with the Orders, with the Commune and with the merchant colonies, he determined to leave the thankless kingdom. He suddenly packed up his belongings and retired to Tyre, intending to sail from there to Cyprus. He left Taker without appointing a bailey. The Templars and the Venetians, who were their close allies, were delighted. But the Patriarch, Thomas of Lentino, the Hospiters and the Teutonic Knights, as well as the Commune and the Genoese, were shocked, and sent delegates to Tyre to beg him at least to appoint a deputy. He was too angry at first to listen to them, but at last, probably on the pleading of John of Montfort, he nominated as Bailey Ballion of Ibelin, son of John of Asuv, and he appointed judges for the courts of the kingdom. Immediately afterwards he embarked for Cyprus, by night, taking leave of no one. From Cyprus he wrote to the Pope to justify his action. Ballion had a difficult task. There were riots in the streets of Acre between Muslim merchants from Bethlehem, under the Templar's protection, and Nestorian merchants from Mosul whose patrons were the hospiters. Hostilities flared up again between the Venetians and the Genoese. 
it was only with the help of the Patriarch and of the hospital that any government was maintained. In 1277, Maria of Antioch completed the sale of her rights to Charles of Anjou. Charles at once assumed the title of King of Jerusalem and sent out Roger of San Severino, Count of Marsico, with an armed force, to be his bailey at Acre. Thanks to the help of the Temple and the Venetians, Roger was able to land at Acre, where he produced credentials signed by Charles, by Maria and by the Pope, John 21. Ballion of Ibelin was acutely embarrassed. He had no instructions from King Hugh, and he knew that the Templars and the Venetians were ready to take up arms on behalf of Roger, while neither the Patriarch nor the Hospital would promise to intervene. To avoid bloodshed he delivered the citadel to the Angevine. Roger hoisted Charles's banner and proclaimed him King of Jerusalem and Sicily, and then ordered the barons of the kingdom to do homage to himself as the king's bailey. The barons hesitated, less for love of Hugh than for dislike of an admission that the throne could be transferred without a decision of the high court. To preserve some legality, they sent delegates to Cyprus to ask if Hugh would release them from their allegiance to him. Hugh refused to give an answer. At last, Roger who was firmly in the saddle, threatened to confiscate the estates of anyone who did not pay him homage, but he allowed time for one more appeal to Hugh. It was equally fruitless, so the barons submitted to Roger. Soon afterwards Bohem and Severn acknowledged him as lawful bailey. Roger appointed various Frenchmen from Charles's court as his chief officers. Odo Poilchine became Seneschkel, Richard of Nublans Constable and James Vidal Marshal. 1277, Bayibas invades Anatolia. These arrangements were very much to the liking of Bayibas. He could trust Charles's representative neither to provoke a new crusade nor to intrigue with the Mongols. With this sense of security, he was ready to allow Outrema a few more years of existence. In the meantime he could take the offensive against the Ilkhan. Abaga was conscious of the danger and was eager to build up an alliance with the West. In 1273 he sent a letter to Acre, addressed to Edward of England, asking when his next crusade would take place. It was conveyed to Europe by a Dominican, David, who was chaplain to the Patriarch, Thomas of Lentino. Edward sent a cordial answer but regretted that neither he nor the Pope had decided when there could be another expedition to the east. Mongol envoys appeared next year at the Council of Lyon, and two of them received Catholic baptism from the Cardinal of Ostia, the future innocent V. The replies that they received from the Pope and his curia were again friendly but vague. In the autumn of 1276 the Ilkin tried again. Two Georgians, the brothers John and James Vasely, landed in Italy to visit the Pope, with orders to go on to the courts of France and England. They bore a personal letter from a bargain to Edward I, in which he apologized that his help had not been more effective in 1271. None of this diplomatic activity produced any result. King Edward sincerely hoped to go on another crusade, but neither he nor Philip III of France was ready yet to do so. The Papal Curia was under the sinister influence of Charles of Anjou, who disliked the Mongols as the friends of his enemies, the Byzantines and the Genoese, and whose whole policy was based on an entente with Bayibas. The popes optimistically hoped to welcome the Mongols into the fold of the church but would not realize that the promise of rewards in heaven were an insufficient inducement for the Ilkhan. Even the pleas of Leo III of Armenia, who was at the same time the Ilkhan's faithful vassal and in communion with Rome could not produce any practical help from the papacy. Bayibas was able to pursue his schemes without the threat of Western intervention. In the spring of 1275 he led a raid in person into Cilicia, in which he sacked the cities of the plain, but was unable to penetrate to Sis. Two years later he decided to invade Anatolia. The Seljuk Sultan was now a child, Khosra III. His minister, Suleiman the Pavana, or keeper of the seals, was the chief power in the land but was quite unable to control the local emirates that were arising, of which the most important was the Karamanion. The Ilkhan maintained a loose protectorate over the Sultanate, enforced by the presence of a considerable Mongol garrison. 
On the 18th of April 1277, this garrison was routed by the Mamluks at Albistan. Five days later Bayibuz entered Cesare Mazaka. The Sultan's minister, Suleiman, and the Karamanian emir both hastened to congratulate the victor, but Abaga was roused and himself led a Mongol army by forced marches into Anatolia. Bayibuz did not wait for its arrival, but retired to Syria. Abaga quickly recovered control of the Seljuk Sultanate. The treacherous Suleiman was captured and executed, and rumor said that his flesh was served in a stew at the Ilkin's next state banquet. Bayibuz did not long survive his Anatolian adventure. Various stories were told of his death. According to some chroniclers, he died as a result of wounds received in the recent campaign, according to others, he drank too much kimis, the fermented mare's milk loved by the Turks and the Mongols. But the dominant rumor was that he had prepared poisoned kimis for the Ayyubite prince of Kerak, Al Kahir, son of an Nazir Dawud, who was with his army and who had offended him, and then carelessly drank from the same cup before it was cleaned. He died on 1 July 1277. His death removed the greatest enemy to Christendom since Saladin. When Bayibuz became Sultan, the Frankish dominions stretched along the coast from Gaza to Cilicia, with great inland fortresses to protect them from the east. In a reign of 17 years, he had restricted the Franks to a few cities along the coast Acre, Tyre, Sidon, Tripoli. Jebel and Tortosa, with the isolated town of Latakia and the castles of Athlet and Markab. He did not survive to see their entire elimination, but he had made it inevitable. Personally he had few of the qualities that won Saladin respect even from his foes. He was cruel, disloyal and treacherous, rough in his manners and harsh in his speech. His subjects could not love him, but they gave him their admiration, with reason, for he was a brilliant soldier, a subtle politician and a wise administrator, swift and secret in his decisions and clear-sighted in his aims. Despite his slave origins he was a patron of the arts and an active builder, who did much to beautify his cities and to reconstruct his fortresses. As a man he was evil, but as a ruler he was amongst the greatest of his time. Book of the end of Outrema chapter ith commerce of Outrema be the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence. Ezekiel 28, 16 Throughout the history of Outrema the straightforward issue between Christianity and Islam was often obscured or deflected by questions of economic advantage. The Frankish colonies lay in an area that was reputedly rich and that certainly controlled some of the greatest trade routes in the world. The financial and commercial ambitions of the colonists and their allies sometimes ran counter to religious patriotism, and there were occasions when their basic human needs demanded friendship with their Muslim neighbors. There was no commercial motive force behind the launching of the First Crusade. The Italian maritime cities, whose merchants were the shrewdest money makers of the time, had at first been alarmed by a movement that might well ruin the trading relations that had been built up with the Muslims of the Levant. It was only when the crusade was successful and Frankish settlements were founded in Syria that the Italians offered their help, realizing that they could use the new colonies to their own advantage. The economic urge that impelled the crusaders was, rather, land hunger among the lesser nobles of France and the Low Countries and the desire of the peasants that to escape from their grim, impoverished homes and the floods and famines of recent years and to migrate to lands of legendary wealth. To many of the simple folk the distinction between this world and the next was vague. They confused the earthly with the heavenly Jerusalem and expected to find a city paved with gold and flowing with milk and honey. Their hopes deceived them but disillusion came slowly. The urban civilization of the East and its higher standard of living gave an appearance of opulence which returning pilgrims reported to their friends. But as time went on the reports were less favorable. After the Second Crusade there was no mass movement amongst the peasants of the West to find new homes in the Holy Land. Adventurous noblemen still went East to make their fortunes, but one of the difficulties in organizing the later crusades was the lack of economic inducement. In fact, the Frankish provinces of Outrema were not naturally rich. There were fertile districts, such as the plains of Esdralon, of Sharon and of Jericho, 
the narrow coastal strip between the Lebanon mountains and the sea, the valley of the Bukhaya and the plain of Antioch. But, in comparison with the country beyond the Jordan and the Oran and the Bekaa, Palestine was barren and unproductive. The value of Alt Jordan to the Franks had lain as much in the corn that it grew as in its command of the road from Damascus to Egypt. Without the help of Alt Jordan, it was not always easy for the kingdom of Jerusalem to feed itself. If the harvest were bad, corn had to be imported from Muslim Syria. During the last decades of Outrema, when the Franks were reduced to the towns of the coastal strip, Corn must always have been imported. Products of Outrema or other foodstuffs were inadequate supply. The hills supported large numbers of sheep, goats, and pigs. There were orchards and vegetable gardens surrounding all the towns, and there were plentiful olive groves. Indeed, it is possible that olive oil was exported in small quantities to the west, while rare Palestinian fruits, such as the sweet lemon or the grenadine, were sometimes seen on the dinner tables of the wealthy in Italy. There were, however, few products that Outrema could export on a big enough scale to bring any appreciable revenue into the country. The most important of these was sugar. When the Crusaders arrived in Syria, they found that sugar cane was cultivated in many coastal areas and in the Jordan Valley. They continued the cultivation and learned from the natives the process of extracting sugar from the cane. There was a great sugar factory at Acre, and factories in most of the coastal cities. The main center of the industry was Tyre. Almost all the sugar consumed in Europe during the 12th and 13th centuries came from Outrema. The second chief export was cloth of various sorts. The silkworm had been cultivated round Beirut and Tripoli since the end of the 6th century, while flax was grown in the plains of Palestine. Silken stuffs were sold for export. Samite was made up at Acre, Beirut and Latakia, and Tyre was famed for the fabric known as Zendado or Sendal. The linen of Nablus had an international reputation. The purple dye from Tyre was still fashionable for clothes. But the Italians could also buy silks and linens in the markets of Syria and Egypt, where supplies were larger and prices often lower. It was the same with glass. The Jews in various cities, especially Tyre and Antioch, produced glass for export, but they had to face the competition of glass from Egypt. Tanneries probably only supplied local needs, but pottery was occasionally exported. There was always a market in Egypt for wood. From the earliest stages the Egyptian fleet had been built with timber that came from the forests of Lebanon and the hills south of Antioch, and the Egyptians also required large quantities of timber for architectural purposes. Wars between Egypt and the Crusading states seldom interrupted this traffic for long. There were iron mines near Beirut, but their production probably was insufficient for export. A certain number of herbs and spices were exported. The most important was balm. As it was mainly used in Europe for the services of the church, balm from the Holy Land was particularly popular. In the 12th century it was grown in large quantities near Jerusalem. But the crop was not easy to grow, as it needed expensive irrigation. After the Muslim reconquest at the end of the century its cultivation declined and was soon abandoned. The transit trade far greater revenues were obtained by the rulers of Outrema from merchandise that passed through the country. There was an increasing demand in medieval Europe for eastern goods, spices, dyes, scented woods, and silk and porcelain, as well as for goods from the Muslim countries just over the borders of Outrema. But this trade inevitably depended on political circumstances in Asia. When the Crusades began the bulk of the Far Eastern trade travelled by sea across the Indian Ocean and up the Red Sea to Egypt, attracted by the wealth of the Egyptian cities and the security of Fatimid rule away from its earlier route up the Persian Gulf to Baghdad. The Syrian ports only served for the export of more local goods, such as indigo from Iraq or Damascene metalwork and for any spices from southern Arabia that were carried by caravan rather than by boats. The petty wars that followed the Turkish invasions at the end of the 11th century did not encourage either commerce or industry in the Syrian hinterland. It was only when Nur ed-Din and, after him, 
Saladin made an ordered unit of Muslim Syria and Egypt that prosperity in Syria revived. Local products increased, and goods from Iraq and Persia could safely travel across to Aleppo or Horns or Damascus, and thence to the sea. The ports used by the merchants of Aleppo were Saint Simeon, which they reached through Antioch, and Latakia, Tortosa and Tripoli served as the ports of Horns, and Acre for Damascus. Though the Italians had helped the Crusaders in the conquest of each of these ports, their main business interest remained in Egypt. Acts concerned with commerce published in Venice during the 12th century mention Alexandria far more often than they mention Acre, particularly after the Venetians had been ejected from Constantinople. The records of the Genoese international law scribe during the years 1156 to 1164 show that nearly twice as many of his clients were interested in Alexandria as in the Frankish East. It is also remarkable that during the first half of the 12th century most travellers bound from Europe to Palestine either went first in Venetian or Genoese ships to Constantinople and thence by land or in Greek coastal ships to Syria or else sailed direct from southern Italian ships of the Kingdom of Sicily. It seems, therefore, that there were not many ships from the Italian merchant ports that made regular voyages to Syria till the later years of the century. Till then the amount of goods that passed through the Syrian ports cannot have been very large, and as the customs duties on these transitory goods were only about 10% of their value, it is easy to understand why the exchequer of Outrema was seldom full and why the kings were so often tempted to go raiding at times when it would have been more honourable and more diplomatic to keep the peace. Role of the Italian traders It is also easy to understand why the Italian maritime cities were shy of supporting the crusade too readily. It might be their Christian duty to aid the Franks against the Muslims. But their whole prosperity depended upon the maintenance of good terms with the Muslims. Whenever they gave help to a Christian enterprise, they ran the risk of losing their trading rights with Alexandria. Yet without their cooperation, the Crusaders could never have conquered the coastal cities, and the fact of their cooperation shows that their problem was not so simple after all. The Genoese sent help while the First Crusade was still at Antioch. A Pisan squadron set out before the news of the capture of Jerusalem reached the west, and their later coldness towards the kingdom of Jerusalem was due more to Baldwin I's quarrel with Dambert, who had been their archbishop, than to any commercial calculation. Even the Venetians, who had the closest connection with Egypt, had offered assistance to Godfrey of Lorraine just before his death. This policy was not quite as risky as it seemed at first sight. Trade cannot exist unless it is to the benefit of both parties. The Muslim authorities in Egypt had no more wish than the Italians to break off commercial relations for long. Though they might in an access of rage close Alexandria to Christian ships, they themselves suffered from the interruption of business. Their reprisals were never therefore enforced too strictly. In addition the Italians found many advantages in securing a share of the newly conquered ports. In Muslim cities and even in Constantinople they could never feel secure. A popular riot might destroy their establishments, or the caprices of alien rulers might interfere with their business. Though the actual volume of trade to be conducted through the Christian Syrian ports might be less than through Constantinople or Alexandria they could count on uninterrupted business. Their only difficulties arose out of the rivalry of fellow Italians not from the hostility of local rulers. There was also another advantage of growing importance to be derived from the Frankish ports. The main difficulty of the Italians was to find goods in Europe whose sale would pay for the oriental goods that they wished to buy. Till the early years of the 10th century the main Venetian export had been slaves from Central Europe, but the conversion of the slaves and the Hungarians had ended this traffic. In the later half of the 13th century the Genoese revived the slave trade, carrying Turkish and Tartar slaves from the Black Sea ports to sell to the Mamluks in Egypt, but during the intervening years there were few slaves available. The only important exports from the West were metal and wood. As the main use for these materials was for armaments, the ecclesiastical authorities in Europe naturally disapproved of their sale to the Muslims. 
but the Italians gradually learned that the crusading movement and the existence of Outrema drew a large number of soldiers, diplomats, and above all, pilgrims to the east. If the Italians carried them, the money that they paid for their fares and for their expenses on board gave the ship owners cash that they could spend in the Syrian ports on goods imported from further to the east. Finally, hard headed though the Italian merchants were, religious scruples were not entirely ignored. Many men, even in Genoa or Venice, preferred to do business in a Christian rather than in a Muslim port, and there was the practical consideration that the church strongly disapproved of trade with the infidel and the church was politically powerful in Italy. Its enmity could cause serious embarrassment. The heyday of the commerce at Outrema was during the decade just before Saladin's reconquest of Jerusalem and during the first decades of the 13th century. The Muslim world was united and prosperous, and the Italians had discovered the advantages of trade through the Christian ports. Meanwhile the Frankish colonists had learned how to make friends with their infidel neighbors. The Muslim pilgrim, Ibn Jubay, who in 1184 traveled with a caravan of Muslim traders from Damascus to Acre, makes it clear that such caravans were of frequent occurrence. He was impressed by the smooth arrangements for the collection of customs dues. Acre was the busiest port of the coast. It was the natural port of Damascus and therefore not only was used for the products of Damascene factories and of the rich countryside of the Oran but also served the merchants from the Yemen who came up the pilgrims road along the edge of the Arabian coast. It also possessed the only safe harbor in all Palestine. Voyagers to the holy places preferred to land the rather than at Jaffa with its open roadstead, where so many accidents had occurred before Acre had been captured by the crusaders. The one disadvantage of Acre was that the inner harbor was too small to take the larger vessels of the time which had either to lie off the breakwater, where they were exposed to the southwest wind, or else go up the coast to the larger and more secure harbour of Tyre. In northern Syria the best all-weather harbour was at Latakia, though St. Simeon, at the mouth of the river Ounds, was more convenient for Antioch and Aleppo and was used for smaller vessels. Trade routes under the Mongols The Assizes of Jerusalem mention a number of eastern goods that passed through the custom houses of Outrema. Besides silk and other fabrics, there were various spices, such as cinnamon, cardamom, cloves, mace, musk, galangale, and nutmeg, as well as indigo, madder, and aloe wood and ivory. The Franks themselves took very little part in this traffic. The goods were brought to the coast by merchants from the interior, Muslims or native Christians, and in northern Syria by Greeks and Armenians from Antioch also. The visiting merchants were treated with courtesy. The Muslims were allowed to carry out their worship in the Christian cities. Indeed, in Acre itself a portion of the great mosque, which had been converted into a church, was put aside for Muslim rites. There were khans at which they could stay, and there were Christian households that took in Muslim lodgers. The Italian merchants bought directly from the Muslim importers. Besides the Italians it seems that a certain number of Muslims came by sea to Acre to buy goods from the interior, in particular Mogrobis from northwest Africa, who would journey themselves as far as Damascus or other inland Muslim cities. The expansion of the Mongol Empire in the 13th century altered the main trade routes from the Far East. Once the Mongols had conquered the interior of Asia they encouraged merchants to take the overland route from China, through Turkestan and either to the north of the Caspian to the ports on the north coast of the Black Sea, such as Kaffa, or south of the Caspian and through Iran to Trebizond, on the south coast of the Black Sea, or to Ayaz, in the Cilician Kingdom of Armenia. The perfect order kept by the Mongols made this route preferable to the hazardous sea route across the Indian Ocean. In the 12th century Chinese junks had frequently sailed west of Ceylon to the Arabian ports. Now it was seldom worth their while to go further than the east coast of India. The Mongol conquest of Iraq resulted in some of the Indian trade reaching the west by sea up the Persian Gulf, and a proportion of it passed through Damascus or Aleppo to the Frankish ports. 
but most of the merchants preferred to stay within the Mongol dominions and thence cut across to the Mediterranean and Ayas, while most of the Indian trade was carried by land through Afghanistan and Persia. Egypt was still a rich market for Oriental goods. But it was no longer on the cheapest route from the Far East to Europe. Meanwhile, both Venice and Genoa, with Pisa lagging behind, were steadily increasing their trade, and their rivalry with each other grew intense. The shifting of the trade routes enhanced their competition. Venice at first controlled the Black Sea, owing to her domination over the Latin Empire at Constantinople. She therefore did not object to the rise of Mongol power. But when the Byzantines recaptured their capital in 1261, with the active help of Genoa, the Genoese were able to exclude the Venetians from the Black Sea and to keep the monopoly of the Central Asiatic trade and, as a profitable sideline, the slave trade between the Russian steppes and Egypt. As the Mamluk government was dependent on a steady supply of slaves from the Kipchak and neighboring Turkish tribes, it was impossible for the Venetians to exclude Genoa from Alexandria. Though the Venetians were allowed by the Armenian king to share in the Mongol trade that came to Ayas, it was essential for Venice to try to drive the Genoese out of the Frankish ports. As far as Acre was concerned, they were successful. Tyre, to which the Genoese had to retire, was less well placed. It became the general policy of Venice, in her hatred of Genoa, to oppose the Mongols out of whose empire Genoa was reaping such large profits. In consequence, the Venetians used their influence at Acre to induce the government that to support the Mamluks against the Mongols. The wealth of the barons the development of Ayas as the main Mediterranean outlet for Mongol trade naturally lessened the importance of the Frankish ports. But the general increase of Asiatic trade under the Mongols was such that there was always a surplus that followed the older routes. Merchants from Mosul regularly visited Acre during the second half of the 13th century. The wars between the Mamluks and the Mongols did not much inconvenience the passage of caravans from Iraq and Iran to Palestine. Right up to its last years as the Christian capital Acre was full of commercial activity, while, further north, Latakia was handling so much trade from Aleppo that the merchants of Aleppo especially begged the Mamluk Sultan to capture the port because so valuable a place should not be in infidel hands. All this flourishing commerce was, however, of little profit to the Franks themselves. By making the seaports a battleground between rival Italian colonies, it was a source of positive political weakness, and even if the Italians kept the peace, not much money came through to the governments of Outremer. The king was officially entitled to about 10% of the custom tolls, but in fact he had sold huge shares of that percentage to his vassals or to the church or to the military orders. Not much was left for himself. The princes of Antioch and counts of Tripoli were slightly better off, for they had created fewer money thieves. But great fortunes were not to be made in Outremer. There were lords who were wealthy enough to live in luxury, such as the Iblins of Beirut, who owned the local iron mines, or the Montforts of Tyre, with their sugar factories. To the untrained eyes of Western travelers, the citizens of Outremer seemed fantastically prosperous, but it was a superficial appearance. The towns were cleaner and better built. Their inhabitants could buy silken garments and employ scents and spices at prices that only the very rich could afford in Western Europe. But such things were local products and therefore comparatively cheap. We have very little information about the activities of the bourgeois classes in Outrema. They seem to have taken no part in international trade but to have confined themselves to shopkeeping and the manufacture of goods for local consumption. Politically, they had some power. The Commune of Acre, which was composed of the Frankish bourgeoisie, was an important element in the state. But it seems to have kept itself apart from the native communities, even from the Orthodox, who were treated as a separate entity. In Antioch, where the Commune was even more influential, the Frankish and Greek bourgeoisie worked together. There was probably more intermarriage there, and the Franks had never been as numerous as in Acre, or in Tripoli which seems to have followed the pattern of Acre. The labouring classes were mostly of native or of half-caste origin, 
and there were usually considerable numbers of slaves, Muslims captured in the war, to work in the mines or on the construction of public buildings or on royal or noble estates. The coinage of our dream of the government was always short of money. Even in times of peace, the country had to be ready for a sudden outbreak of war, and war usually resulted in the devastation of large areas of the countryside. The revenue from tolls and taxes was inadequate, and a sudden emergency, such as the capture of the king or of whole sections of the army, could not be met without outside help. Fortunately, outside help was often forthcoming. Quite apart from the money obtained, usually unwisely, by raids for plunder into Muslim territory, continual gifts were sent from Europe. Palestine was the Holy Land, and the Crusaders and colonists were generally regarded as the soldiers of Christ. Visitors paid a tax on arrival, and not only did pilgrims bring money with them into the country, to spend there or to give in alms but many of the shrines and abbeys there were given lands in the west, whose revenues were sent out to them. The military orders derived most of their income from their endowments in the west, to such an extent that they were still enormously wealthy even after the loss of all their Syrian possessions. Individual citizens of Outrema, from the king downwards, would receive occasional gifts from western relatives or sympathizers. These subsidies helped largely to balance the finances of Outrema, and thus the luxuries that visitors from the West admired in the Syrian cities were paid for in part by their compatriots at home. Another source of economic strength, whose effect is more difficult to evaluate, was the coinage of Outrema. When the Crusades began, there was no gold coinage in Western Europe, except in Sicily and Muslim Spain. Silver was the most precious metal employed nor at that time were the Muslim states in Syria issuing gold coins, though the rival caliphs at Baghdad and Cairo both kept up the practice. Yet almost as soon as the crusading states were established, the king of Jerusalem, the prince of Antioch and the count of Tripoli all began to mint dinars of gold, which were known by the name of Saracenate Besants and which were imitated from the dinars of the Fatimids but contained only about two-thirds of their gold content. These coins, particularly the coins of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, which were known to the Muslims as Sauri, the dinars of Tyre, soon circulated widely through the Near East. It is difficult to understand where the Franks obtained the gold. Plunder and ransom can only have produced a small and irregular amount. The main source of gold at the time was the Sudan, and it is possible that some gold was brought to the Frankish ports by the Maghrabi merchants that came to trade there. But to explain the appearance of the coinage there must have been a general movement of gold from the Muslim countries to the Christian. The European settlers must have bought gold, no doubt at a very high price, from the Muslims in return for silver, which was plentiful in Europe, and the issues of this debased gold coinage must have helped in the whole movement. Large quantities of gold must have passed on further to the west. For it is remarkable that during the 13th century gold coinage of an excellent alloy began to appear in Western Europe. The right to issue gold coins was kept firmly in the hands of the rulers of our dreamer. Neither the Italian colonies nor the military orders were allowed to infringe on this monopoly. The tenants in chief could only mint bronze coins for local needs. The military orders had an additional source of wealth, derived from their banking activities. With their vast possessions all over Christendom they were admirably placed to finance crusading expeditions. The French participation in the Second Crusade was only made possible by the help of the Templars, who paid out enormous sums to Louis VII in the East, and were repaid in France. By the end of the 12th century the Templars made a regular practice of money lending. They charged a high interest, but, however unreliable they might be politically, their financial reputation was so high that even the Muslims had confidence in them and made use of their services. The Hospiters and the Teutonic Knights conducted similar operations, but on a lesser scale. The governments of our dreamer gained nothing directly from these activities, which increased the power and insubordination of the orders, but they were for the financial benefit of the country as a whole. Economic dilemma of our dreamer The economic history of the Crusades is still very obscure. Information is inadequate, 
and there are many details that cannot now be explained. But it is impossible to understand their political history without taking into account the commercial and financial needs of the settlers and of the Italian merchants. These needs usually ran counter to the ideological impulse that started and maintained the crusading movement. Outremo was permanently poised on the horns of a dilemma. It was founded by a blend of religious fervor and adventurous land hunger. But if it was to endure healthily, it could not remain dependent upon a steady supply of men and money from the West. It must justify its existence economically. This could only be done if it came to terms with its neighbors. If they were friendly and prosperous, it too would prosper. But to seek amity with the Muslims seemed a complete betrayal of Crusader ideals, and the Muslims for their part could never quite reconcile themselves to the presence of an alien and intrusive state in lands that they regarded as their own. Their dilemma was less painful, for the presence of the Christian colonists was not necessary for their trade with Europe, however convenient it might be at times. Good relations were therefore always precarious. The second great problem that Outrema had to face was its relations with the Italian merchant cities. They were an indispensable element in its existence. Without them, communications with the West would have been almost impossible to maintain, and it would have been quite impossible to export the products of the country or to have captured any of the through trade from the further east. But the Italians, with their arrogance, their rivalries and the cynicism of their policy, caused irremediable harm. They would hold aloof from vital campaigns and openly parade the disunity of Christendom. They supplied the Muslims with essential war material. They would riot and fight against each other in the streets of the cities. The rulers of our dreamer must often have regretted the rich commerce that brought such dangerous and unruly allies to their shores, and yet without this commerce the story of Outrema would have been shorter and grimmer. It is never easy to decide between the hostile claims of material prosperity and ideological faith. Nor can any government help to satisfy either claim completely. Men cannot live on ideology alone, while prosperity depends on wider issues than can be contained in one narrow strip of land. The Crusaders made many mistakes. Their policy was often hesitant and changeable. But they cannot be entirely blamed for failing to solve a problem for which, in fact there was no solution. Chapter e architecture in the ARTS in Outrema deck thyself now with majesty and excellency and array thyself with glory and beauty. Job XL, 10 The Franks of Outremer allowed the commerce that should have established their country to slip out of their grasp. But in some of the arts they kept control of their productions. Their achievements here were remarkable, for the colonists were not numerous and only few of them can have been artists. Moreover they had come to a land whose artistic traditions were far older than their own nor could they find there the materials to which they were used. Yet they began to develop a style which answered satisfactorily to their needs. Most of their smaller works of art have perished. The turbulent history of Syria and Palestine has not permitted the survival of things that are delicate and fragile. Their architecture was more durable, though there, as in most medieval countries, there is little left except for military and ecclesiastical monuments. Even in these change and decay have altered the original form. Apart from the holiest shrines of Christendom, which the Muslims were too scrupulous to touch, but which later Christians have repaired, the churches that still stand were preserved because they were adapted to become mosques. Others have fallen into ruin. The Frankish castles and fortifications were also severely damaged in the course of the wars that the Muslim conquerors were obliged, if they wished to use them to reconstruct much of them, especially the outside walls and the gates. What man left alone, nature helped to ruin, in that earthquake-stricken land. Even where modern archaeologists have brought their scholarship to the work of restoration, as at Crack de Chevaliers, it is not always possible to distinguish clearly between what is Crusader and what is Mameluke. The first buildings that the Crusaders needed to construct were for their defense. Churches and palaces must wait till the country was securely held. The walls of the towns had to be repaired, 
and castles built to guard the frontiers and to serve as safe administrative centers for the country districts. The fortifications of the main cities only required to be patched here and there, except in the few cases where the crusaders had only forced an entry by breaching the walls. At Antioch the great defense system constructed by the Byzantines towards the close of the 10th century had suffered very little damage. The Latin princes had no need to add to them. Similarly little repair work was required on the Fatimid walls of Jerusalem, though the Crusaders seem almost at once to have made alterations and improvements to the Tower of David. But soon they began to build castles in towns where the fortifications were already adequate. These castles were all built on the edge of the town and could be defended independently. Their lords wished not only to be able to carry on resistance even if the town fell to the enemy, but also to be in a position to awe the town, should it prove unruly. The first castle that can be dated with certainty is Count Raymond's at Mount Pilgrim, built in 1104 to provide him with headquarters while he besieged Tripoli. It was outside the town, though Muslim Tripoli was later built at its base. But of Raymond's own work little more than the West Wall now survives. The castles of the princes of Galilee at Tiberias and Tyrone must have been built about the same time. But the first great age of castle building began in the second decade of the 12th century, under Baldwin II, and was continued under Fulk, when such magnificent fortresses as Kerak of Mob, Beaufort and, further north, Sayon, were constructed as well as the smaller forts of Judea, such as Blanchigard and Ibelin. The Byzantine castle the Crusaders found military architecture far more highly developed in the east than in the west, where the stone-built castle was only now beginning to appear. The Romans had studied military defense as a science. The Byzantines, stimulated by the endless foreign invasions that they had to face, had evolved it to suit their needs, and the Arabs had learned from them, but the Byzantines' problems were not the same as the Crusaders. The Byzantines assumed that manpower was always available, they could afford large garrisons. They took immense trouble to defend their cities well. The walls of Constantinople were still able, a thousand years after they were built, to defy the up-to-date cannon of the Ottomans, and the walls of Antioch struck the Crusaders with admiration. But the Byzantine castle was not much more than a fortified camp. It was designed to deal with an enemy whose armaments were less formidable than the Byzantines, for the Arabs, who were their most dangerous rivals, were less advanced in siege machinery. Its walls did not have to be solid, for a system of outworks, of which the main feature was at least one ditch of considerable width prevented the enemy from bringing his battering rams or grappling ladders close up against them. Towers were built with a slight salient at regular intervals along the walls, less to defend the walls themselves than to give the archers and pitch throwers of the garrison a longer range into the enemy lines. The keep in the center of the Encinti was designed not to be an ultimate point of defense, but, rather, to be a storehouse for armaments and provisions. Except for a few examples on the Armenian frontier where semi-independent border barons lived, the Byzantine castle was not intended to be a residence. The commander was a professional soldier who left his wife and children at home. Finally, though advantage was taken of natural defenses, the inaccessibility of the site was not the first consideration. The main use of the castle was as barracks. It was inconvenient to force the soldiers to toil up and down a mountain every time that they moved. The Arabs tended to follow the Byzantine models, though, as their armies were essentially mobile and aggressive, they were less interested in problems of defense. The Crusaders studied the military architecture that they found on their journey eastward, and learned much from it. But their essential needs were different. They were always short of manpower and could not maintain large garrisons. Their castles therefore had to be far stronger and easier to defend. The site must be chosen for its defensive qualities. Every slope and hillock must be used to the fullest advantage, and, as scouts to carry messages could seldom be spared, each stronghold should be able to see and signal to its neighbor. Walls had to be far thicker and taller, to be able to stand up to a direct attack, 
for the defense of outworks involved too many men. At the same time the castle must serve as a residence for the lord and an office for his administration. The Franks brought their feudal methods with them and they were governing an alien people. The castle was the seat of local government. Its enceinte should also be large enough to give protection to flocks and herds during the frequent enemy raids. The castle, in fact, played a far more important part amongst the Franks than ever amongst the Byzantines or the Arabs. 12th century castles in the west The castle was as yet no more than the solid square keep or donjon, of a type perfected by the Normans. It was inadequate for the requirements of our dreamer. The Crusaders were obliged to be pioneers. They borrowed many ideas from the Byzantines. It was from them that they learned the use of machicolation, and the value of placing towers along the curtain wall, though there they soon made an amendment, as they discovered that a rounded tower gave a wider range than the rectangular towers that the Byzantines preferred. Their smaller castles built in the earlier 12th century, such as Belvoir, were built on the usual Byzantine design, with a more or less rectangular outer wall, studded with towers, enclosing a central space which contained the keep. But the sites were chosen so as to dispense with elaborate outworks, and the whole construction was far more solid. Byzantine work was often incorporated. At Seon the wide Byzantine fosses were completed by a narrow channel, 90 feet deep, cut through the solid rock. The Franks also added the portcullis, which had not been used in the east since Roman times, and the bent entrance, which the Arabs were beginning to favor but which the Byzantines seldom employed, probably because it was inconvenient for the heavy engines that they kept within the castles. The larger castles were naturally more complicated. A fortress such as Kerak had to house not only the lord and his family but also the soldiers and clerks required for the administration of a province. In such a castle in the 12th century the keep, with the residential quarters, was usually at the furthest and most easily defensible corner of the enceinte. Storerooms and the chapel were usually placed in the central space, while other towers round the enceinte were large enough to contain barrack rooms and offices. The plan varied according to the terrain of the Asiette, the area on which the castle was situated. The keep was still a simple rectangular tower, on the Norman model, usually with only one entrance. The masonry was solid and plain, but some attempt was made to decorate the residential quarters and the chapel. Unfortunately none of the 12th century decoration in the castles has survived. Those castles that remained Christian after Saladin's time were redecorated in the next century. The Saracens altered those that they occupied themselves, and the remainder fell into ruin. As the 12th century advanced, there were certain changes in the plan of castles. It became to be considered more logical to put the keep, which was the strongest portion of the castle, at the weakest section of the enceinte, and the keep itself was usually rounded rather than rectangular as a rounded surface resisted bombardment more effectively. More doors and posterns were provided. The size of castles tended to increase, particularly when the military orders built castles for themselves or took over castles from the lay nobility. In the castles of the orders there were no ladies to be accommodated, and though high officials might be provided with elegant quarters, every resident was there for a military purpose. The larger fortresses, such as Crack or Athlet, were military towns capable of housing several thousand fighting men and the servants necessary for such a community. But they were seldom filled to capacity. The defenses were now usually strengthened by the use of a double, concentric enceinte. The great hospital of castles, such as Crack and Markab, had a double girdle. The Templars followed the same system at Safita, but as a rule they preferred the single enceinte. Their chief 13th century castles, Tortosa and Athlet, kept to the earlier pattern, but in both cases the longer sections of the walls rose straight from the sea. Across the peninsula which joined Athlet to the land there was a complicated double line. The Teutonic castle at Montfort also kept to a single enceinte. The idea of the double enceinte was not new. The land walls of Constantinople were built with a double line in the 5th century and in the 8th the Caliph al-Manzur surrounded his circular city of Baghdad with a double line. 
but the hospiters were the first to apply it to a single castle, though it could only be used for a castle of considerable size. Defensive weakness of the castles are the 13th century improvements were the carefully smooth facing of the curtain walls, to give less hold to grappling ladders, the wider use of machicolation and of loopholes for archers, which were now usually given a downward slant and sometimes a stirrup shaped base and greater complication in the entrance gates. At crack there was a long covered approach, commanded by loopholes in the side walls, then three right-angled corners, a portcullis and four separate gates. Posterns were provided at unexpected corners, a device first introduced by the Byzantines. These huge fortresses, with their solid masonry, superbly situated on crags and mountain tops, seemed impregnable in the days before gunpowder was known. The terrain usually made the use of ladders impracticable, nor could siege towers to dominate the walls be brought up unless there was some flat ground outside and no foss. It was often hard enough for the besiegers to find a close enough site on which to place mangonels or balisters for hurling rocks. The chief technical danger was the mine. Engineers would dig a tunnel under the walls, propping it up as they went with wooden posts, which were eventually set alight with brushwood, causing the tunnel chamber, and with it the masonry above to collapse. But mining was impossible if the castle was built, like crack, on solid rock. When a castle fell it was usually for other reasons. In spite of storerooms and cisterns, famine and thirst were real dangers. The lack of manpower often meant that the defences could not be properly maintained. The kingdom often could not afford to send a relieving force, and that knowledge induced pessimism amongst the garrison. In the full flush of Saladin's triumphs the great castle of Sayon, which was reputed to be the strongest of its time, only resisted the Muslims for three days. The importance of the Crusader castles lies in the sphere of military rather than of aesthetic history. Returning Crusaders brought back to Europe the ideas that had found expression there and such castles as Richard Coeur de Lyon's Chateau Gaillard introduced them to the Western world. But the castles in the East had their aesthetic value. Their chapels are amongst the best examples of the ecclesiastical architecture of our dreamer. Their great halls, of which the loveliest is at Crack, are comparable with the best early Gothic halls of Western Europe. Their residential quarters, which survived to give us some idea of the palaces of the nobility of our dreamer, show delicacy and taste. The chamber of the Grand Master at Crack, high up in the southwest tower of the inner Encinti, with its ribbed vaulting, its slender pilasters and its simple but well-carved decorative ornamental frieze of five-petaled flowers, was perhaps more elegant than most rooms in the great fortresses but it must have been paralleled in the richer castles and palaces in the towns. Its style is the 13th century Gothic of northern France, while the Great Hall has stone tracery that is akin to worker dreams, in the contemporary church of Saint Nicholas. The castles were mainly the work of engineers. The churches were intended to be works of art. When the Crusaders arrived in the east they found an old tradition of building there, suited to the country wood was a rare commodity. All that the forests produced was used for shipbuilding and for armaments. The architects therefore had to build without beams. Their roofs were of stone, and were usually flat, so as to provide a terrace in the cool of the evening. Vaulting was generally used to support the roof, and the pointed dutch, with its ability to carry heavy weights. was already fashionable. The Syrian builder's native style was the Byzantine Arab, which had been perfected under the Omayyad caliphs, but he was in touch with later Abbasid developments and with Fatimid architecture and its North African influences. He had recently seen Byzantines working on the holy places and in Antioch, and there had been an influx of Armenians, skilled craftsmen with their own styles. The architecture of the holy places The first church that the Crusaders built in the east was the Cathedral of St. Paul at Tarsus, which was finished before 1102. It is a coarse and elegant building, in the style of the Romanesque churches of northern France, but with its arches pointed. It is rectangular, 
with two aisles and a nave lined with alternate piers and columns. The columns come from some ancient building. Their capitals are simple blocks with triangles cut out of the corners, a form of decoration to be found in the Rhineland, but also in Armenia, and here probably made by Armenian workmen. In its crude way it gives a foretaste of later crusader architecture. As soon as the colonists were safely settled, their first care was to repair the holy places and then to provide their main towns with suitable churches. Of the most sacred shrines the Church of the Nativity at Bethlehem, built by Constantine and repaired by Justinian, was still in good order. The only architectural additions made by the Crusaders were a simple Gothic cloister, erected probably about 1240, and a north and south doorway to the Grotto of the Nativity, built about 1180 in a late Romanesque style with a pointed arch and acanthus decoration on the capitals which is probably Syrian work. They also built monastic buildings round the church, which have now been destroyed. But the most venerated church of all, that of the Holy Sepulchre at Jerusalem, seemed to them inadequate. After its destruction by the Caliph Hakim, the Byzantines had rebuilt the rotunda surrounding the tomb itself, but they had flattened the east end and built three apses there. The chapel of Saint Mary the Virgin had been attached to the north of the rotunda and the three chapels of Saint John, the Trinity and Saint James to the south. Golgotha had been rebuilt as a separate chapel, as had Saint Helena's chapel with the grotto of the invention of the cross. The buildings were all sumptuously decorated with marbles and mosaics. The crusaders decided to bring all the buildings together under one roof. The main work was apparently carried out after an earthquake in 1114 and before 1130, though parts were unfinished at the time of Baldwin II's death in 1131, and the whole new edifice was not consecrated till 15 July 1149, the 50th anniversary of the capture of the city. The belfry was added about the year 1175. The plan of the new building was inevitably affected by the site which was limited on there, south by the rock of Golgotha and on the east by the drop to the chapel of St. Helena, which lay several feet lower than the rotunda. The crusaders therefore broke down the east wall of the Byzantine rotunda, destroying its apses, and replacing the central one by a large arch leading into a new church. This consisted of a choir with a dome on pendentives near the west end, with an island and ambulatory going all round it, and with a curved east end, with three apses dot between the central and the southern apse a stairway led straight down into St. Helena's chapel. The south aisle lay against the chapel of Golgotha, which was rebuilt, though the Byzantine mosaics were retained together with the entrance columns. West of Golgotha and between it, the rotunda and the chapel of St. John, a new atrium was built, to include the stone of anointing and the tombs of Godfrey and King Baldwin I. A doorway, the present main entrance, led from the atrium into a courtyard. Along the north aisle there was an outer aisle, mainly of Byzantine construction, opening onto another courtyard, from which a passage led past the chapel of Saint Mary into the street of the Patriarch. A third courtyard surrounded the chapel of St. Helena and was itself surrounded by new buildings erected to house the Augustinian priors to whom the church was now entrusted. Churches in Jerusalem, such of the Crusaders' work as has survived the sack by the Guarismians in 1244, the passage of time, and the disastrous fire of 1808, shows a kinship to the great Cluniac pilgrimage churches, in particular that of St. Cernan of Toulouse which Pope Urban II consecrated immediately after the Council of Clermont. The ambulatory is strongly reminiscent of those of Cluny itself and St. Cernin. The difference lies in the proportions. The architects of the Holy Sepulchre kept their columns lower and sturdier, to keep them in harmony with those of the Byzantine Rotunda, whose design was probably intended to resist earthquake shocks. The decorative details, except where Byzantine mosaics and capitals were attained, can be compared to many in southern and southwestern France. The carvings, particularly the figure carvings on the lintels, seem mostly to be the work of the school of Toulouse, though they were probably carved locally. 
In general it seems that the architects and artists of the whole monument were Frenchmen, probably from southwest France, brought up in the Cluniac tradition. The architect of the Belfry is known to have been called Jordan, a name usually given to children baptized in the Holy River. He was probably born in Palestine. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre was the only older shrine to which the Crusaders made extensive alterations. They repaired several small chapels, such as that of the Ascension on the Mount of Olives and the Tomb of the Virgin at Geth's Main. To the Dome of the Rock, when it became the Church of the Templars, they only added decorative marble and ironwork, and the Mosque Alexa was equally untouched though the foundations were reconditioned to provide stables and storerooms, and buildings were set up round the mosque to house the order, while a wing added on the southwest became the favorite residence of the kings. In most of the towns that they colonized they found churches too badly ruined to be worth repair or else they left them to the indigenous sects that were already in possession. They took over some older monasteries, but on the whole preferred to erect their own buildings. Sometimes they used previous sites and foundations, as with the Basilica of Mount Zion, sometimes they slightly changed the orientation of the older site, as with the church at Geth's Main. More often they chose their own sites, or completely rebuilt churches on traditional sites. Apart from the Templars' churches, which were circular in shape, the invariable design for a small chapel was a rectangle, with an apse, sometimes included in the outer wall. At the east end. The masonry was solid. A single vault, pointed and cross ribbed, supported a flat stone roof. Such chapels were built in every castle, even in such desolate fortresses as that on the hill of the U era, by the ruins of ancient Petra. Larger churches also were rectangular, with side aisles running the length of the building, separated from the nave by pillars or piers. There were almost always three apses, usually hidden from the outside in the thickness of the wall. The great cathedral at Tyre and one or two other churches had short transepts, which made the floor plan cruciform but had no structural significance. The cathedral at Tortosa has a diaconicon and a prothesis built out at the southeast and northeast corners. A few churches, such as St. Anne's at Jerusalem, and, apparently, the cathedral at Caesarea, had domes on pendentives over the space before the sanctuary, but the roof was usually flat or barrel shaped. The side aisles were almost invariably covered by groined vaults. The nave had either a groined vault or one long pointed and ribbed barrel vault. When the aisles were lower than the rest of the church, there would be windows along the clerestory. Windows, even those at the east end, were small to keep out the fierce Syrian sunlight. With very few exceptions arches were pointed. Towers were rare. The Abbey Church on Mount Thaba had two towers, one on either side of the west entrance, each containing a small apsed chapel at ground level. Belfry towers were sometimes attached to the church, but never as an integral part. Church decoration The decoration of the 12th century churches was simple. Columns from ancient buildings were often used. The capitals varied. Some were ancient, some copied from the Byzantine and Arab styles of Corinthian and basket work, made perhaps by native masons or by Franks who had noticed local designs, and some in the Western Romanesque style. Some churches, such as that at Cariatella Nabe, had frescoes in the Byzantine style and there were mosaics in the Cenacle on Mount Sion and in the chapel of the Dormition next to it. Byzantine artists may have worked there, as they certainly did at the Nativity at Bethlehem, sent there by the Emperor Manuel along with their materials. But pictorial ornament was rare. Carved decorations round the arches were usually chevron or dogtooth. Very little figure sculpture has survived. The vassoyas of the arches were often cushioned, Another favorite decoration was a simple rosette. The general effect of the 12th century churches was somewhat heavy, almost squat in comparison with contemporary work in the West. This was due to the need to avoid the use of wood and to guard against earthquake, but the result was usually well proportioned. The Crusaders undoubtedly brought with them their architects, who were imbued in the styles of France, particularly of Provence and the Toulousain, 
but they clearly took the advice of local builders. Their use of pointed arches was learned in the east. The first known examples in the west are in two churches built about the year 1115 by Ida of Lorraine, the mother of the first two Frankish rulers of Jerusalem. Her eldest son, Eustace of Boulogne, had recently returned from Palestine. It is difficult not to believe that returning architects popularized the new device in the West, where it was developed to suit local structural needs. It is impossible to make generalizations about the origins of the various architectural and ornamental detail. The Dome of St. Anne's at Jerusalem closely resembles the domes that French architects built in Perigord, but the same type of dome, built on pendentives without a drum, could be found in the East. Romanesque carving is so often akin to Byzantine and Armenian carving that clear distinctions cannot easily be made. It is probable that figure carvings and the more fantastic capitals were the work of Frankish artists, but the traditional designs of the acanthus or the vine leaf were provided locally. The chevron pattern seems to have traveled southward, even in Europe, from the north, but the dogtooth was already known in the east. It appears as does the cushioned Van Sawyer on the Great Fatimid Gate, the Bab al Futu, at Cairo, which was itself built by Armenian architects from Edessa, a city where the Byzantines had a few decades previously been responsible for much new building. Mosaics and frescoes in the pictorial arts The surviving examples show so strong a Byzantine influence that it seems doubtful whether any Frankish artist worked in the East. The mosaics at Bethlehem were certainly designed and erected by artists from Constantinople, whose names were Basil and Ephraim, though they worked in cooperation with the local Latin authorities. Western as well as Eastern saints are depicted, and the inscriptions are in Latin as well as in Greek. The mosaic Christ in the Latin chapel at Calvary is probably their work. The rapidly perishing frescoes at Cariatel and Abar Byzantine in style. But, while the choice of subjects is Eastern, the inscriptions are Latin. There were certainly Greek artists working in Palestine in about 1170 under the Emperor Manuel's patronage, who were responsible for frescoes at the Orthodox monasteries of Kalaman and S. D. Euthymius. No doubt the Latin fathers at Cariat engaged them to decorate their church. The little church at Amayan, not far from Tripoli, is sometimes taken from its architecture to be a crusader monument, but its dedication to a Greek saint, Phacas, its Greek inscriptions and its Byzantine frescoes show it to have always been an orthodox shrine. It illustrates the difficulty of a sharp differentiation between local and Frankish styles. Many Frankish churches profited from gifts obtained by their prelates from the emperor at Constantinople. The great Archbishop William of Tyre tells us that he was given sumptuous presents for his cathedral by the Emperor Manuel, and the corpse of Bishop Urquhart of Nazareth, who visited the imperial city to negotiate Baldwin III's marriage and died there, came back equally well laden. Throughout the 12th century, particularly in the time of Manuel, there was frequent intercourse between Outremer and Byzantium, and the Byzantine artistic influence must have been great. It lingered on into the next century. The description given by Wilbrand of Oldenburg of the Palace of the Iblins at Beirut, with its mosaic and its marbles, suggests Byzantine work. The old lord, John of Ibelin, who built it, was the son of a Byzantine princess. The palace at Beirut was an exception. The 13th century architecture in Outrema kept closer than the 12th century to French traditions. With the restriction of Frankish territory to little more than the coastal cities, native workmen and native traditions seem to have played a smaller part. The last important church to be finished before Saladin's conquests was the Cathedral of the Annunciation at Nazareth. The building was destroyed by Bayibas, but the remarkable figure sculpture that remains is purely French. The great doorway that most of them adorned appears to have closely resembled those of many of the French cathedrals of the time, and the whole building was probably nearer to the French than the previous local style. The chief church to be built in the 13th century, that of St. Andrew at Acre, was a tall and graceful Gothic building. 
few traces of it now remain, but the descriptions and drawings of earlier travelers all emphasize its height. Its side aisles were tall and lit by long, narrow, acutely pointed windows, with a delicate blind arcade running round the outside walls beneath them. We cannot tell how the cloistry or the east end were lit, but over the west door there were three larger windows, and above them three in the form of an milder bowie fall that now survives of the church is a porch, probably from the west end, which was carried on camel back to Cairo after the conquest of Acre and set up as an entry to the mosque built in memory of the conquering Sultan, Al Ashraf. Its proportions are tall and delicate. A series of three slender pilasters alternating with two even more slender carries the curve of the arch on each side, and the moulding of the curve corresponds to the pilasters. In the space of the arch there is a trefoil arch, pierced by an Ile de Beauf. The style is the early Gothic of the south of France. The Psalter of Queen Milize end the 13th century work at Crac de Chevalier as shows the same taste for greater height. The Grand Master's Airy Chamber and the Great Banqueting Hall are both entirely Western in spirit. The latter has a porch whose proportions are very similar to that of St. Andrew at Acre, though its pilasters are less delicate, but it had an elaborate rose window in the center of the arch, where St. Andrew had an Ile de Beauf. There are unfortunately very few monuments of the 13th century left. But in general the style of our dreamer was coming close to the contemporary French Gothic style of Lusignan Cyprus and had moved away from the more indigenous style of the previous century. The surviving work at Nazareth suggests that Crusader art was keeping in touch with the Gothic movement in the West. Saladin's conquests induced many native craftsmen to throw in their lot with the Muslims. The collapse of Byzantium at the turn of the century inevitably diminished Byzantine influences, and the Third Crusade brought many more Western artists and workmen to the East. At the same time the growing hostility between the Latin and Orthodox churches probably inspired a sharper distinction between their styles. Only one twelfth century illuminated manuscript exists which is known to come from our dreamer. This is the Psalter known as that of Queen Milai's End. It certainly belonged to a woman, and as it mentions the deaths of Baldwin II and of Queen Morphia, but not that of King Fulk, it has been assumed to have belonged to Malai's end and to have been written before Fulk's death. It might, however, equally well have been made for Malai's end's sister, Jovita, abbess of Bethany, and in that case, as any mention of Fulk would have been irrelevant, it could date from any year during Jovita's lifetime, that is to say, till about 1180. The text was written by an accomplished Latin scribe and the decorative headpieces seem Latin rather than Byzantine, but the full page illustrations are Byzantine, in the style of the eastern provinces of the empire. The signature of a painter called Basil appears, and it is possible that this was the same Basil who was responsible for some of the mosaics at Bethlehem in 1169. The pictures have some resemblance to those in a lectionary in Syria decorated by Joseph of Melitene in the time of a bishop John, who has been identified with the bishop that reigned the from 1193 to 1220. It is possible therefore that the artist of the Melai's end Psalter was a Syrian trained in a Byzantine school, and it is probable that the work was made for the abbess Jovita towards the end of her long life. There is an interesting series of manuscripts usually considered to be Sicilian work, which modern research proves to have been written at Acre about the time of St. Louis' sojourn there, from 1250 to 1254. They are markedly Byzantine in style. Louis had made extensive purchases from the Emperor Baldwin II of Constantinople, and it may be that amongst the objects that he acquired were manuscripts which were sent to him at Acre and inspired the artists working there. It is impossible to say whether the school outlasted the king's return to France. Minor arts of the minor arts very little has been preserved, and it is impossible to tell what was made locally and what was imported from the east or from the west. Furniture and objects of daily use came no doubt from workshops on the spot, but most ornamental goods probably came from abroad, from Constantinople or the great Muslim cities, or were brought by visitors from France or Italy. 
a collection of objects found in the 19th century in the foundations of the monastic buildings at Bethlehem included two brass basins which seem to belong to the Mosan school of the 12th century and which are engraved with a series of pictures illustrating the life of Saint Thomas the Apostle, a pair of silver candlesticks which seem to be Byzantine work of the late 12th century, another pair of candlesticks of Limoges enamel of the late 12th century and a larger candlestick and a crozier head of Limoges enamel of the 13th century. The iron grill set up by the crusaders in the Dome of the Rock may be local work but strongly resembles the Romanesque iron work of France. The iron candelabra used in the churches were probably made on the spot but follow the usual designs of Western Europe. No identifiable pottery or glasses survived. Coins and seals were made locally. The former were intended for use in the East and therefore followed local Muslim patterns, even having inscriptions in Arabic. The seals of the 12th century are simple and crude, but those of the 13th century are more graceful and elaborate. A reliquary of crystal set in a stirrup-shaped and jewel-encrusted piece of silver and containing an inner case of carved wood, now preserved at Jerusalem, may be indigenous though the crystal and silver work probably came from Central Europe. Of ivory work there are the two delicately carved plaques that serve as covers for the Psalter of Queen Malai's end. The one has medallions giving the story of David, with the psychomacher in the corners, the other the works of mercy, with fantastic animals in the corners. The iconography is Western rather than Byzantine, though the royal costumes are Byzantine the animals Moorish and the decoration Armenian in inspiration. It seems unlikely that there should have been any ivory worker of such a high caliber living in Jerusalem. The plaques were probably a gift from elsewhere. The slightness of the evidence should not be interpreted to mean that little was done. If architecture flourished, it is likely that the other arts flourished also, and gave the same reflection of life in our dream. The eclectic architecture of the 12th century is that of colonists that were ready to fit themselves into the land to which they had come, though they were continually reinforced from the west. But the disasters at the end of the century ended the old balance. In the 13th century few of the older great families of Outrema survived. Their place was taken by the military orders, who were mainly recruited in the west and had little feeling for local traditions. In the cities the native elements were now set apart. Take a look westward. Wealth was in the hands of the Italians and power usually in the hands of potentates from the west or their deputies. More and more of the nobility retired to Cyprus, where a new Gothic civilization was arising. A few echoes from Byzantium and the east were still heard, but they were growing faint. Byzantium was in eclipse. The older Arab culture was extinguished by the Mongols, and the newer culture of Mamluk Egypt was aggressively hostile. In Antioch the synthesis may have been continued, but pillage, earthquake and decay have destroyed all the evidence. Further south the attempt of Outrema to build its own characteristic style was ruined on the field of Hattin. The modest, sturdy work of 12th century Outrema was a prelude that led to nothing. 13th century Outrema was only a distant province of the Mediterranean Gothic world. Chapter of Fall of Acreon End. The end is come upon the four corners of the land. Ezekiel 7, 2 There was rejoicing in Outrema when news came of the death of Baibuz. His successor was his eldest son, Baraka, a weak youth whose time was employed in trying to control the Mameluk emirs. The task was too much for him. In August 1279, the Emir of the Syrian troops, Kaloan, revolted and marched on Cairo. Baraka abdicated in favor of his 17 year old brother, and Kaloan took over the government. Four months later, Kaloan displaced the child and proclaimed himself Sultan. The governor of Damascus, Sonkar al Ashkar, refused to accept his authority and proclaimed himself Sultan the next April but he was unable to maintain himself against the Egyptians. After a battle close to Damascus in June 1280, he retired to northern Syria and soon made his peace with Kaloan, who thus obtained the whole of Baibuz's heritage. The Franks made no use of the respite. In vain the Ilkhanabago and his vassal, Leo III of Armenia, 
urged an alliance and a crusade. Their only advocate was the order of the hospital. Charles of Anjou, with his hatred of Byzantium and its Genoese allies, ordered his bailiot taker, Roger of San Severino, to keep to an alliance with the Venetians, the Templars and the Mameluke court. The Pope, who had been promised by the Emperor Michael the submission of the Byzantine Church, encouraged Charles in his Syrian schemes in order to distract him from an attack on Constantinople. King Edward I showed his sympathy with the Mongols, but he was far away in England and had neither the time nor the money for a new crusade. In Outream a vehement seven might have been willing to cooperate with his Armenian uncle, but he was on bad terms with the Templars, and in 1277 he quarrelled with the most powerful of his vassals, Guy II Imbriaco of Jebel. Guy, who was his cousin and close friend, had been promised the hand of a local heiress of the Aleman family for his brother John. But Bishop Bartholomew of Tortosa desired the heritage for his own nephew and won Bohemond's consent. Thereupon Guy kidnapped the girl and married her to John. Then, fearing Bohemond's vengeance, he fled to the Templars. Bohemond responded by destroying the Templars' buildings at Tripoli and cutting down a forest that they owned nearby at Montrock. The master of the temple, William of Bugey, at once led the Knights of the Order against Tripoli, to make a demonstration outside the walls, and when he retired he burned the castle of Borderon, but his attempt to storm Niffen resulted in the capture of a dozen of his knights, whom Bohemond duly imprisoned at Tripoli. When the Templars had moved back to Acre, Bohemond set out to attack Jebel. Guy, with whom William of Bugey had left a contingent from the Order, went to meet him. A fierce battle took place a few miles north of Borderon. There were barely two hundred combatants on either side, but the carnage was tremendous. Bohemond was badly defeated. Amongst the knights that he lost was his cousin and Guy's brother-in-law, Balian of Sidon, the last of the great house of Garnia. 1282, civil war in Tripoli after his defeat Bohemond accepted a truce for a year. But in 1278 Guy and the Templars attacked him again. Once again Bohemond was defeated, but twelve Templar galleys which attempted to force the harbour of Tripoli were scattered by a storm. Fifteen galleys that Bohemond then sent against the Templar castle of Sidon succeeded in doing some damage there before the Grand Master of the Hospital, Nicholas Lorne, intervened. He hastened to Tripoli and arranged another truce but Guy of Jebel was still truculent. He determined to capture Tripoli itself. In January 1282, with his brothers and some friends, he smuggled himself into the Templar quarters at Tripoli. But there had been a misunderstanding and the Templar commander, Redco, was away. Guy suspected treachery and panic. As he tried to take refuge in the house of the hospitals, someone warned Bohemond. The conspirators fled to a tower in the hospital, where Bohemond's troops besieged them. After a few hours they agreed, at the request of their hospitals, to surrender on condition that their lives were spared. Bohemond broke his word. All Guy's companions were blinded, but Guy himself, with his brothers John and Baldwin and his cousin William, was taken to Niffin, and there they were all buried up to their necks in a ditch and left to starve to death. The rebels' ghastly fate horrified all Bohemond's vassals. Moreover, the Imbriaco family had always remembered its Genoese origin, and there had been many Genoese amongst the conspirators. As the Genoese were good friends of the Armenians and advocates of a Mongol alliance, Bohemond held aloof from their policy. Meanwhile John of Montfort, who was a devoted ally of the Genoese, planned to move up from Tyre to avenge his friends. But Bohemond reached Jebel before him. Only the Pistons, who hated the Genoese, found unalloyed pleasure in the whole episode. Politics were not much happier further south. Roger of San Severino's government at Acre was resented by the local nobility. In 1277 William of Bugey attempted to bring John of Montfort over to his side and succeeded in reconciling John with the Venetians, who were allowed to return to their former quarters in Tyre. But John kept aloof from the government at Acre. In 1279 King Hugh suddenly landed at Tyre, hoping to rally the nobility round him. 
John gave him support, but no one else rose in his favor. The four months period for which he was legally entitled to claim the presence of his Cypriot vassals overseas was passed in an action. When his knights returned to Cyprus the king had to follow. He blamed the Templars for his failure, with reason, for it was William of Bugia who had kept Taka loyal to Roger of San Severino. In revenge the Templars' property in Cyprus was confiscated, including their castle at Gastria. The order complained to the Pope, who wrote to Hugh to bid him restore the property, but he ignored the papal command. Though he seems to have approved of the Mongol alliance, chiefly because Roger of San Severino opposed it, he was in no position to take any action on the mainland. The Ilkhan was eager to strike against the Mamluks before Kalorun should be able to consolidate himself. Sonkar, ex Emir of Damascus, was still defying the Egyptians in northern Syria, when, at the end of September 1280, a Mongol army crossed the Euphrates and occupied Daintab, Bagras, and Darbsak. On 20 October, it entered Aleppo where it pillaged the markets and burned the mosques. The terrified Muslim inhabitants of the districts fled south towards Damascus. At the same time the hospitals of Markab made a highly profitable raid into the Bukhaya, penetrating almost to crack and, as they returned, defeating near miraculously the Muslim army sent to restrain them. But the Mongols were not in full enough strength to hold Aleppo. When Kalor unassembled his forces at Damascus, they retreated across the Euphrates. The Sultan contented himself with sending a force to punish the hospitals, who defeated it in front of Markab. 1281, Battle of Horns. About the same time, a Mongol ambassador appeared at Acre to tell the Franks that the Ilkhan proposed sending an army of a hundred thousand men to Syria next spring, and to beg them to supplement him with men and munitions. The hospitals sent the message on to King Edward but at Acre itself there was no response. The news of the coming Mongol invasion frightened Kalorun. He made peace with Sonkar in June 1281, enfiffing him with Antioch and Apamea, and he sent to Acre to suggest a ten years truce with the military orders. The truce made with the government at Acre in 1272 still had over a year to run. Some of the emirs in the Egyptian embassy told the Franks not to make terms with Kalorun as he would soon be overthrown. When Roger of San Severino heard this, he at once wrote to warn the Sultan, who was able to arrest the conspirators in time. Meanwhile the orders at Acre agreed to the treaty, which was signed on the 3rd of May. On the 16th of July Bohemond made a similar truce. It was a diplomatic triumph for Kalorun. A united Frankish effort on his flank, even without reinforcements from the west would have seriously complicated his campaign against the Mongols. In September 1281, two Mongol armies advanced into Syria. One, commanded by the Ilkhan in person, slowly reduced the Muslim fortresses along the Euphrates frontier, while the second, under his brother Mangutima, first made contact with Leo III of Armenia, then marched down through Aintab and Aleppo into the Unz Valley. Kalorun had already gone to Damascus where he assembled his forces, and hurried northward. The Franks held aloof, except for the hospitals of Markab, who refused to consider themselves bound by the truce made by the Order at Acre. A few of their knights rode out to join the king of Armenia. On 30 October the Mongol and Mamluk armies met just outside Homs. Mangutima commanded the Mongol center with other Mongol princes on his left, and on his right his Georgian auxiliaries, with King Leo and the Hospitas. The Muslim right was under Al-Mansur of Hama, Kalorun himself commanded the Egyptians in the center, with the army of Damascus, under the Emir Lajan, beside him, and on the left the former rebel Sonkar, with the northern Syrians and Turkomans. When the battle was joined the Christians on the Mongol right soon routed Sonkar, whom they pursued right into his camp at Horns, thus losing touch with their center. Meanwhile, though the Mongol left held firm, Mangutima himself was wounded in the course of a Mameluk attack on the center. His nerve left him, and he ordered a precipitate retreat. Leo of Armenia and his comrades found themselves isolated. They had to fight their way back northwards, suffering heavy losses. 
but Kalor Un had lost too many men to follow in pursuit. The Mongol army recrossed the Euphrates without further losses. The Great River remained the frontier between the two empires, and Kalor Un did not venture to punish the Armenians. The prior of the English hospitals, Joseph of Chauncey, who was visiting the east, was present at the battle and wrote afterwards to Edward Died to describe it. He said that King Hugh and Prince Bohemond had not been able to join the Mongols in time. He was probably trying to shield them both from the wrath of the English king, who was the only Western monarch still to take an interest in the Holy War, and who strongly favoured the Mongol alliance. But Edward's perspicacity was not copied in the East. King Hugh had done nothing, Bohemond had made a truce with the Muslims, while Roger of San Severino, King Charles's deputy, made a special journey to meet Kalor Un and congratulate him on his victory. 1282, Collapse of Charles of Anjou's power On the evening of 30 March 1282, the Sicilians, exasperated by the arrogance of Charles of Anjou and his soldiers, suddenly rose and massacred every Frenchman in the island. The Sicilian Vespers had far wider flung effects than ever the angry islanders can have suspected. Charles's great Mediterranean empire was shown to be without foundation. For the next decades, he and his successors vainly tried to recover Sicily from the Aragonese princes who were elected to its throne. The Angevin Kingdom of Naples was no longer a world power, and the papacy which had guaranteed to the Angevins their Sicilian kingdom was humiliated and ruined financially in its attempts to restore its clients. Angevin schemes in the Balkans and further to the east were abandoned. At Constantinople the emperor sighed with relief. He had no longer to infuriate his people by offering the submission of their church to Rome if Rome would curb Charles's ambitions. In Outrema Roger of San Severino suddenly found himself without any backing. He was summoned to return to Italy by his master and left Acre towards the end of the year, confiding his position as Bailey to his Seneschkel, Odo Poilchine. To the Mamluks of Egypt the collapse of Charles's power came as a shock but also as a relief. Both Bayibuz and Kalor Un had feared and respected him, and therefore had refrained from attacking his new province in Outrema. Now there was no one to restrain the Sultan, as long as the Franks could be kept from alliance with the Mongols. In June 1283, when the truce signed at Cesaro ended, Kalor Un offered Odo Poilchine to renew it for another ten years. Odo gladly accepted, but he was unsure of his authority. The treaty was therefore signed on the Frankish side in the name of the Commune of Acre and the Templars of Athlet and Sidon. It guaranteed the Franks in their possession of the territory from the Ladder of Tyre, north of Acre, to Mount Carmel and Athlet, and also of Sidon. But Tyre and Beirut were excluded. The right of free pilgrimage to Nazareth was maintained. Dodo was glad to preserve the peace, for King Hugh was once more about to try to recover his mainland kingdom. The Lady Isabella of Beirut had recently died, and her city had passed to her sister Ischiva, the wife of Humphrey of Montfort, who was the younger brother of the Lord of Tyre. Knowing that he could trust the Montforts, Hugh sailed from Cyprus at the end of July, with two of his sons, Henry and Bohemond. He had intended to land at Acar, but the wind blew him to Beirut, where he arrived on I August and was well received. He sailed on a few days later to Tyre, sending his troops by land down the coast. On the way they were badly mauled by Muslim raiders, incited, so Hugh believed, by the Templars of Sidon. When he landed at Tyre, the omens were unfavorable. His standard fell into the sea. When the clergy came in procession to meet him the great cross that they carried slipped and broke the skull of the Jewish court physician. He waited at Tyre, but no one at Acre made any move to welcome him there. The commune and the Templars preferred the unobtrusive government of Odo Poilchion. His Cypriot nobles would not stay with him for more than the lawful four months. On the 3rd of November, before the period was over, the most promising of his sons, Bohemond died. Even more serious to him was the death of his friend and brother-in-law, John of Montfort. John left no children, so the king allowed Tyre to pass to his brother and heir, Humphrey, Lord of Beirut, 
but he added a clause that should he wish he could buy the city back for the crown for 150 cents. But Humphrey himself died the following February. After a suitable interval his widow was married to Hugh's youngest son, Guy, to whom she brought Beirut. Tyre remained for the time under the rule of John's widow, Margaret. Even after his nobles left him Hugh remained on at Tyre. There he died himself, on the 4th of March 1284. He had done his best to restore authority in Outrema. His own qualities had handicapped him, for, with all his good looks and his charm, he was ill-tempered and tactless. But his failure was due far more to the hostility of the merchants of Acre and the military orders, who preferred an absentee, distant monarch, who would not interfere with them. 1285, loss of Mark Abhu was succeeded by his eldest son, John a handsome but delicate boy of about seventeen. He was crowned king of Cyprus at Nicosia on 2 May, and immediately afterwards crossed to Tyre where he was crowned king of Jerusalem. But outside of Tyre and Beirut his authority was unrecognized on the mainland. He reigned only one year, dying at Cyprus on 20 May 1285. His heir was his brother Henry, aged fourteen, who was crowned king of Cyprus on the 24th of June. He did not venture for the moment to cross into Syria. Their Kaloran was preparing to attack those of the Franks who were not protected by the truce of 1283. The widowed ladies who governed Beirut and Tyre, Eschiva and Margaret, hastened to ask him for a truce, which was granted to them. The Sultan's objective was the great castle of the hospital at Markab whose inmates had too often allied themselves with the Mongols. On the 17th of April 1285, the Sultan appeared with a great army at the foot of the mountain on which the castle stands, bringing a larger number of mangonels than had ever been seen together before. His men dragged them up the hillside and began to pound at the walls. But the castle was well equipped, and its own mangonels had the advantage of position. Many of the enemy's machines were destroyed, for a month the Muslims could make no progress. At last the Sultan's engineers succeeded in digging a mine under the Tower of Help which rose at the end of the northern salient, and filling it with inflammable wood. On the 23rd of May the mine was fired, and the tower came crashing down. Its fall interrupted the assault of the Muslims, and they were driven back. But the garrison had discovered that the mine penetrated far further under their defences. They knew that they were lost and capitulated. The twenty-five officers of the order who were in the castle were allowed to retire with all their portable possessions, on horseback and fully armed. The rest of the garrison could go free but could take nothing with them. They retired to Tortosa and then to Tripoli. Kalor unmade his formal entry into the castle on the 25th of May. The loss of Markab alarmed the citizens of Acre, and about the same time they learned that Charles of Anjou had died. His son, Charles II of Naples, was too deeply involved in the Sicilian war to trouble himself about Outrema, and the war was gradually embroiling the whole of Western Europe. The time had come for a ruler nearer at hand. On the advice of the hospital, Henry II sent an envoy from Cyprus, called Julian Lejourney, to Acre to negotiate for his recognition as king. The commune acquiesced. The hospital and the Teutonic order sympathized. The Templars, after some hesitation, agreed to give their support, but Odo Poilchian refused to resign his bailey ship. The French regiment, still provided by the King of France, supported Odo. On 4 June 1286, Henry landed at Acre. The commune received him with joy, though the Grand Masters of the three orders thought it more prudent to be absent from his reception, saying that their religious profession obliged them to be neutral. Henry was taken in state to the Church of the Holy Cross. There he announced that he would lodge in the castle, as previous kings had done. But Odo Poilchian refused to leave the castle, which he had garrisoned with the French. The Bishop of Fumagustu and the Abbot of the Templum Dominiataka went to plead with him and when he would not listen to them drew up a legal protest. The king, who was staying temporarily in the palace of the late Lord of Tyre, proclaimed three times that the Frenchmen could leave the castle in safety with all their belongings and no one must harm them. 
Meanwhile the citizens were growing exasperated with Odo and prepared to attack him. Thereupon the three Grand Masters, having seen which way the wind was blowing, persuaded Odo to hand the castle over to them, and they gave it to Henry. He made his solemn entry there on the 29th of June.1286. The last festivities of our dreamer six weeks later, on the 15th of August, Henry was crowned at Tyre by the Archbishop, Bonacuso of Gloria, acting as vicar of the Patriarch. After the ceremony the court returned to Acre, and there they held a fortnight of festivity. There were games and tournaments, and in the great hall of the hospital pageants were enacted. There were scenes from the story of the round table, with Lancelot and Tristram and Palumdes, and they played the tale of the Queen of Femini, from the romance of Troy. Not for a century had there been so gay and splendid a festival in our dreamer. The handsome boy king charmed everyone, for it was not yet known that he was epileptic. Behind him, to advise him in everything, were his uncles, Philip and Baldwin of Ibelin, who were deeply respected. On their advice, he did not remain long at Acre but returned in a few weeks' time to Cyprus, leaving Baldwin of Ibelin as Bailey. His uncles knew that a resident king would not be to the liking of the people. The Sultan at Cairo must have smiled to hear of the frivolous gaieties of the Franks, but to the Mongolkin at Tabriz it seemed that the time had come for more serious action. Abaga had died on our April 1282. His successor was his brother, Tekuda, who in his childhood had been baptized into the Nestorian faith under the name of Nicholas. But his tastes lay towards the Muslims. Hardly was he on the throne before he announced his conversion to Islam and took the name of Ahmed and title of Sultan. At the same time he sent to Cairo to conclude a treaty of friendship with Kaloran. His policy horrified the older Mongols of his court, who complained at once to the great Khan Kubilai. With Kubilai's approval, Abaga's son Arghan led a revolt in Khorasan, where he was governor. He was defeated at first. But Ahmed was soon deserted by his generals and was murdered in a palace conspiracy on 10 August 1284. Arghan at once mounted the throne. Like his father, Arghan was religiously eclectic. His own sympathies were for Buddhism, but his vizier, Sayyad ad was a Jew, and his best friend was the Nestorian Catholicus, Maya Balaha. This remarkable man was Turk in origin, an honored born in the Chinese province of Shanxi by the banks of the Hung Ho. He had come with his compatriot, Rabban Sorma, westward in the vain hope of making a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. While he was in Iraq in 1281, the Catholicate fell vacant, and he was elected to the office. He had a great influence over the new Ilkin, who longed to rescue the holy places of Christendom from the Muslims but who always said that he would not do so unless the Christian kings of the West gave their aid. 1287, Embassy of Rabban Sorma in 1285 Arghan wrote to Pope Honorius of to suggest common action, but he received no answer. Two years later he decided to send an embassy to the West, and he chose as his ambassador Maya Balaha's friend Rabban Sorma. The ambassador, who wrote a vivid account of his mission, set out early in 1287. Sailing from Trebizond, he reached Constantinople about Easter time. He was cordially received by the Emperor Andronicus and visited Saint Sophia and the other great shrines of the imperial city. Andronicus was already on excellent terms with the Mongols and was ready to help them as far as his dwindling resources allowed. From Constantinople Rabban Sorma went to Naples arriving there at the end of June. While he was there he saw a sea battle in the harbour between the Aragonese and the Neapolitan fleets. It was his first indication that Western Europe was preoccupied with its own squabbles. He rode on to Rome. There he found that Pope Honorius had just died, and the conclave to elect his successor had not yet assembled. The twelve cardinals who were resident in Rome received him, but he found them ignorant and unhelpful. They knew nothing of the spread of Christianity among the Mongols and were shocked that he should serve a heathen master. When he tried to discuss politics, they cross-questioned him about his faith and criticized its divergencies from their own. 
In the end he almost lost his temper. He had come, he said, to pay his respects to the Pope, and to make plans for the future, not to hold a debate on the creed. After he had worshipped in the chief churches of Rome, he went gladly to Genoa. The Genoese welcomed him with great ceremony. The Mongol alliance was important to them, and they gave due attention to the ambassador's proposals. At the end of August, Rabban saw him crossed into France, reaching Paris early in September. There, his reception was all that he could desire. An escort brought him into the capital, and when he was given an audience by the young king, Philip IV, he was paid sovereign honors. The king rose from his throne to greet him and listened with deep respect to his message. He left the audience with a promise that, if it pleased God, Philip would himself lead an army to the rescue of Jerusalem. The ambassador was delighted by Paris. The university, then at the height of its medieval glory, particularly impressed him. The king himself escorted him round the Saint Chapel to see the sacred relics that Saint Louis had bought from Constantinople. When he moved on from Paris the king nominated an ambassador, Gobert of Helville, who was to return with him to the Ilkens court and arrange further details of the alliance. Rabban Sormer's next host was Edward I of England, who was then at Bordeaux, the capital of his French possessions. With Edward, who had fought in the East and had long advocated a Mongol alliance, he found an intelligent and practical response to his proposals. The king struck him as the ablest statesman that he had met in the West, and he was particularly flattered when he was asked to celebrate mass before the English court. But when it came to making a timetable Edward prevaricated. Neither he nor Philip of France could say when exactly he would be ready to embark on the crusade. Rabban Sorma went back to Rome a little uneasy in his mind. Pausing at Genoa for Christmas he happened to meet the Cardinal Legate John of Tusculum and told him his fears. The Mamluks were preparing at that moment to extinguish the last Christian states in Syria, and no one in the West would take the threat seriously. In February 1288, Nicholas IV was elected Pope, and one of his first actions was to receive the Mongol ambassador. Their personal relations were excellent. Rabban Sormu addressed the Pope as first Bishop of Christendom, and Nicholas sent his blessing to the Nestorian Catholicus and acknowledged him as Patriarch of the East. In the course of Holy Week the ambassador celebrated Mass before all the cardinals, and he received communion from the hands of the Pope himself. He left Rome, together with Gobert of Helville, in the late spring of 1288 laden with gifts, many of them precious relics, for the Ilkin and the Catholicus, and with letters for them both and for two Christian princesses at the court and for the Jacobite Bishop of Tabriz, Denis. But the letters were a little vague. The Pope could not promise definite action on any definite date. 1289, the Ilkin urges a crusade indeed, as Rabban Sorma came to realize. The kings of the West had their own distractions. The sinister ghost of Charles of Angers combined with the old vindictiveness of the papacy to block any crusade. The Pope had given Sicily to the Angevins, and now that the Sicilians had turned against the Angevins, both the papacy and France were obliged by the claims of prestige to fight for the reconquest of the island, against the two great sea powers of the Mediterranean, Genoa and Aragon. Till the Sicilian question was settled neither Nicholas nor Philip was ready to think of a crusade. Edward of England saw the danger, and managed in 1286 to arrange a truce between France and Aragon, but it was a precarious truce so long as fighting continued in Italy and on the sea. Moreover, Edward had his own troubles. He might yearn to save the Holy Land but he found it of more urgent interest to conquer Wales and to attempt the conquest of Scotland. After the death of Alexander III of Scotland in 1286 his eyes were turned northward, as he planned to control the neighbour kingdom through the person of its child heiress, Margaret, the maid of Norway. The East must wait. Nor was there any force of public opinion to urge the monarchs on. As Pope Gregory X's researches had shown, the crusading spirit was moribund. Arghun would not believe that the Christians of the West, with all their pious protestations of devotion to the Holy Land, could show such indifference to its threatened fate. 
he welcomed Rabban Sorma home with the highest honors, and showed cordiality to Gobat of Helville. But he wished for greater precision than Gobat could give him. Just after Easter 1289, he sent a second envoy, a Genoese called Buskel of Gisolf, who had long been settled in his lands, with letters for the Pope and the kings of France and England. The letter to Philip still survives. It is written in the Mongol tongue, using Uir script. In the name of the great Khan Kubilai, Argon announces to the King of France that, with God's help, he proposes to set out into Syria on the last winter month of the year of the Panther, that is to say, in January 1291, and to reach Damascus about the middle of the first month of spring, February. If the king will send auxiliaries and the Mongols capture Jerusalem, it will be given to him. But if he fails to cooperate the campaign will be wasted. Added to the letter is a note by Boscale, written in French which pays tactful compliments to the French king and adds that Argon will bring with him the Christian kings of Georgia and twenty or even thirty thousand horsemen, and will guarantee that the westerners shall be amply victualled. A similar letter, now lost, must have been sent to King Edward, to whom the Pope added a note of recommendation and encouragement. Philip's reply has not come down to us, but Edward's can still be read. It congratulates the Ilkin on his Christian enterprise and pays him friendly compliments. But as to an actual date nothing is said and no promises are given. The Ilkin is merely referred to the Pope, who could do little without the cooperation of the kings. Meanwhile another Frank, whose name is unknown, published a treatise showing how easy it would be to land a force of Westerners by Aias in Armenia, whose king would be most helpful and from that to make a junction with the Mongols. His advice was unheeded. In spite of the unpromising answers with which Buskerl returned, Arghun sent him once again, with two Christian Mongols, Andrews again and Say, Hadin. They went first to Rome, where Pope Nicholas received them, and then set out to visit the King of England, armed with urgent letters from the Pope, who seems to have considered him a likelier crusader than King Philip. They reached him early in 1291. But the maid of Norway had died the previous year, and Edward was immersed in Scottish affairs. The envoys returned disconsolate to Rome, there they stayed throughout the summer. By then it was too late. The fate of Outrema had been decided, and the Ilkin Argon was dead. Had the Mongol alliance been achieved and honestly implemented by the West, the existence of Outrema would almost certainly have been prolonged. The Mamluks would have been crippled if not destroyed, and the Ilkhanate of Persia would have survived as a power friendly to the Christians and the West. As it was, the Mameluk Empire survived for nearly three centuries and within four years of Argun's death the Mongols of Persia passed into the Muslim camp. It was not only the Franks of Outrema whose cause was lost by the negligence of the West but also the miserable congregations of Eastern Christendom. And this negligence was due primarily to the Sicilian War, itself the outcome of papal bitterness and French imperialism. 1287, fall of Latakia. Meanwhile, Outrema gave an impression of still more feckless irresponsibility. King Henry had hardly returned to Cyprus from the festivities at Acre before open war started along the Syrian coast between the Pistons and the Genoese. In the spring of 1287 the Genoese sent a squadron under their admirals Thomas Spinola and Orlando Ascari to the Levant. While Spinola visited Alexandria to obtain the friendly neutrality of the Sultan, Ascari sailed up and down the Syrian coast, sinking or capturing any ships that he could find that belonged to Pistons or Franks of Pisan origin. Only the intervention of the Templars prevented the captured sailors from being sold into captivity. Ascari then retired to Tyre, to plan an attack on the harbour of Acre. The Venetians joined their local fleet to the Pisans to protect the harbour, but Ascari won a victory off the Mole on 31 May 1287, though he could not penetrate into the port. When Spinola sailed up from Alexandria, the Genoese were able to blockade the whole coast. 
the Grand Masters of the Temple and the Hospital together with representatives of the local nobility at last persuaded them to sail back to Tyre and allow a free passage to shipping. One seaport had been spared this conflict, having already met a worse fate. For some time past the merchants of Aleppo had been complaining to the Sultan that it was inconvenient to have to send their goods to the Christian port of Latakia, the last remnant of the Principality of Antioch. Kaloan's opportunity came that spring. An earthquake on the 22nd of March seriously damaged the walls of the town. Claiming that Latakia, as part of the old principality, was not covered by the truce with Tripoli, he sent his emir, Hazamad Din Tarantai, to take it over. The town fell easily into his hands, but the defenders retired to a fort at the mouth of the harbour, joined to the land by a causeway. Tarantai widened the causeway and soon induced the garrison to surrender on the 20th of April. There had been no attempt to come to its relief. Its former lord, Bohemond VII, did not long survive its loss. He died, childless, on the 19th of October 1287. His heir was his sister Lucia, who had married Charles of Anjou's former Grand Admiral, Najit of Tusi, and now lived in Apulia. The nobles and citizens of Tripoli had no particular desire to summon to the east an almost unknown princess who was associated with the discredited Angevines. Instead, they offered the county to the Dija princess, Sibylla of Armenia. As soon as she received the offer she wrote to her old friend, Bishop Bartholomew of Tortosa, to invite him to be her bailey. But her letter was intercepted and the nobles of the county came to her and told her that the bishop was unacceptable. She refused to give way. After an angry scene the nobles withdrew and took counsel with the leading merchants, and together they proclaimed the dethronement of the dynasty and the establishment of a commune, which would henceforth be the sovereign authority. Its mayor was Bartholomew Imbriaco, whose father Bertrand had been the bitter enemy of Bohem and Vi and whose brother William had been cruelly done to death along with his cousin, the Lord of Jebel, by Bohemond VII the Dija retired to her brother in Armenia. But early in 1288, Lucia arrived with her husband at Acre, in order to go to Tripoli to take up her inheritance. She was well received by the hospitas, old allies of the dynasty, who escorted her as far as Nifin, the frontier town of the county. The she issued a proclamation, declaring her rights. The commune responded by reciting a long list of grievances and complaints against the cruel and high-handed actions of her brother, her father and her grandfather. They would have no more of the dynasty. Instead, they put themselves under the protection of the Republic of Genoa. A messenger went to Genoa to inform the Genoese doge, who at once dispatched the Admiral Benito Zaccaria, with five galleys, to make terms with the commune. Meanwhile the Grand Masters of the Three Orders, together with the Bailey of the Venetians at Acre, had gone to Tripoli to plead the cause of the heiress, the hospitaler for the old friendship of his order for her family, the Templar and the Teuton because they backed Venice against Genoa. But they were told that Lucia must recognize the commune as the government of the county. 1288, Lucia. Countess of Tripoli when Zaccaria arrived he insisted on a treaty giving the Genoese many more streets in Tripoli and the right to have a boadster to govern their colony, while he guaranteed the liberties and the privileges of the commune. But the citizens of Tripoli began to wonder whether Genoa would be a disinterested friend. Bartholomew Imbriaco, who had secured control of Jebel by marrying his daughter Agnes to his young cousin, Peter, son of Guy II coveted the county for himself. He sent a message to Cairo to find out whether Kaloan would support him if he proclaimed himself count. His ambition was suspected, and opinion in Tripoli veered round to Lucia's cause. Without informing the Genoese, the commune wrote to her a taker offering to accept her if she would confirm its position. Lucia shrewdly informed Zakaria, who was at Aias making a commercial treaty with the king of Armenia. He hurried to Acre to interview her. She agreed to confirm the privileges both of the commune and of Genoa, and on those terms she was recognized as Countess of Tripoli. The arrangement pleased neither the Venetians nor Bartholomew Imbriaco. He was already in touch with Kaloan, 
but whether it was he or the Venetians of Acre who now sent two francs to Cairo to ask the Sultan to intervene cannot now be known. The secretary of the Grand Master of the Temple knew the names of the envoys but preferred not to reveal them. They warned the Sultan that if Genoa controlled Tripoli she would dominate the whole Levant, and the trade of Alexandria would be at her mercy. The Sultan was delighted to have an invitation to intervene. It justified him in breaking his truce with Tripoli. In February 1289, he moved the whole Egyptian army into Syria, without revealing his objective. But one of his emirs, Badrad Din Bekdash al Fakhri, was in the pay of the Templars and sent word to the Grand Master, William of Buge, that Kaloran's destination was Tripoli. William hastened to warn the city and bid it unite and see to its defences. No one there would believe him. William was notoriously fond of political intrigue, and it was suspected that he had invented the story for his own profit, in the hope of being invited to mediate. Nothing was done, and the factions continued their quarrels till, towards the end of March, the Sultan's huge army marched down through the Bukhaya and assembled before the city walls. Now, at last, the threat was taken seriously. Inside the city the Countess Lucia was given the supreme authority by the commune and the nobles alike. The Templars sent up a force under their marshal, Geoffrey of Vendac, and the Hospiters under their marshal, Matthew of Clermont. The French regiment marched up from Acre, under John of Grailly. There were four Genoese and two Venetian galleys in the port, as well as smaller boats, some of them Pisson. From Cyprus King Henry sent his young brother Amalric, whom he had just appointed constable of Jerusalem, with a company of knights and four galleys. Meanwhile many non-combatant citizens fled across the sea to Cyprus. 1289, the fall of Tripoli Medieval Tripoli lay on the sea, on the Blunt Peninsula where the modern suburb of Almina stands. It was detached from the castle of Mount Pilgrim, which, it seems, no attempt was made to defend. The city itself was gallantly defended. But, even though the Christians had command of the sea, the vast numerical superiority of the Muslims and their great siege engines proved irresistible. When the Tower of the Bishop, at the southeast corner of the land walls, and the Tower of the Hospital, between it and the sea, crumbled before the bombardment, the Venetians decided that further defense was impossible. They hastily loaded their ships with all their possessions and sailed out of the harbor. Their defection alarmed the Genoese, whose admiral, Zakaria, suspected them of trying to steal some of his boats. He too called off his men, and they left the city with everything that they could salvage. Their going threw the Christians into disorder, and that morning, the 26th of April 1289, the Sultan ordered a general assault. Hordes of Mamluks swarmed over the crumbling southeastern wall into the city. Though the citizens struggled panic stricken to reach the boats in the harbor. The Countess Lucia, with Amalric of Cyprus and the two marshals of the orders, sailed safely away to Cyprus. But the commander of the temple, Peter of Munkada, was slain, together with Bartholomew Imbriaco. Every man found by the Muslims was at once put to death and the women and children taken as slaves. A number of refugees managed to cross in rowing boats to the little island of St. Thomas, just off the point. Dot, but the Mamluk cavalry rode into the shallow water and swam across to it. Dot, the followed similar scenes of massacre, and when the historian Abulfader of Harma tried to visit the island a few days later he was driven off by the stench of decaying corpses. Dot, when the massacre and pillage were ended, Kaloran had the city razed to the ground, lest the Franks, with their command of the sea, might try to recapture it. A new city was founded by his orders at the foot of Mount Pilgrim, a few miles inland. Mamluk troops went on to occupy Bortrun and Niffin. There was no attempt to defend them. Peter Imbriaco, Lord of Jebel, offered his submission to the Sultan, and was allowed to keep his city, under strict surveillance for about another decade. The fall of Tripoli came as a bitter shock to the people of Acre. They had persuaded themselves for the last few years that, so long as they were not aggressive, the Sultan really had no objection to the continued existence of the Christian cities along the coast. He might attack their castles, 
which were a potential danger to him. He might resent the military orders whose business it was to fight for their faith, even though Muslims as well as Christians employed the Templars as bankers. But the merchants and shopkeepers of the seaports only wanted peace, and the luxury loving barons of Outremu had clearly no desire for the embarrassment of a crusade. Acre and her sister ports were a commercial convenience for the Muslims as well as for the Christians, and their citizens had shown their goodwill in refusing the Mongol alliance. The unprovoked attack on Tripoli showed them how false were their calculations. They were forced to realize that a like fate awaited Acre. Three days after the fall of Tripoli, King Henry arrived at Acre. He found there an envoy from Cologne bearing a complaint from his master that Henry and the military orders had broken their truce with him by going to the aid of Tripoli. Henry replied that the truce only applied to the kingdom of Jerusalem. If Tripoli were covered by it, the sultan should not have committed aggression there. The excuse was accepted by the Muslims, and the truce was renewed, to cover the kingdoms of Jerusalem and Cyprus for another ten years, ten months and ten days. The king of Armenia and the lady of Tyre hastened to follow this example. But Henry had little faith now in the Sultan's word. He could not venture to appeal to the Mongols, for the Sultan would certainly have considered that a breach of the truce. But, before he returned to Cyprus in September, leaving his brother Isbali at Acre, he sent John of Grailly to Europe, to impress upon the western potentates how desperate was the situation. 1290, Crusaders from northern Italy the western potentates too had been shocked by the fate of Tripoli. But the Sicilian question still filled the minds of all except Edward of England, and his Scottish problem was reaching a crisis. Pope Nicholas IV received John of Grailly with sincere sympathy, and wrote in earnest sorrow to the kings of the West to beg them to send help. But he himself was entangled in the Sicilian affair. He could do nothing more than write letters and urge his clergy to preach the crusade. The princes and lords to whom he applied preferred to wait until King Edward made some move. He after all had taken the cross and had some experience of the East. But Edward made no move. The Genoese Republic, which had lost heavily by the loss of Tripoli, had taken reprisals by capturing a large Egyptian merchant ship in the waters off southern Anatolia and by raiding the undefended port of Tyne, in the Delta. But when Cologne closed Alexandria to them, they hastened to make their peace. When the envoys came to Cairo, they found embassies from both the Greek and the German emperors waiting upon the Sultan. It was only in northern Italy that the Pope's appeal met with any response and there it was answered not by any baron but by a rabble of peasants and unemployed petty townsfolk from Lombardy and Tuscany, eager for an adventure that would bring them merit and salvation and probably some loot. The Pope was not quite happy about them, but he accepted their help and put them under the command of the Bishop of Tripoli, who had come as a refugee to Rome. He hoped that under the restraining hand of a prelate that knew the East they would do nothing foolish. The Venetians, who had not wept to see Genoa lose its base at Tripoli but felt differently about Acre where they held the commercial hegemony, provided twenty galleys under the command of the doge's son, Nicholas Tiepolo, assisted, at the Pope's request, by John of Grailly and Drew of Sully. Each of the three was entrusted with a thousand pieces of gold from the papal treasury. But there was a lack of munitions. As the fleet sailed eastward it was joined by five galleys sent by King James of Aragon, who, though he was at war with the papacy and Venice, was anxious to help. The truce between King Henry and the Sultan had restored some confidence at Acre. Trade recommenced. In the summer of 1290 the merchants of Damascus began to send their caravans again to the coast. There was a good harvest that year in Galilee and the Muslim peasants crowded with their produce to the markets of Acre. Never had the town been so lively and active. In August, in the midst of this prosperity, the Italian crusaders arrived. From the moment of their landing they proved an embarrassment to the authorities. They were disorderly, drunken and debauched. Their commanders, who were unable to give them their regular pay, had no control over them. They had come, they thought, to fight the infidel, so they began to attack the peaceful Muslim merchants and peasants. One day, 
towards the end of August, a riot flared up. Some said it began at a drinking bout where Christians and Muslims both were present, others, that a Muslim merchant had seduced a Christian lady, and her husband appealed to his neighbors for vengeance. Suddenly the crusader rabble rushed through the streets and out into the suburbs, slaying every Muslim that they met, and as they decided that every man wearing a beard was a Muslim, many local Christians also perished. The barons of the city and the knights of the orders were horrified, but all that they could do was to rescue a few of the Muslims and take them to the safety of the castle, and to arrest a few of the obvious ringleaders. 1290, Death of Kalor and it was not long before the news of the massacre reached the Sultan. His fury was well justified, and he decided that the time had come to eradicate the Franks from Syrian soil. The government of Acre hastened to send him apologies and excuses, but his envoys came to Acre and insisted that the men guilty of the outrage should be handed over to him for punishment. A council was called by the constable Amalric. At it the Grand Master of the Temple arose and advised that all the Christian criminals that were then in the jails of Acre should be delivered to the Sultan's representatives as the perpetrators of the crime. But public opinion would not allow the dispatch of Christians to certain death at the hands of the infidel. The Sultan's ambassadors received no satisfaction. Instead, there was a half hearted attempt to prove that some of the Muslim merchants were guilty of starting the riot and to fix the blame on them. Kalor Un's answer was to resort to arms. A debate between his lawyers satisfied him that he was legally justified in breaking the truce. He kept his plans secret. While he mobilized the Egyptian army, the Syrian army, under Aknad Din Toksu, governor of Damascus, was ordered to move to the coast of Palestine, near Caesarea, and to prepare siege engines. It was given out that the destination of the expedition was in Africa. But once again the Emir al Fakri warned William of Buja and the Templars of the Sultan's real intentions. William passed on the warning, but, as at Tripoli, no one was willing to believe him. He sent an envoy to Cairo on his own initiative. Kalor Un offered to spare the city in return for as many Venetian sequins as there were inhabitants. But when William put this offer before the High Court, it was scornfully rejected. William was accused of being a traitor and was insulted by the crowd as he left the hall. The complacency of the people of Acre rose higher at the end of the year. When news came from Cairo that Kalor Un was dead. He had given up any attempt to hide his intention of marching on Acre. In a letter to the King of Armenia, he told of his vow not to leave a single Christian alive in the city. On the 4th of November 1290, he set out from Cairo at the head of his army. But no sooner had he started than he fell sick. Six days later, he died at Marjitat Tin, only five miles from his capital. On his deathbed he made his son, Al Ashraf Khalil, promise to continue the campaign. He had been a great sultan, as relentless and merciless as Bayibuz, but with a finer sense of loyalty and honor. Unlike Bayibuz, he left a worthy son to succeed him. His death was followed by the usual palace plot. But Al Ashraf was not taken unawares. He was able to arrest the ringleader, the Emir Turantai and to establish himself firmly on the throne. It was now too late in the year to march against Acre. The campaign was postponed to the spring. The government at Acre took advantage of the respite to send one more embassy to Cairo. It was led by a notable of Acre, Philip Main Boyouf, who was an accomplished Arabic scholar. With him was a Templar knight, Bartholomew Pizan, a hospitaller and a secretary called George. The new sultan refused to see them. They were thrown into prison, where they did not long survive. The Muslim army began to move in March, 1291. Al Ashraf's preparations were careful and complete. Siege engines were collected from all over his dominions. So heavily laden was the army from Harma that it took a month, in the wet, muddy weather, to travel from Crack, where it paused to collect a huge catapult, called the Victorious, down to Acre. Nearly a hundred other machines had been constructed at Damascus and in Egypt. There was a second great catapult, called the Furious, and lighter mangonels of a particularly efficient type, known as the Black Oxen. 
On 6 March Al-Ashraf left Cairo for Damascus, where he deposited his harem. On April 5 he arrived before Acre with all his vast forces. Men spoke of 60,000 horsemen and 160,000 infantrymen. However exaggerated those numbers may be, his army far exceeded the forces that the Christians could muster. 1291 The defenders of Acre The news of the Sultan's preparations had at last brought the people of Acre to realize their plight. Earnest appeals had been sent to Europe during the course of the winter, but with very little result. A few isolated knights had arrived during the previous autumn. Amongst them was the Swiss Otto of Grandison, with some Englishmen sent by Edward I. The temple and the hospital gathered all their available men. The Grand Master of the Teutonic Order, Burchard of Schwanden, made a bad impression by choosing to resign his office at this very moment, but his successor, Conrad of Fuchtwangen, summoned numbers of his fellow knights from Europe. Henry of Cyprus sent over Cypriot troops and his brother, Amalric, to command the defence, and promised to follow himself with reinforcements. Every able-bodied citizen of Acre was enlisted to play his part. But even so, the numbers were small. The whole civilian population of Acre comprised thirty to forty thousand souls. In addition there were less than a thousand knights or mounted sergeants and about fourteen thousand foot soldiers, including the Italian pilgrims. The fortifications of the city were good, and they had recently been strengthened by King Henry's orders. There was now a double line of walls to protect the peninsula on which the city and its northern suburb, Montmuzat, were placed, and a single wall separated Acre from Montmuzat. The castle lay on this latter wall, close to its junction with the double walls. There were twelve towers, set at irregular intervals, along both the outer and the inner walls. Many of them had been erected at the expense of some distinguished pilgrim, such as the English tower built by Edward I and the tower of the Countess of Blois next to it. At the angle where the walls turned from running northward from the Bay of Acre to go westward towards the sea, there stood, on the outer wall, a great tower recently rebuilt by King Henry II, opposite to the accursed tower on the inner wall. In front of King Henry's tower was a barbican built by King Hugh. The whole of this angle was considered the most vulnerable part of the defence. It was therefore entrusted to the king's own troops, under his brother, Amalric. On his right were the French and English knights, under John of Grailly and Otto of Grandison, then the troops of the Venetians and the Pistons and those of the Commune of Acre. On his left, covering the walls of Montmuzat, were first the Hospiters, then the Templars, each commanded by their Grand Master. The Teutonic Knights supplemented the royal regiments by the accursed tower. On the Muslim side, the army of armor, with which the historian Abulfado was present in person, was stationed by the sea, opposite to the Templars, the army of Damascus was opposite to the Hospiters, and the Egyptian army stretched from the end of the wall of Montmuzat round to the Bay of Acre. The Sultan's tent was pitched not far from the shore, opposite to the Tower of the Legate. 1291 Accusations of cowardice later, when all was over and lost, anger and grief gave rise to recriminations. The Christian chroniclers freely hurled accusations of cowardice at the garrison. But in fact, at this supreme moment of their fate, the defenders of Altrima showed a courage and a loyalty that had been sadly absent in recent years. It may be that when shiploads of women, old men and children were dispatched to Cyprus at the beginning of the siege, some men of fighting age fled with them. It may be that some of the Italian merchants showed a selfish anxiety about their own property. Genoa, indeed, took no part in the struggle. She had been virtually excluded from Acre by the Venetians and had made her own treaty with the Sultan. But the Venetians and Pistons fought valiantly. The latter were responsible for the construction of a great catapult that was the most effective of all the machines of the Christians. Map 4. Acre in 1291. The siege began on the 6th of April. Day after day the Sultan's mangonels and catapults flung their stone or pottery containers filled with an explosive mixture at the walls of the city or over them into the town, 
and his archers poured their arrows and clouds against the defenders on the galleries and tower platforms, while his engineers prepared to move up to mine the crucial defenses. He was said to have a thousand engineers to use against each tower. The Christians still had command of the sea, and provisions of food were brought in regularly from Cyprus, but they were short of armaments, and they began to realize that there were not enough soldiers to man the walls adequately against the overwhelming numbers of the enemy. But there was no talk of surrender. One of their ships was fitted with a catapult which did enormous damage in the Sultan's camp. On the night of the 15th of April, when the moon was bright in the sky, the Templars, aided by Otto of Grandison, made a sortie right into the camp of the men of Harma. The Muslims were taken by surprise. But many of the Templars tripped over the tent cords in the half-light and fell and were captured, and the others were driven back with heavy losses into the town. Another sortie made by the Hospiters a few nights later in total darkness failed completely, as at once the Muslims lit their torches and fires. After this second check it was decided that sorties were too expensive in manpower. But the abandonment of aggressive enterprise did harm to the Christian morale. The feeling of hopelessness grew amongst them. Time was on the Muslims' side. On the 4th of May, nearly a month after the siege began, King Henry arrived from Cyprus with the troops that he could muster, a hundred horsemen and two thousand foot soldiers, in forty ships. With him was the Archbishop of Nicosia, John Turco of Ancona. It was probably because of illness that he had not come sooner. He was received with joy. As soon as he landed he took command and put new vigor into the defense. But it was soon clear that these reinforcements were too few to make any difference to the outcome. 1291, last attempt at negotiations. In a last attempt to restore peace, the king sent two knights, the Templar William of Catherine and William of Villiers, to the Sultan to ask why he had broken the truce and to promise to redress any grievances. Al Ashraf received them outside his tent but before they could deliver their message he asked them curtly if they had brought him the keys of the city. On their denial he said that it was the place that he wanted, he was not interested in the fate of its inhabitants, and, as a tribute to the king's courage in coming to fight when he was so young and ill, he would spare their lives if they surrendered to him. The envoys had hardly replied that they would be held as traitors if they promised capitulation when a catapult from the walls hurled a stone into the fringe of the group. Al Ashraf was furious and drew his sword to slay the ambassadors, but the Emir Shuji restrained him, bidding him not to stain it with the blood of pigs. The knights were allowed to return to their king. The Sultan's engineers were already beginning to mine the towers. On the 8th of May the king's men decided that the Barbican of King Hugh was no longer tenable. They set fire to it and left it to collapse. In the course of the following week the towers of the English and of the Countess of Blois were undermined, and the walls by St. Anthony's Gate and by the Tower of St. Nicholas began to crumble. The new Tower of Henry II held out till the 15th of May, when part of its outer wall came down. Next morning the Mamelukes forced their way into the ruin and the defense was forced back into the inner line of walls. That same day there was a concentrated attack on St. Anthony's Gate, and only the gallantry of the Templars and the Hospitals kept the enemy from passing into the city. The Marshal of the Hospital, Matthew of Clermont, distinguished himself by his bravery. During the next day the Muslims strengthened their hold on the outer and Sinti and the Sultan ordered the general assault for the morning of Friday, the 18th of May. The attack was launched on the whole length of the walls from St. Anthony's Gate to the Patriarch's Tower by the bay, but the main effort of the Muslims was against the accursed tower at the angle of the salient. The Sultan threw all his resources into the battle. His mangonels kept up an unceasing bombardment. The arrows of his archers fell almost in a solid mass into the city and regiment after regiment rushed at the defences, led by white turbaned emirs. The noise was appalling. The assailants shouted their battle cries, and trumpets and cymbals and the drums of three hundred drummers on camelback urged them on. It was not long before the Mamelukes forced their way into the accursed tower. 
the Syrian and Cypriot knights that were its garrison were pushed back westwards towards St. Anthony's Gate. There the Templars and Hospiters came to their assistance, fighting together as if there had never been two centuries of rivalry between them. Matthew of Clermont desperately tried to lead a counter-attack to recover the tower, but though the two Grand Masters both followed him, they could make no impression. Along the eastern wall of the city John of Grailly and Otto of Grandson held their own for some hours, but after the fall of the accursed tower the enemy was able to pass along the crumbling walls and take possession of the gate of St. Nicholas. The whole salient was lost, and the Muslims were well established inside the city. 1291, the flight from Acre there was fierce fighting in the streets, but nothing now could be done to save Acre. William of Bugey, Grand Master of the Temple, was mortally wounded in the fruitless counter-attack against the accursed tower. His followers carried him to the temple building where he died. Matthew of Clermont was with him, but returned to the battle and to his death. The Grand Master of the Hospital, John of Villiers, was wounded, but his men brought him down to the harbour and put him protesting on board a ship. The young king and his brother Amalric had already embarked. King Henry was later accused of cowardice in deserting the city, but there was nothing that he could have done, and it was his duty to his kingdom to avoid capture. On the eastern sector John of Grailly was wounded, but Otto of Grandson took control. He commandeered as many Venetian ships as he could find and placed John of Grailly and all soldiers that he could rescue on board, and himself was the last to join them. There was ghastly confusion on the quays. Soldiers and civilians, women and children amongst them, crowded into rowing boats, seeking to reach the galleys that lay off the shore. The aged patriarch, Nicholas of Hanape, who had been slightly wounded, was placed by his faithful servants in a small skiff, but out of charity he allowed so many refugees to climb in with him that the boat sank with their weight and they were all drowned. There were some men who had the presence of mind to snatch hold of a boat and charge exorbitant fees from the desperate merchants and ladies on the quay. The Catalan adventurer, Roger Flor, who had fought bravely as a Templar during the siege, took command of a Templar galley and founded his great fortune on the blackmail that he extorted from the noble woman of Acre. The ships were far too few to rescue the fugitives. Soon the Muslim soldiers penetrated right through the city slaying everyone, old men, women and children alike. A few lucky citizens who stayed in their houses were taken alive and sold as slaves, but not many were spared. No one could tell the number of those that perished. The orders and the great merchant houses later tried to draw up lists of the survivors, but the fate of most of their members was unknown. Subsequent travelers to the east spoke of seeing renegade Templars living squalidly in Cairo and of other Templars working as woodcutters by the Dead Sea. Some prisoners were freed and returned to Europe after nine or ten years of captivity. The slaves who had been knights and their descendants were said to have been treated with some respect by their masters. Many women and children disappeared forever into the harems of Mamluk Emirs. Owing to the plentiful supply the price of a girl dropped to a drachma a piece in the slave market at Damascus. But the number of Christians that were slain was greater still. By the night of the 8th of May all Acre was in the Sultan's hands, except for the great building of the Templars jutting out into the sea at the southwest point of the city. The surviving Templars had taken refuge there, together with a number of citizens of both sexes. For several days its huge walls defied the enemy, and ships that had landed refugees in Cyprus came back to its aid. After nearly a week Al Ashraf offered the Marshal of the Order, Peter of Severae, to allow him to embark to Cyprus with all the people inside the fortress and with their possessions, if it were given up to him. Peter accepted the terms, and an emir and a hundred Mamluks were admitted into the fortress to supervise the arrangements while the sultan's flag was hoisted over the tower. But the Mamluks were out of hand and began to molest and seize hold of the Christian women and boys. Furious at this, the knights fell on the Muslims and slaughtered them, and pulled down the enemy flag, ready to resist to the death. When night fell, Peter of Severae sent the treasury of the order with its commander, Tybal Gordon, and a few non-combatants, 
by boat to the castle at Sidon. Next day Al-Ashraf, seeing the strength of the castle and the desperate courage of its garrison, offered the same honorable terms as before. Peter and a few companions went out under a safe conduct to discuss the surrender. But as soon as they reached the Sultan's tent they were seized and bound and promptly beheaded. When the defenders on the wall saw what had happened, they closed the gate again and fought on. But they could not prevent the Muslim engineers from creeping up to the walls and digging a great mine beneath them. On the 18th of May the whole landward side of the building began to crumble. Impatiently Al-Ashraf threw two thousand Mamluks into the widening breach. Their weight was too much for the sagging foundations. As they fought their way in, the whole edifice came crashing down, killing defenders and assailants alike in its vast ruin. 1291, the destruction of Acre As soon as Acre was in his power, the Sultan set about its systematic destruction. He was determined that it should never again be a spearhead for Christian aggression in Syria. The houses and bazaars were pillaged, then burned, the buildings of the orders and the fortified towers and castles were dismantled, the city walls were left to disintegrate. When the German pilgrim, Ludolf of Suckham, passed by some forty years later, only a few wretched peasants lived amongst the ruins of the once splendid capital of our dreamer. One or two churches still stood, not wholly destroyed. But the fine doorway of the Church of St. Andrew had been taken to ornament the mosque built in Cairo to honor the victorious Sultan, and amidst the crumbling walls of the Church of St. Dominic the tomb of the Dominican Jordan of Saxony was untouched, as the Muslims had peered in and found his body uncorrupted. The remaining Frankish cities soon shared the fate of Acre. On the 19th of May, when most of Acre was in his hands, Al-Ashraf sent a large contingent of troops to Tyre. It was the strongest city of the coast, impregnable against an enemy that lacked command of the sea. In the past its walls had twice thwarted Saladin himself. A few months earlier the Princess Margaret, to whom it belonged, had handed it over to her nephew, the king's brother Amalric. But its garrison was small, and, as soon as the enemy approached Amalric's bailey, Adam of Kaftan, lost his nerve and sailed away to Cyprus, abandoning the city without a struggle. At Sidon the Templars determined to make a stand. Tybal Gordon was there, with the treasure of the order, and the surviving knights had elected him Grand Master, to succeed William of Buge. They were left in quiet for a month. Then a huge Mameluke army came up under the Amir Shujai. The knights were too few to hold the town, so they retired, with many of the leading citizens, to the castle of the sea, built on an island rock a hundred yards from the shore, and recently refortified. Tybald at once set sail for Cyprus, to raise troops for the castle's assistance. But once that he was there he did nothing, either from cowardice or despair. The Templars in the castle fought bravely. But when the Mameluke engineers began to build a causeway across the sea, they gave up help and sailed away up the coast to Tortosa. On the 14th of July Shujai entered the castle and ordered its destruction. A week later Shujai appeared before Beirut. Its citizens had hoped that the treaty made between the Lady Chiva and the Sultan would preserve them from attack. When the Emir bade the leaders of the garrison to come and pay their respects to him, they therefore anxiously complied, only to find themselves made prisoner. Without its leaders the garrison could not contemplate defense. Its members took to their ships and fled, carrying with them the relics from the cathedral. The Mamluks entered the city on the 31st of July. Its walls and the castle of the Iblones were pulled down and the cathedral turned into a mosque. 1291, the death of Outrema soon afterwards the Sultan occupied Haifa without opposition on the 30th of July, and his men burned the monasteries on Mount Carmel and slew their monks. There still remained the two Templar castles at Tortosa and Ethlet, but in neither was the garrison strong enough to face a siege. Tortosa was evacuated on the 3rd of August and Ethlet on the 14th. All that now was left to the Templars was the island fortress of Ruad, some two miles off the coast opposite Tortosa. There they maintained their hold for twelve more years, 
only quitting the island in 1303, when the whole future of the order began to be in doubt. For some months, the Sultan's troops marched up and down the coastlands, carefully destroying anything that might be of value to the Franks should they ever attempt another landing. Orchards were cut down, irrigation systems put out of order. The only castles that were left standing were those that were back from the coast, like Mount Pilgrim at Tripoli, and Markab on its high mountain. Along the sea there was desolation. The peasants of those once rich farms saw their steads destroyed and sought refuge in the mountains. Those of Frankish origin hastened to merge themselves with the natives, and the native Christians were treated little better than slaves. The old easy tolerance of Islam was gone. Embittered by the long religious wars, the victors had no mercy for the infidel. The lot of the Christians that escaped to Cyprus was not much better. For a generation they lived the miserable lives of unwanted refugees, for whom as the years passed sympathy wore thin. They only served to remind the Cypriots of the terrible disaster. And the Cypriots needed no reminder. For a century to come, the great ladies of the island, when they went out of doors, wore cloaks of black that stretched from their heads to their feet. It was a token of mourning for the death of Outrema. Book of Epilogue Chapter If the last crusades and they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword, and by flame, by captivity, and by spoil. Daniel 11, 33 With the fall of Acre and the expulsion of the Franks from Syria the crusading movement began to slip out of the sphere of practical politics. After Saladin's reconquests, a century before, the Christians still retained great fortresses on the mainland, Tyre, Tripoli and Antioch. An army of rescue had bases from which it could operate. Now the bases were gone. The little waterless island of Ruad was useless. Expeditions must be organized and provisioned from across the sea, from Cyprus. The only Christian dominion that remained was the Kingdom of Armenia, in Cilicia. But the journey from Cilicia into Syria was difficult, and the Armenians could not all be trusted. Again, the loss of Jerusalem in 1187 had come as a terrible shock to Christendom, so sudden was the collapse of the kingdom. But everyone knew in 1291 that Outrema was crumbling. Its disappearance caused grief and indignation, but no surprise. Western Europe now had overriding problems and quarrels at home. There would be no glow of fervor that would drive its potentates eastward, as in the days of the Third Crusade. Still less could a great popular expedition like the First Crusade be launched. The peoples of the West were enjoying new comforts and prosperity. They would never respond now to the apocalyptic preaching of a Peter the Hermit with the simple, ignorant piety of their ancestors two centuries before. They were unconvinced by the promise of indulgences and shocked by the use of the holy war for political aims. Nor was a great military expedition possible, with the great empire of Byzantium reduced to a shadow. The end of Outrema was grievous news but it provoked no violent reaction. Lack of allies only the Pope, Nicholas IV, sought to implement his sorrow by deeds, but there was no one to whom he could turn. The prestige of the papacy had been crippled by the ill success of the Sicilian War. Kings no longer troubled to carry out the papal bidding. The Western Emperor, whose ecumenical power the popes had broken, was fully occupied in Germany. If he emerged, it was only to take a wistful expedition into Italy. King Philip IV of France was able and active, but, having extricated his kingdom from the Sicilian War, he spent his energy in building up the royal authority. Edward of England had his hands full in Scotland. Moreover, England and France were moving into the state of intense rivalry that was soon to produce the Hundred Years' War. The monarch with the strongest sea power in the Mediterranean, James II of Aragon, along with his brother Frederick, claimant of Sicily, was at war with the Pope's client, Charles II of Naples, who was willing enough in theory to help in a crusade, but had first to eject the Aragonese from Sicily. Further east the Byzantine Emperor was busy enough warding off the Turks on the one hand and the new Balkan monarchies of Bulgaria and Serbia on the other. Besides, 
the Angevins of Naples were now taking over the claims of the dispossessed Latin emperors. Their patron, the Pope, could not therefore help for much sympathy from the Greeks. The merchant cities of Italy were too busy adjusting their policy to the changed circumstances to make any promises that might embarrass them. The kings of Cyprus and Armenia were most intimately concerned with the problem, for their kingdoms were in the front line now, and one or other must serve as the base for any new crusade. But they were desperately anxious not to provoke the Sultan. The king of Armenia had to contend with the Turks as well as with the Egyptians, and the king of Cyprus had to solve the problem of the refugees. Moreover, both royal houses, which were now closely interconnected by marriage, were soon troubled by family quarrels and civil war. The Ilkhan of Persia remained a potential ally, but the Ilkhan Arghun had been cruelly disappointed by his failure to rouse the West to action before the fall of Acre. He would do no more. In 1295, soon after Arghun's death, the Ilkhan Gatson adopted Islam as the state religion of the Ilkhanate, and threw off his allegiance to the great Khan in the East. Gatson was a good friend of the Christians, for he had been brought up by the Dispina Katun, the Ilkhan Abaga's gracious wife, whom all the East revered, and his conversion in no way lessened his hatred of the Egyptians and the Turks. But there were no more Mongol embassies to Rome and no more hope that Persia would become a Christian power. There was, it is true, a papal envoy in Pekin, Brother John of Monte Corvino, but, though Brother John enjoyed the friendship of Kubilai, the Great Khan had no interest now in the affairs of the Near East. There remained the military orders. They had been founded to fight for Christendom in the Holy Land, and that was still their chief duty. After the fall of Acre the Teutonic Order abandoned the East for its Baltic possessions, but the Templars and the Hospitas set up their headquarters in Cyprus. There, unable to perform their proper task, they took to meddling in local politics. The Pope could probably count on them to provide help for any actual expedition, for their vast endowments all over Europe aroused jealousy that might have dangerous results unless they were proved to be justified. But the temple and hospital unaided could not undertake a crusade. Pope Nicholas had failed to rouse the West after the fall of Tripoli. He was equally impotent after the greater disaster at Acre. His advisers gave him no help. Charles II of Naples supported the suggestion, first made some years previously, that to end their rivalry the military orders should be amalgamated, but he thought that military action in the East was impossible for the moment. He advocated an economic blockade of Egypt and Syria. It would be easy to maintain and very damaging to the Sultan. But that too was in fact impracticable. Neither the Italian nor the Provincial and Aragonese merchant cities would ever cooperate. Their welfare depended on the eastern trade, much of which passed through the Sultan's dominions. Indeed, were it to cease, they would no longer be able to maintain their fleets and the Muslims might well dominate the Mediterranean Sea. It was unfortunate that the chief export with which the Christians paid for Eastern goods consisted of armaments, but would it have been worthwhile to deprive Europe of the benefits of all this commercial activity? The Church might protest against this nefarious exchange of goods, but business interests were now stronger than the Church. Nicholas IV died in 1291 disappointed in his endeavours. Raymond Lull none of his successors achieved a better result. But, though the soldiers for a crusade were lacking, the feeling that Christendom had been shamed produced a new wave of propaganda. The propagandists were no longer itinerant preachers, as in the past, but men of letters who wrote books and pamphlets to show the need of a holy expedition, for whose conduct each author had his own special scheme. In 1291 a Franciscan friar, Fidenzio of Padua, whom the Pope had often used in the past for diplomatic missions and who had travelled widely in the East, published a treatise, called the Libo de Recuperation Ter Sanct, which he dedicated to Nicholas IV. It contains a learned history of the Holy Land, together with a discussion of the type of army needed for its recovery and of the alternative routes that this army might follow. It was informative and well reasoned, but Fidenzio assumed that an army would be available and considered that the commander should make the ultimate choice of the route. Next year, in 1292, 
a certain Thodos of Naples published an account of the fall of Acre. It is a vivid narrative, embroidered by lavish accusations of cowardice against practically everyone who was there. Thodos's violent language was intentional. His object was to shame the West into launching a crusade, and he ended his book with a great appeal to the Pope, to the princes and to the faithful to rescue the Holy Land which is the Christian's heritage. Thodos's work certainly influenced the next propagandist, a Genoese called Galvano of Levante, a physician at the papal court. His book which he published about 1294 and dedicated to King Philip IV of France, was a mixture of analogies taken from the game of chess and mystical exhortations, and was devoid of practical sense. A far more important figure was the great Spanish preacher, Raymond Lull, who was born in Mallorca in 1232, and was stoned to death at Bagui in North Africa in 1315. His fame is highest as a mystic, but he was at the same time a practical politician. He knew Arabic well and he had traveled widely in Muslim countries. In about 1295 he presented the Pope with a memorandum on the action needed to combat Islam, and in 1305 he published his Libertafine which elaborated his ideas and offered a workable program. Both the Muslims and the schismatic and heretical Christian churches must be won over as far as possible by well-educated preachers, but at the same time an armed expedition is necessary. Its leader should be a king, the Rex Bellator, and all the military orders should be united under his command into a new order which should be the backbone of the army. He suggests that the Crusade should expel the Muslims from Spain, then cross into Africa and move along the coast to Tunis and so to Egypt. But later he also advocates a naval expedition, suggesting that Malta and Rhodes, with their excellent harbours should be captured and used as bases. Later still, he seems to prefer that the land expedition should take Constantinople from the Greeks and journey across Anatolia. He is full of concrete advice about the organization of the army and the fleet, and about the supply of food and war materials as well as about the instruction of the preachers who must accompany the army. The book is prolix and at times contradicts itself, but it is the work of a man of remarkable intelligence and wide experience, though his attitude towards the East and Christians is unpleasantly intolerant. When Raymond Lull wrote it seemed that a crusade was really in the offing. King Philip of France had announced his wish to launch an expedition, and both at the papal court and at Paris plans for its conduct were being drawn up and studied. Philip's true motive, which was to extract money from the church by this admirable excuse, was not yet apparent. He had recently emerged triumphant from his quarrel with Pope Boniface VIII, who had found that the technique which had ruined the Hohenstaufen was useless against the new monarchies of the West. Pope Clement V, who was elected in 1305, was a Frenchman. He established himself at Avignon, on the border of the French king's dominions, and he showed constant deference to the king. He hastened to collect memoranda for his own and the king's guidance. Suggestions for the crusade The most interesting of these memoranda was destined only for Philip's eyes. A French lawyer, Peter Dubois, submitted to him a pamphlet of which half was to be issued to the princes of Europe, bidding them join the movement under the king of France and making certain recommendations about the route to be followed and the means for financing the expedition. The Templars should be suppressed and their property annexed, and death duties should be instituted for the clergy. He added a few general suggestions about the desirability of allowing priests to marry and of turning convents into girls' schools. The second half was private advice to the king telling him how to secure control of the church by packing the cardinal's bench and urging him to set up an eastern empire under one of his sons. Soon afterwards in 1310, Philip's chief diplomatic adviser, William Nogret, sent the Pope a memoir on the crusade. Its strategic suggestions were slight. Its main emphasis was on finance. The church was to provide all the money, and the suppression of the Templars was the first item on the program. At the same time the Pope collected advice. The Armenian prince Hethu Morhaton of Corycus, who had retired to France and become the prior of a Premonstratensian abbey near Poitiers, 
was asked to send in his views. His book, called Flos Historum Torientis, was published in 1307 and at once achieved a wide sale. It contained a succinct summary of Levantine history, together with a well-informed discussion of the state of the Mamluk Empire. Hayton recommended a double expedition, to go by sea and be based on Cyprus and on Armenia. He recommended cooperation with the Armenians and a close alliance with the Mongols. Similar views were expressed a little later by the papal diplomat, William Adam, who travelled widely in the east and subsequently reached India. He added the suggestion that the Christians should maintain a fleet in the Indian Ocean, to cut off Egypt's oriental trade. He also considered that Constantinople should be recaptured by the Latins. William Durant, Bishop of Mend, sent in a treatise in 1312, recommending the sea route and laying emphasis on the composition of the expedition, particularly with respect to its morals. The old Genoese admiral, Benito Zaccaria, who had once been boats two of Tripoli, wrote down his views on the naval forces required. More practical suggestions were laid down by three potentates who would have to play a leading part in any crusade. In 1307 the Grand Masters of the Temple and the Hospital were both at Avignon, and Pope Clement asked them for their views. The former, James of Molay, at once sent in a report. He recommended a preliminary clearance of the seas by ten large galleys, to be followed by an army of at least 12 to 15,000 horsemen and 40 to 50,000 infantrymen. The kings of the West should have no difficulty in raising these numbers and the Italian republics must be induced to provide transport. He disapproved of a landing in Cilicia. The expedition should assemble in Cyprus and land on the Syrian coast. Four years later, at the time of the Council of Vienne, Fulk of Villaret, Grand Master of the Hospital, wrote to King Philip to tell him of the preparations that his order had made and could make for the crusade. At the same time King Henry II of Cyprus submitted his views to the council. He desired an economic blockade of the Mameluke Empire. With good reason he distrusted the Italian republics and urged that the crusade should not depend on them for its sea transport. He was in favour of an attack on Egypt itself, as the most vulnerable part of the Sultan's dominions. After all these memoranda and all this enthusiasm it was a surprise and a disappointment to everyone but King Philip that no crusade was launched. Philip had achieved his object in finding an excuse for raising money from the church, and he soon showed his true views by an attack on a great organization whose help would have been essential for a crusade. 1308 the hospitals occupy roads the loss of Outrema left the military orders in a state of uncertainty. The Teutonic Knights solved their problem by concentrating all their energies in Baltic conquest. But the temple and the hospital found themselves restricted and unappreciated in Cyprus. The hospital, wiser than the temple, began to look for another home. In 1306 a Genoa's pirate. Vignolo de Vignoli, who had obtained a lease of the islands of Kos and Laros from the Byzantine Emperor Andronicus, came to Cyprus and suggested to the Grand Master of the Hospital, Fulk of Villaret, that he and the Hospital should conquer the whole Odecanese and Archipelago and divide it between them, he would retain one third himself. While Fulk sailed to Europe to obtain the Pope's confirmation of the scheme, a flotilla of Hospitas, helped by some Genoese galleys, landed on Rhodes and slowly began the reduction of the island. The Greek garrison fought well. It was only by treachery that the great castle of Philemo fell to the invaders in November 1306, and the city of Rhodes itself held out for two more years. At last, in the summer of 1308, a galley sent from Constantinople with reinforcements for the garrison was driven by storms to Cyprus and was seized at Famagusta by a Cypriot knight. Philip Lagiorni, who took it with its passengers to the besiegers. Its commander, who was a Rhodian, agreed, to save his life, to negotiate the surrender of the city, which opened its gates to the order on the 15th of August. The hospital at once set up its headquarters in the island, and made the city, with its fine harbour, the strongest fortress in the Levant. The conquest, 
achieved at the expense of Christian Greeks, was hailed in the West as a great crusading triumph, and indeed it gave to the hospital new vigor and the means to carry on its appointed task. But the wretched Rhodians had to wait for more than six centuries before they recovered their liberty. The temple was less enterprising and less fortunate. It had always roused more enmity than the hospital. It was wealthier. It had long been the chief banker and money lender in the East, successful at a profession which does not inspire affection. Its policy had always been notoriously selfish and irresponsible. Gallantly though its knights had always fought in times of war, their financial activities had brought them into close contact with the Muslims. Many of them had Muslim friends and took an interest in Muslim religion and learning. There were rumors that behind its castle walls the order studied a strange esoteric philosophy and indulged in ceremonies that were tainted with heresy. There were said to be initiation rites that were both blasphemous and indecent, and there were whispers of orgies for the practice of unnatural vices. It would be unwise to dismiss these rumors as the unfounded invention of enemies. There was probably just enough substance in them to suggest the line along which the order could be most convincingly attacked. 1308. The trial of the Templars when James of Molay went to France in 1306 to discuss with Pope Clement the projected crusade, he heard that charges were being made there against his order, and he demanded a public inquiry. The Pope hesitated. He realized that King Philip was determined to suppress the order, and he did not dare to offend him. In October 1307, Philip suddenly arrested all the members of the order that were in France and had them tried for heresy on charges laid by two disreputable knights who had been expelled from it. The accused gave their evidence under torture, and though a few firmly denied everything, the majority were glad to make any admission that was required of them. Next spring, at Philip's request, the Pope ordered every ruler in whose dominions the Templars had possessions to arrest them and start similar trials. After some hesitation, the various kings of Europe consented, except for the Portuguese Dennis, who would have no truck with the sorry business. Everywhere else, Templar property was sequestered, and the knights were hailed before the courts. Torture was not always used, but there was a fixed interrogatory. The accused knew what they were expected to confess, and many of them confessed. It was particularly important for the Pope that the Cypriot government should cooperate, for the headquarters of the order were in the island. But the ruler there was now Henry II's brother Amalric, who had temporarily ousted the king from power with the help of the Templars. The prior Hayton arrived from Avignon in May 1308 with a letter from the Pope ordering the immediate arrest of the knights as they had been found to be unbelievers. Amalric delayed in carrying out the order, and the knights, under their marshal, Aim of Ozelia, had time to prepare to defend themselves. But after a brief recourse to arms they surrendered on the 1st of June. Their treasure, apart from a large portion that they hid so well that it was never recovered, was taken from Limassol to Amalric's house in Nicosia, and the knights themselves were placed under guard first at Kirokisha and Yormaz Oia, and later at Lefkara. There they remained for three years. In May 1310, after King Henry II had been restored to power, the Cypriot Templars were at last brought to trial at the urgent insistence of the Pope. In France many of their brotherhood had already been burned at the stake, and all over Europe the members of the order were imprisoned or destitute. King Henry had no love for the knights who had betrayed his cause a few years before. But he gave them a fair trial. 76 of them were accused. All denied the charges. Distinguished witnesses swore to their innocence, and one of the few hostile witnesses declared that he had only come to suspect them after receiving the Pope's account of their crimes. They were entirely acquitted. When news of their acquittal reached Avignon, the Pope angrily wrote to King Henry to order a second trial and he sent a personal delegate, Dominic of Palestrina, to see that his justice was done. The result of the retrial, which took place in 1311, is unrecorded. Clement had ordered that, if there was danger of another acquittal, Dominic was to secure help of the priors of the Dominicans and the Franciscans in seeing that torture was applied, 
and the papal legate in the east, Peter, Bishop of Rhodes, was dispatched to Cyprus to supplement Dominic's efforts. It seems that the king therefore reserved his verdict and kept the accused in prison. They were still there in 1313, when Peter of Rhodes read out before all the bishops and higher clergy of the island the Pope's decree of 12 March 1312, suppressing the whole order and handing over all its wealth and possessions to the hospitas, after the civil authorities had recouped themselves for the cost of the various trials. The kings throughout Europe found that these costs had been remarkably high. The hospital received little apart from real property. The officers of the temple in Cyprus were never released. But they were more fortunate than their grand master, who after years of imprisonment and torture and many confessions and recantations, was burned to death in Paris in March 1314. 1299 to 1308. The Mongols again invade Syria. The abolition of the Templars and the migration of the Hospitas to Rhodes left the Cypriot Kingdom as the only Christian government acutely interested in the Holy Land. The king was nominally king of Jerusalem, and for many generations to come, the kings, after their coronation with the Cypriot crown at Nicosia, received the crown of Jerusalem at Famagusta, the city that lay nearest to their lost dominion. The Syrian coast was, moreover, of strategic importance to Cyprus. An aggressive enemy there would endanger her very existence. Fortunately the Sultan was too afraid of a new crusade himself to make use of the Syrian ports. He preferred that they should lie derelict. Nevertheless Cyprus was in constant danger from Egypt. Believing that to attack was the best defence, King Henry in 1292 had sent fifteen galleys, aided by ten from the Pope, to raid Alexandria. It was a futile effort, and merely determined Al Ashraf to conquer Cyprus. Cyprus, 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 he cried, as he ordered a hundred galleys to be built. But he had other grander schemes. The Mongols must first be rooted and Baghdad occupied. His ambition alarmed his emirs. They murdered him on the 13th of December 1293. It was a poor reward for the determined young prince who had completed Saladin's work and driven the last remnant of the Franks from Syria. Al Ashraf was right to remember the Mongols. In 1299, during the much interrupted reign of the Mamluk Sultan and Nazir Muhammad, the Mongol ruler Gatsun, who had changed his title from Ilkhan to Sultan, invaded Syria and routed the Mameluke defense force at Salamia, near Homs, on 23 December. In January 1300, Damascus surrendered to him and admitted his suzerainty. He returned to Persia next month, announcing that he would soon return to conquer Egypt. Muslim though he was, Gatson would have welcomed Christian allies. Raymond Lull hastened to Syria on the news of the invasion, but was too late to meet Gatson there. He returned to Cyprus to ask the king to help him go on an evangelical mission to the Muslim rulers. King Henry, who did not agree that the friendship of the infidels was best won by pointing out their errors to them, ignored his request. A more diplomatic approach would have been useful, but none was made, and the opportunity ended when the Mongol army was defeated in 1303 at Marjaz Safar. Five years later, in 1308, Gatson again entered Syria and now penetrated as far as Jerusalem itself. It was rumored that he would have willingly handed over the holy city to the Christians had any Christian state offered him its alliance. But, though at the time the Pope and King Philip of France were loudly advertising their projected crusade, no overtures were made to the Mongols from the west while Cyprus was reduced to impotence by the struggles between King Henry and his brother. In any case Gatson, as a good Muslim convert, might have found it difficult to implement such a promise. On his death in 1316, the chances of Mongol alliance with the Christians faded out. His nephew and successor, Abu Said, veered round towards a reconciliation with Egypt. He was the last great Mongol ruler of Persia. After he died in 1335 the former Ilkhanate began to disintegrate. Despite its apparent isolation, the kingdom of Cyprus was not yet in immediate danger. The Sultan, even when he was no longer preoccupied with the Mongols, 
had insufficient sea power to risk an expedition against the island. He had no wish to offend the Italian republics, for he too derived great benefits from their trade. He captured Ruad from the Templars in 1302, but, unless Cyprus became the base for a new crusade, he preferred to let it alone. The Cypriot government for its part tried, as far as personal and dynastic idiosyncrasies allowed, to keep on close terms with the Armenian kings of Cilicia, and with the kings of Aragon and Sicily, whose fleets commanded respect. 1359, accession of Peter I of Cyprus After all the crusading talk that Philip of France had inspired died down, there was a lull. But about the year 1330 it was revived by Philip V. His intentions were far more sincere than those of his uncle, and they were encouraged by the Pope, John 22. Once again memoranda were submitted to the papal and royal courts. The Queen of France's physician, Guy of Vigevano, wrote a brief account of the armaments required. A longer and more detailed program was sent to the king by a certain Burkhard, an ecclesiastic who had worked in Cilicia to secure the adhesion of the Armenian Church to Rome. Burkhard's suggestions were plentiful, but not helpful for he showed far more animosity against the schismatic and heretic Christians than against the Muslims, and he considered that the conquest of Orthodox Serbia and of Byzantium was an essential part of any crusade. But his schemes were not to be put to the test. Before any crusade could be launched the King of France was involved in the outbreak of the Hundred Years' War with England. A more practical program, which did not require any great military expedition, had meanwhile been published by the historian Marino Sanudo. He was a member of the ducal house of Naxos and had Greek blood in his veins, and he was an acute observer and a pioneer statistician. His secret of Fidelium Crucis, which appeared about 1321, contained a history of the Crusades, somewhat colored by propagandist aims, but was mainly concerned with a detailed discussion of the economic position of the Levant. He saw that Egypt could best be weakened by means of an economic blockade, but he realized that the eastern trade could not suddenly be suppressed. Alternative routes and sources of supply must be found. His analysis was profound, and his suggestions were far-sighted and comprehensive. Unfortunately they could only be carried out if all the European powers worked together, and that could never now be achieved. In fact, there was only one more effort made to rescue the Holy Land from the infidel. In 1359 Peter I ascended the throne of Cyprus. He was the first monarch since Saint Louis of France to have a burning and overwhelming desire to fight the Holy War. As a young man he had founded a new order of chivalry, the Knights of the Sword, whose one avowed object was to recover Jerusalem and he had braved his father King Hugh IV's displeasure by attempting to travel to the west to win recruits for his crusade. His first wars as king were against the Turks in Anatolia, where he had obtained a foothold by the acquisition of the fortress of Coricus from the Armenians. In 1362 he set out on a general tour of Christendom to further his main object. After visiting Rhodes where he secured promises of help from the hospital, he sailed to Venice where he stayed over the new year of 1363. The Venetians were officially sympathetic to his plans. After calling at Milan, he went to Genoa. There he was busy settling differences between his kingdom and the Republic and winning a vague support from the Genoese. He arrived at Avignon on 29 March 1363, a few months after the accession of Pope Urban V. His first task was to defend his right to his throne against his nephew Hugh, Prince of Galilee, son of his late elder brother. Hugh was compensated with an annual pension of 50,000 pesants. While he was at Avignon King John II of France visited the city and promised him his warm cooperation. The two kings took the cross together in April, together with many of the French and Cypriot nobility. At the same time the Pope preached the Holy War and appointed Cardinal Tolley Rand as its legate. Peter then made a circuitous tour through Flanders, Brabant and the Rhineland. In August he went to Paris to see King John once more. They decided that the crusade should be launched the following March. From Paris Peter went to Rouen and 
and sailed across to England. He spent about a month in London, where a great tournament was held in his honour at Smithfield. King Edward III presented him with a handsome ship, the Catherine, and with money to cover all his recent expenses. Unfortunately he was robbed by highwaymen on his way back to the coast. He returned to Paris for Christmas, then went south to Aquitaine, to interview the Black Prince at Bordeaux. While he was there he learned to his sorrow of the deaths, first of Cardinal Tolerand, in January 1364, then of King John in May. He went to John's funeral at St. Denis and to the coronation of his successor, Charles V, at Reims, then moved into Germany. The knights and burghers of Eslingen and Erfurt offered to join his crusade, but the Margrave of Frankenia and Rudolf II, Duke of Saxony, though they received him with honour, both said that their decision must depend on the Emperor. He therefore went with Rudolf to Prague, where the Emperor Charles was in residence. Charles professed himself to be enthusiastic and invited Peter to accompany him to Krakow, to a conference that he was about to hold with the kings of Hungary and Poland. It was there agreed that a circular should be sent to all the princes of the empire, inviting their collaboration in the Holy War. After visiting Vienna, where Rudolf IV, Duke of Austria, promised further help, Peter returned to Venice in November 1364. As his troops had recently helped the Venetians to suppress a revolt in Crete, he was welcomed there with the highest honours. He remained there till the end of June 1365. While he was there he signed a treaty with Genoa which settled all outstanding differences. 1365, King Peter plans his crusade Meanwhile Pope Urban wrote indefatigably to the princes of Europe to urge them to join the expedition and his efforts were energetically seconded by the new papal legate to the east, Peter of Salignac de Thomas, nominal patriarch of Constantinople, a man of fierce integrity, equally opposed to schismatics, heretics and infidels, but of a devotion that was respected even by those that he persecuted. Working with him was his pupil, Philip of Meziers, a close friend of King Peter, who had appointed him Chancellor of Cyprus. All their united activity did not produce the number of recruits that King Peter had expected and been promised. No Germans came forward, and none of the greater nobles of France or England, or the neighbouring lands, apart from Aim, Count of Geneva, William Roger, Viscount of Turenne, and the Earl of Hereford. But there were many lesser knights, coming even from so far afield as Scotland, and already before King Peter left Venice, a large and formidable army had gathered there. The Venetian contribution was particularly useful, but the Genoa's held back. It was decided that the Crusade should assemble at Rhodes in August 1365, but its further destination was kept secret. The risk that some Venetian trader would inform the Muslims was too dangerous. King Peter arrived at Rhodes early in the month and on the 25th the whole Cypriot fleet sailed into the harbour, 108 vessels in all, galleys, transport, merchant ships and light skiffs. With the great galleys of the Venetians and those provided by the hospital, the armada numbered 165 ships. They carried a full complement of men, with ample horses, provisions and arms. Not since the Third Crusade had a proportionate expedition set out for the Holy War, and, though there was disappointment that no great potentates from the West were present, there was the counter-advantage that King Peter was the unquestioned leader. In October he wrote to his Queen, Eleanor of Aragon, that everything was ready. At the same time he issued an order warning all his subjects in Syria to return home and forbidding them to trade there. He wished it to be thought that Syria was his objective. On the 4th of October, the Patriarch Peter preached a stirring sermon to the assembled sailors from the royal galley, and they all cried out, Vivat, Vivat Petres, Jerusalem et Cypri Rex, Contra Saracenos Infidles. That evening the fleet set sail. When all the ships were at sea, it was announced that the destination was Alexandria in Egypt. 1365. The expedition attacks Alexandria once a decision to attack the Sultan was made. The choice of Alexandria as an objective was intelligent. 
it would be impracticable to attempt to invade Syria or Palestine without a base on the coast, and the ports there, with the exception of Tripoli, had been deliberately ruined by the Egyptians. But past experience showed that when the ruler of Egypt lost Damietta he had been ready to cede Jerusalem for its recovery. Alexandria was a richer prize than Damietta. Its conquerors could strike a still more profitable bargain. It would also be an excellent base for a further advance, for it was certainly amply provisioned, and the canals made it easy to defend from the land. It was moreover the port for almost all the sultan's oversea trade. Its loss would subject his dominions to a drastic form of economic blockade. It was also unlikely that he would expect an attack on a city where Christian merchants had such large interests. The moment, too, was well chosen. The reigning sultan, Shaban, was a boy of eleven. Power was in the hands of the emir Yolburga, who was disliked by his fellow emirs and by the people. The governor of Alexandria, Khalil Ibnurum, was away on a pilgrimage to Mecca. His deputy, Jangara, was a junior officer, and had been left with a hopelessly inadequate garrison. On the other hand the walls of Alexandria were notoriously strong. Even if its two harbours and the Pharos Peninsula that lay between them were captured, there were still great fortifications along the harbour front. The Armada arrived off Alexandria during the evening of the 9th of October. The citizens at first thought that it was a great merchant fleet and prepared to go out to bargain. It was only when next morning the ships entered the western harbour, instead of the eastern which alone was permitted to Christian ships, that their intentions became apparent. The acting governor, Jangara, hastened to concentrate his men on the foreshore to prevent a landing, but despite the gallantry of some Mograbi soldiers, the Christian knights forced their way ashore. While native merchants streamed out of the city through the landward gates, Jang Ara retired behind the walls and collected his small garrison to hold the sector opposite to the landing. King Peter intended to pause in his attack. He wished to land all his men and horses at leisure on to the Pharos Peninsula. But when he took counsel of his commanders he found that many of them disapproved of the choice of Alexandria as an objective. They were too few, they said either to hold so large a fortress or to advance from the to Cairo. They wished to sail away elsewhere, but would stay if the city were at once taken by storm before the Sultan could send a relieving force. Peter was obliged to comply with their wishes, and the assault began at once. It was launched against the west wall, as Jangara had expected, but when they were held there the assailants moved to the section opposite to the eastern harbour. Within the walls access between the two sections ran through the great customs house, and an officious customs officer, fearing robberies, had barricaded the doors. Jang Ara could not move his men in time to face the new attack. Believing that the city was lost they began to desert their posts and flee through the streets to the southern gates and safety. By midday on Friday the 10th the crusaders were well established within the city. Fighting continued in the streets. During the Friday night there was a fierce Muslim counter-attack through one of the southern gates, which the Christians in their excitement had burned down. It was beaten off, and by the Saturday afternoon all Alexandria was in the Crusaders' hands. The victory was celebrated with unparalleled savagery. Two and a half centuries of holy warfare had taught the Crusaders nothing of humanity. The massacres were only equalled by those of Jerusalem in 1099 and Constantinople in 1204. The Muslims had not been so ferocious at Antioch or at Acre. Alexandria's wealth had been phenomenal, and the victors were maddened at the sight of so much booty. They spared no one. The native Christians and the Jews suffered as much as the Muslims, and even the European merchants settled in the city saw their factories and storehouses ruthlessly looted. Mosques and tombs were raided and their ornaments stolen or destroyed, churches too were sacked, though a gallant crippled Coptic lady managed to save some of the treasures of her sect at the sacrifice of her private fortune. Houses were entered, and householders who did not immediately hand over all their possessions were slaughtered with their families. Some 5,000 prisoners, Christians and Jews as well as Muslims, were taken to be sold as slaves. A long line of horses, 
asses and camels carried the loot to the ships in the harbor and there having performed their task were killed. The whole city stank with the odor of human and animal corpses. 1365 The sack of Alexandria King Peter vainly tried to restore order. He had hoped to hold the city, and, as the Crusaders had burned its gates, he demolished the bridge by which the road to Cairo crossed the Great Canal. But the Crusaders now only wished to take their plunder home as quickly as possible. An army was coming up from Cairo and they were unwilling to risk a battle. Even the king's own brother told him that the city was untenable, while the Viscount of Duren, with most of the English and French knights, roundly said that they would not remain any longer. Peter and the legate protested in vain. By Thursday the 16th only a few Cypriot troops remained in the city. The rest of the expedition had returned to the ships, ready to depart. As the Egyptians had already reached the suburbs, Peter himself embarked on his galley and gave the order for evacuation. So heavily laden were the ships that it was necessary to jettison many of the larger pieces of loot. For months to come Egyptian divers salvaged precious objects from the shallow waters off Abka. Peter and the legate had hoped that, when their gains were safely stored in Cyprus, the crusaders would start out again with him on a new expedition. But no sooner had they reached from Augusta than they all began to make arrangements to journey home to the west. The legate prepared to follow them, to win other recruits in their place, but he fell mortally ill before he could leave the island. King Peter held a service of thanksgiving on his return to Nicosia, but his heart was sore. His report to the Pope told of his triumph but also of his bitter disappointment. The news of the sack of Alexandria had a mixed reception in the west. It was first hailed as a military triumph and a humiliation for Islam. The Pope was delighted, but saw that Peter must have immediate reinforcements to take the place of the deserters. King Charles of France promised to send an army. The most celebrated of his knights, Bertrand Dugsclin, took the cross, and Amadeus, Count of Savoy, known in romance as the Green Knight, who was preparing a journey to the east, decided to sail for Cyprus. But then the Venetians announced that Peter had made peace with the Sultan. King Charles countermanded his army. Dugsclin went to fight in Spain and Amadeus to Constantinople. The Venetians, unlike the Pope, had not been pleased by the outcome of the Crusade. They had hoped to use it to strengthen their commercial hold on the Levant. Instead, their ample property in Alexandria had been destroyed, and their whole Egyptian trade had been interrupted. The sack of Alexandria came near to ruining them as a commercial power, to the delight of the Genoese, whose restraint had been rewarded. Soon the whole of the West experienced the effects of the Crusade. The price of spices and silks and other Eastern goods to which the public was now accustomed rose steeply as the supplies ran out and were not renewed. Peter had in fact opened negotiations with Egypt but both sides were too bitter to wish for peace. While the Emir Yolburga, hampered by his unpopularity in Egypt, played for time until he could build a fleet for the invasion of Cyprus, Peter made extravagant demands for the cession of the Holy Land and followed them up with raids on the Syrian coast. But his crusading mania began to alarm his subjects, who feared lest the resources of the island would be exhausted in a hopeless cause. When a knight with whom Peter had quarreled planned his murder in 1369, not even his own brothers lifted a finger to save him. The year after his death a treaty was signed with the Sultan. Prisoners were exchanged, and Cyprus and Egypt settled down to an uneasy peace. 1375, Collapse of the Armenian Kingdom The Holocaust at Alexandria marks the end of those Crusades whose direct object was the recovery of the Holy Land. Even had all the Crusaders been as devoted as King Peter, it is doubtful whether the expedition could ever have been to the benefit of Christendom. When it took place, Egypt had been at peace with the Franks for over half a century. The Mamluks had begun to lose their earlier fanaticism. Their Christian subjects were receiving kinder treatment. Pilgrims were freely allowed to the holy places. Commerce was flourishing between East and West. Now all the bitterness of the Muslims was revived. 
the native Christians, guiltless though they were, underwent a new period of persecution. Churches were destroyed. Even the Holy Sepulchre was closed for three years. The interruption to commerce did serious damage all round to a world that had not yet recovered from the ravages of the Black Death. The Kingdom of Cyprus, whose existence the Mamluks had been ready to tolerate, became an enemy to be deleted. Egypt waited sixty years for her revenge. But the ghastly devastation of the island in 1426 was a direct punishment for the sack of Alexandria. The only other Christian kingdom in the Levant met with an earlier doom. The Armenians of Cilicia had taken no part in King Peter's crusade, but their royal house was now Frankish and many of the nobility had close connections with Cyprus. Their church had admitted the sway of Rome. Throughout the 14th century the Egyptians had pressed on them, suspecting them rightly as friends of the Franks and the Mongols and jealous of the wealth that passed through their country by the trade route that reached the sea at Ayas. The collapse of the Mongol Ilkhanate deprived them of their chief support. Most of their territory was annexed in 1337 by the Turks. In 1375, while the Cypriots were engrossed in a bitter war with Genoa, Muslim invaders, Mamluks and Turks in alliance, completed the subjection of the country. The last Armenian king, Leo V, fled to the west and died as an exile in Paris, and Armenian independence was ended. Indeed, a crusade such as King Peter planned was now an anachronism. Christendom could not afford such luxuries. It had to face too serious a threat further to the north. The planners of the First Crusade had seen clearly that the rescue of the Holy Land depended on the maintenance of Christian power in Anatolia. But since Pope Urban II's death no Western statesman had had the wisdom to realize that the maintenance of Anatolia depended upon Byzantium. The crusading movements of the 12th century had embarrassed the Byzantine Emperor. They had added to the problems that Byzantium had to face and had never allowed the emperors the leisure to attend to the subjection of the Turkish invaders. The task may well have been impossible, for the Turkish technique of invasion, with its destruction of agriculture and of communications, made reconquest a difficult task, while the varied ambitions of emperors such as Manuel and Andronicus Comnenus resulted in a further dispersion of energy. The disaster at Man's Eichert in 1071 allowed the Turks into Anatolia. The disaster at Myriocephalum in 1176 ensured that they would remain there. But it was the Fourth Crusade and its irreparable destruction of the Byzantine imperial system that gave them the opportunity to go further. During the 13th century Christendom had its last opportunity for dealing with the Turks. Their power in Anatolia had hitherto been dependent on the Seljuk Sultanate of Konya. The Mongol invasions, which began in 1242, undermined and ultimately destroyed the Seljuk state. The Byzantine emperors, living in exile at Nicaea, were aware of their chance, but their European preoccupations and their yearning to recover their imperial capital against the hostility of the Latin West hampered their efforts while the Latins lacked the foresight and experience to understand the situation. Once the Byzantines were re-established in Constantinople the occasion was gone. The emperors of the House of Palaeologus had to contend with young and vigorous kingdoms in the Balkans, with the demands of the Italian republics and with the risk of a Latin reconquest, which was very real till Charles of Anjou was crippled by the Sicilian Vespers. By the end of the 13th century it was too late. The Seljuks were gone, but in their place there were several active and ambitious emirates, strengthened by the immigration of Turkish tribes subject to the Mongols. It would need a long and concerted effort to dislodge them. Chief amongst the emirs was the Grand Karaman, whose dominions stretched along the interior of the country from Philadelphia to the Anti-Taurus. There were other emirs established at Italia, at Aden, Turles, and at Manassa, Magnesia. The north coast was still held by Byzantium and its sister empire of Trebizond. But south of Trebizond the country was occupied by the Turkomans, and in the northwest a lively new emirate was arising, under an enterprising prince called Osman. 1344, capture of Smyrna. The Latins were by now growing aware of the importance of Anatolia, 
though they saw it less as a base for aggression against themselves than as an area in which they needed bases for the control of the Mediterranean. The Hospiter's occupation of Rhodes was largely the result of chance, but it illustrated a new orientation. The Italian republics had long been interested in the islands of the Aegean. It was natural that their concern, and the concern of the whole Latin world, should spread to the mainland opposite. When the Emir Omar of Aden, who was in possession of the excellent harbour of Smyrna, built a fleet in order to indulge in piracy in Aegean waters, both the Venetians and the Knights at Rhodes took action. In 1344 a squadron, to which the Venetians and their dependents contributed about twenty ships, the Knights six and the Pope and the King of Cyprus four apiece, set out against Smyrna. The Latin Patriarch of Constantinople, Henry of Asti, was in command. The Emir of Aden was defeated in a sea battle on Ascension Day, off the entrance to the Gulf. The Christian allies, at the Pope's request, refused an invitation from the Genoese ex-lord of Chios, Martin Zakaria, who had joined the expedition, to restore him his island which the Byzantines had recaptured, but sailed up to Smyrna. After a short struggle the city fell into their hands on the 24th of October, though the citadel was untaken. The easy victory was mainly due to the Emir Omar's unpreparedness and his jealous fear of his fellow Emirs. He came with his army too late to save the city. But the victors were lured to try to invade the interior. They were heavily defeated a few miles from the city, and Henry of Asti and Martin Zakaria were killed. After the Turks had failed to retake Smyrna, a treaty signed in 1350 entrusted it to the Hospiters, though the citadel remained in Turkish hands. The knights held Smyrna till 1402, when it was stormed by Timidot. While the fate of Smyrna was still in the balance, a French nobleman, Humbert II, Dauphin of Vienne, announced his desire to go on a crusade to the east. He was a weak, vain man but genuinely pious and without personal ambition. After some negotiations with the Pope, it was decided that he should go to supplement the Christian effort at Smyrna. He set out from Marseille with a company of knights and priests in May 1345, and was joined on his eastward journey by troops from northern Italy. After various ineffectual adventures he reached Smyrna in 1346, and his army defeated the Turks in a battle outside the walls. He did not remain there for long. By the summer of 1347 he was back in France. The whole expedition had been singularly futile. Its importance is that the church was now ready to regard an expedition to Anatolia as a crusade. In 1361 Peter of Cyprus, who had recently acquired Coricus from the Armenians, obtained the help of the Hospitas in an attack on the Turkish port of Italia. After a brief struggle it fell into his hands on the 24th of August. The neighboring emirs of Allah, Monovgat and Tech hastened to offer him allegiance, thinking that his friendship might be useful against their chief enemy the Grand Karaman. They soon withdrew their submission and made various attempts to recover Italia, which, however, remained in Cypriot hands for sixty years. Growth of the Ottoman Sultanate but meanwhile the attention of Europe had been forcibly turned further north. The first decades of the 14th century saw an extraordinary growth in the power of the Turkish Emirate founded by Osman, son of Ertegrul, and called Osman the or Ottoman after him. In 1300 Osman was a petty chieftain with lands in southern Bithynia. By the time of his death in 1326 he was Lord of Brusa and most of the territory between Adramitium, Dorelium and the Marmara. His expansion was due partly to his skillful and supple diplomacy towards his fellow emirs, and still more to the weakness of Byzantium. In 1302 the Emperor Andronicus II had rashly hired the service of a Catalan company, led by Roger Flor. The ex-Templar who had made his fortune by his disreputable behavior during the sack of Acre. Roger fought successfully against the Turks but still more actively against his imperial master. He was murdered in 1306, but the Catalan company remained in imperial territory, in hostility to the empire, till 1315. During its wars it brought a Turkish regiment, formerly employed by the emperor in Asia 
across into Europe. Soon after the Catalan company was gone, there was civil war in the empire between Andronicus II and his grandson Andronicus III, which only ended on the former's death in 1328. Both sides used the Turks as mercenaries. Meanwhile Osman's son, Orhan, continued his father's work. He established a vague hegemony over the emirs to the south of his lands, and he continued with the conquest of Bithynia. Nicaea was captured in 1329 and Nicomedia in 1337. In the empire civil war broke out again in 1341, between John V and his father-in-law, John Cantacuzenus, while the growing power of Stephen Dushan of Serbia distracted the attention of all the Balkan peoples. In 1354, Orhan, who had taken the title of Sultan, sent troops across the Dardanelles to take the town of Gallipoli. Two years later, he moved several thousand of his people across the straits and settled them in Thrace. Next year, he was able to advance inland and captured the great fortress of Adrianople, which became his second capital. By the time of his death in 1359 almost all Thrace was in his hands, and Constantinople was isolated from its European possessions. His son and successor, Murad I, was well able to carry on his predecessor's work. His first action was to found the core of Janissaries from forcibly converted Christian slave children sent to him as tribute. The expansion of the Ottoman Turks was not unnoticed in the West. There seemed to be little danger as yet for the European continent, for the great Serbian Empire seemed well able to check any advance. But Constantinople itself was obviously threatened, and with it the commercial interests of the Italians. The Greeks, however, were schismatic. The policy of the Western Church was to insist on their submission to Rome before there could be any question of sending them help. This form of moral blackmail was bound to fail. Not only religious conviction but national pride and the memory of past outrages made it impossible for the Greek people to agree to Latin ecclesiastical domination, even if their rulers were ready to comply. 1366, Crusade of the Count of Savoy in 1365 Amadeus V, Count of Savoy, took the cross. Pope Urban VI had been busily preaching the crusade on behalf of Peter of Cyprus and Amadeus had every intention of proceeding to the Holy Land. But he was first cousin to the Byzantine Emperor John V, and he wished to help him. The Pope gave him permission to begin his campaign by fighting against the Turks, on condition that he secured the submission of the Greek Church. The Venetians did their best to check his crusade, fearing that it might interfere with their commercial policy. They particularly did not wish him to join Peter of Cyprus and were relieved when their rumours of Peter's treaty with Egypt determined him to concentrate on Byzantium. He assembled a distinguished collection of knights, but from the outset he had difficulties over finance. The expedition reached the Dardanelles in August 1366, and at once laid siege to Gallipoli, which fell on 23 August. But instead of landing in Thrace and attempting to clear the province of the Turks, Amadeus sailed on to Constantinople. There he found that the emperor had been treacherously captured by the Bulgarian king, Shishman III, and all his energy was therefore devoted to the rescue of his cousin, which was only achieved by an attack on Shishman's port of Varna. When John was rescued Amadeus found that he had spent all his own money, as well as all the money that he had extorted locally and borrowed from the empress. He was obliged to return home. But first he made the emperor promise to bring his church under Rome, and when the patriarch of Constantinople, Philotheus, came with a Greek knight to his galley to tell him that the Greek people would depose the emperor if he agreed, he kidnapped them and took them with him to Italy. He returned home at the end of 1367. His crusade had been almost valueless. The Turks recaptured Gallipoli immediately on his departure. Under Murad, the Ottoman Turks rapidly increased their power. He reduced the Western Anatolian emirs to subjection, and advanced in Europe. After a victory over the Serbs on the Maritza in 1371, Bulgaria became a vassal state and was soon entirely annexed. 
In 1389 a decisive battle was fought between the Serbs and the Turks at Kosovo. Murad was assassinated by a Serb just before the battle, but his troops, which vastly outnumbered their opponents, were completely triumphant. The Turks were now masters of the Balkans. Though the crusading energy of the West was diverted in 1390 by a disastrous expedition led by Louis II, Duke of Bourbon, against Almadia, near Tunis, it was clear that for the safety of Christian Europe the Ottoman Turks must be checked. When in 1390 the Sultan Bayezid annexed the Bulgarian town of Vidin on the Danube, whose prince had acknowledged the suzerainty of Hungary, the Hungarian king, Sigismund of Luxembourg, the brother of the Emperor Wenzel, appealed to all his fellow monarchs for help. Both the Roman Pope, Boniface IX, and the Avignonese Pope, Benedict XIII, issued bulls recommending a crusade, while the aged propagandist, Philip of Meziers, wrote an open letter to Richard II of England to bid him cooperate with Charles VI of France for the coming crusade. Sigismund's German connections enabled him to find support in Germany. The princes of Wallachia and Transylvania were sufficiently terrified of the Turkish advance to join him, much as they hated the Hungarians. In the west the Dukes of Burgundy, Orleans and Lancaster all announced their desire to help. In March 1395 a Hungarian embassy, headed by the Archbishop of Gran, Nicholas of Canis, arrived at Venice to secure a promise of transport from the Doge. The ambassadors then proceeded to Lyon, where they were welcomed lavishly by the Duke of Burgundy, Philip the Bold, who promised them his enthusiastic support. After visiting Dijon, to pay their respects to the Duchess, Margaret of Flanders, they went to Bordeaux to meet the King of England's uncle, John of Lancaster, who undertook to arrange for an English contingent. From Bordeaux they journeyed to Paris. The French King, Charles Vie, was suffering from a bout of madness, but his regent suffered to encourage the French nobility to join the crusade. A great international army for the rescue of Christendom began to assemble. To finance it, the Burgundian duke raised special taxes that brought in the huge sum of 700,000 gold francs. Individual French nobles added their own contributions. Guy Vi, Count of La Trimouille, provided 24,000 francs. The French and Burgundian lords agreed to accept the leadership of the Duke of Burgundy's eldest son, John, Count of Nevers a lively young man of 24.1396, crusade of Nicopolis while the Hungarian ambassadors hurried back to Buda to tell King Sigismund of their success and to advise him to continue his preparations, the Duke of Burgundy issued careful ordinances for the organization and behavior of the Franco-Burgundian troops. They were summoned to assemble at Dijon on 20 April 1396. John of Nevers was to be in command, but in view of his youth an advisory council was formed of Philip, son of the Duke of Bar, Guy of Latrimoyle, and his brother William, the Admiral John of Vienne, and Odard, Lord of Chaseron. At the end of the month an army of 10,000 men set out to march through Germany to Buda. On its way it was joined by 6,000 Germans, headed by the Count Palatine Rupert, son of Rupert III of Wittelsbach, and Eberhard, Count of Katznelnbogen. Close behind there followed a thousand English fighting men, under King Richard's half-brother, John Holland, Earl of Huntingdon. The Western armies reached Buda about the end of July. There they found King Sigismund waiting with a force of some sixty thousand men. His vassal Mercia, Voivod of Wallachia, had joined him with another ten thousand men and about 13,000 adventurers came in from Poland, Bohemia, Italy and Spain. The united army of close on a hundred thousand soldiers was the largest that had ever yet taken the field against the infidel. Meanwhile a fleet manned by the Knights of the Hospital, under the Grand Master, Philibert of Nailac, and by Venetians and Genoese, penetrated into the Black Sea and lay off the mouth of the Danube. The Ottoman Sultan on his side had not been idle. When news reached him that the crusade had assembled in Hungary, Bayezid was laying siege to Constantinople. He at once summoned all his available troops and marched northward to the Danube. 
his army was estimated as numbering rather more than a hundred thousand. Three centuries of experience had taught the Western Knights nothing. When the plan of campaign was discussed at Buda King Sigismund advised a defensive strategy. He knew the strength of the enemy. It would be better, he thought, to lure Turks into Hungary and attack them there from prepared positions. Like the Byzantine emperors during the earlier Crusades, Sigismund believed that the safety of Christendom depended on the preservation of his own kingdom, but, like the earlier Crusaders, his allies envisaged a great offensive. The Turks would be overwhelmed and the Christian armies would advance triumphantly through Anatolia to Syria and the holy city itself. So vehement were they that Sigismund gave way. Early in August the united hosts set out down the left bank of the Danube, as far as Orsava, by the Iron Gates, and there it crossed into the Sultan's dominions. Eight days were spent in ferrying the army across the river. It then marched along the south bank to the town of Viden. The Lord of Viden was a Bulgarian prince, John Srochima, but he was vassal to the Sultan, who kept a small Turkish garrison there. On the arrival of the Christians, John Srochima joined them and opened the gates. The Turks were massacred. The next town down the river was Rehiva, a strong fortress with a moat and a double enceinte, and a large Turkish garrison. The more vehement French knights, led by Philip of Artois, Count of Eu, and John Le Mayinga, better known as Marshal Boussicout, at once rushed to the attack and would have been annihilated had not Sigismund brought up his Hungarians. The garrison could not hold out for long against the whole Christian army. It was stormed, and the whole population, many of whom were Bulgarian Christians, were put to the sword except for a thousand wealthier folk who were held for ransom. From Rahava the army moved on to Nicopolis. This was the chief Turkish stronghold on the Danube, situated where the main road from central Bulgaria came to the river. It was built beside the river on a hill whose steep slopes were crowned with two lines of formidable walls. The Crusaders had come without machines for siege warfare. The Westerners had not realized the need for them and Sigismund had prepared only for defensive action. When the ladders hastily erected by the French and the mines dug by Hungarian engineers proved quite inadequate, the army sat down to starve the city into surrender. In this they were aided by the arrival of the hospital fleet, which sailed up the Danube and anchored off the walls on 10 September. But Nicopolis was well stocked with provisions, and the Turkish governor, Dogen Bey, who had learned of the fate of his compatriots at Viden and Rehiva, had no intention of surrendering. 1396, the Battle of Nicopolis, the delay was fatal to the morale of the Christian army. The Western knights amused themselves in gambling and drinking and all forms of debauchery. The few soldiers who dared to suggest that the Turks were formidable foes had their ears cut off, by order of Marshal Boussicout, as a punishment for defeatism. There were quarrels between the various contingents, while Sigismund's Transylvanian vassals and Wallachian allies began to talk of desertion. When the crusade had passed a fortnight before Nicopolis, news came that the Turks were approaching. The Sultan's army had moved swiftly up from Thrace. It was lightly armed, its cavalry was far more mobile than the Frankish, its archers were superbly trained and it had the profound advantage of perfect discipline and obedience to the sole command of the Sultan, who was himself a man of exceptional ability. He had sent some troops ahead, which were defeated in one of the Balkan passes by a French contingent led by the Lord of Kusi, but the jealousy of Marshal Boussicout, who accused Kusi of trying to steal from John of Nevers the honours of victory, prevented any further attempts to stem the Turkish advance. Meanwhile the knights decided to kill the captives taken at Rehova. On Monday, the 25th of September 1396, the vanguard of the Turkish army came into sight, and camped in the hills some three miles from the Christians. Next morning before sunrise Sigismund visited all his fellow commanders and begged them to remain on the defensive. Though he told them frankly that he could not trust his Transylvanians and the Wallachians, only Kusi and John of Vienne supported him. The other leaders were determined to force a battle at once. Sigismund weakly gave way. 
he drew up his own army in three divisions, with his own Hungarian troops in the center, the Wallachians on the left and the Transylvanians on the right. The vanguard was composed of all the Westerners, under John of Nevers. When morning broke, all that could be seen of the Turkish army was a division of light irregular cavalry, just over the slope of the hill. Behind it, protected by a line of stakes, was the Turkish infantry, with a regiment of archers. The main body of Sipai cavalry, commanded by the Sultan in person, lay hidden by the crest of the hill. A division of Serbian cavalry, under the Prince Stephen Lazarovic, a loyal vassal of the Sultan's, was on his left. The battle, like the preceding strategy, showed that the Crusaders had learned nothing in all the centuries. The Western knights in the van did not wait to tell Sigismund of their plans. In high, confident enthusiasm they charged up the hill, scattering the light Turkish horsemen before them. While the Turks regrouped behind their own infantry, the knights found themselves held up by the stakes. At once they dismounted and continued the charge on foot, pulling out the stakes as they advanced. Such was their impetus that the Turkish infantry also was scattered. Some of the Turks were able to retire behind the regrouped cavalry, but many more were slain or driven down into the plain. But when the Crusaders, triumphant but exhausted, hastened on and reached the hilltop they found themselves face to face with the Sultan Sipahis and the Serbs. The attack of these fresh troops took them by surprise. On foot, tired and thirsty, and weighed down by their heavy armor, they were soon flung into disorder, and their victory was turned into a rout. Few of the knights survived the slaughter. Amongst those that perished were William of La Tremoyle and his son, Philip, John of Cad's Ord, Admiral of Flanders, and the Grand Prior of the Teutonic Knights. John of Vienne, Grand Admiral of France, fell clutching the great banner of Notre Dame entrusted to his care. John of Nevers only was spared because his attendants cried out who he was and persuaded him to surrender. With him were taken the Counts of Eu and Lamarca, Guy of Latrimuil, in Grand of Cousy and Marshal Boussicout. 1396, the Sultan's victory when the knights had dismounted, their horses rushed riderless back to the camp. The Wallachian and Transylvanian contingents at once decided that the battle was lost and hastened to retire seizing all the boats that they could find, in order to cross the river. But Sigismund ordered his troops to advance to the rescue of the Westerners. They slew many of the disordered Turkish infantry as they moved up the hill, but when they approached the battlefield they found that they were too late. The Sultan's cavalry charged down on them and drove them back with heavy loss right to the banks of the river. When his army was scattered, Sigismund himself was persuaded to abandon the fight. He took refuge on one of the Venetian ships in the river, which carried him to Constantinople and on home through the Aegean and the Adriatic. He feared to journey by land, as he suspected treachery from the Wallachians. His soldiers, together with the few survivors of the Western Crusaders, made their way to their own countries as best they could, harassed by hostile natives and wild beasts and the rigors of an early winter. The Count Palatine reached his father's castle in rags and died a few days later. Few of his fellow refugees were more fortunate. Bazit had won a great victory, but his losses had been very heavy. In his rage, remembering also the massacres committed by the Crusaders, he ordered his prisoners, to the number of three thousand, to be killed in cold blood, only sparing the few noblemen for whom a high ransom could be charged. A French knight. James of Heli, who spoke Turkish, was made to identify them and then was allowed to travel to the west to arrange for the money to be raised. It was not till the following June that a western embassy reached the Sultan at Brusa and handed over to him the vast sums that he demanded. Many sympathizers throughout Christendom sent contributions, but the greater part was paid by King Sigismund and by the Duke of Burgundy, who provided more than a million francs. The released captives reached their homes towards the end of 1397. The Crusade of Nicopolis was the largest and the last of the great international crusades. 
the pattern of its sorry history followed with melancholy accuracy that of the great disastrous crusades of the past, with the difference that the battlefield was now in Europe and not in Asia. The faults and follies had been the same. The same enthusiasm had been dissipated in quarrels, jealousy and impatience. All that the West learned from this final failure was that the holy war was practicable no more. Him at the lame there would be no more crusades. But the infidel remained threatening the heart of Christendom. He had reached the Danube and the shores of the Adriatic Sea. Constantinople was Christian still, but isolated, only spared because the Sultan had not yet artillery strong enough to batter its massive walls nor sufficient ships to interrupt its communications by sea. The knights hospitals at Rhodes and the Italian lords of the Aegean archipelago found themselves on a frontier, and Cyprus was a distant outpost. The king of Hungary, the voivodes of Wallachia and Moldavia and the chieftains of Albania sought help to defend their borders. The Italian republics were kept busy calculating what policy would best preserve their commercial interests. The Pope was deeply conscious of the threat to Christendom. But the powers of the West were no longer interested. Their last experience had been too bitter, and the enthusiasm that prompted it could not be revived after such a disaster. And even the Pope himself continually intrigued in Hungary to replace Sigismund by Ladislas of Naples, regardless of the harm that civil war would do to the defences of Central Europe. The French King who found himself from 1396 to 1409 suzerain of Genoa, was sufficiently worried about the fate of the Genoese colony at Pura, opposite Constantinople, to send Marshal Busic out with 1200 men to the Bosphorus in 1399. His presence prevented a half-hearted Turkish attempt on the imperial city, but as no one was ready to pay him or his men, he soon withdrew. The Byzantine emperor, Manuel II, then journeyed hopefully to the west to seek for help. The Italians were shocked to see how poor the heir of the Caesars had become, the Duke of Milan gave him splendid gifts that his state might be more suited to his rank. He was magnificently received at Paris and at London. But no material help was offered. The papacy was uninterested, for Manuel was too honest to promise the submission of his church to Rome, knowing that his people would not endure it. But in 1402 he hurried back to his capital cheered by news that seemed to portend the decline of the Ottoman Empire. Timur the Lame was born a petty prince of Turko Mongol descent near Samarkand in 1336. By 1369 he was sovereign of all the lands that had belonged to the Jagatai branch of the Mongols. Thenceforward he extended his dominions by ruthless warfare, slowly at first then with increasing momentum. From 1381 to 1386 he overran the lands of the Mongol Ilkhanate in Persia and in 1386 conquered Tabriz and Tiflis. For the next four years he was busy on his northern frontier. In 1392 he captured Baghdad. During the next years he campaigned in Russia against the Mongols of the Golden Horde, penetrating as far as Moscow and in 1395 he appeared in eastern Anatolia, where Ertzingen and Shivas fell to him. In 1398 he conquered northern India, in a brilliant campaign made more efficacious by ghastly massacres. In 1400 he turned westward again and swept into Syria, defeating the Mameluk armies sent against him first at Aleppo, then at Damascus, and occupying and sacking all the great cities of the province. In 1401 he punished a revolt in Baghdad by the total destruction of the city, which was only just recovering from the effect of Hulaga's conquest a century and a half before. In 1402 he returned to Anatolia, determined to conquer the Ottoman Sultan, who was the only potentate left in Islam that he had not humiliated. The decisive battle took place at Ankara on 20 July. Bayezid was utterly defeated and taken prisoner, and died in captivity a few months later. Meanwhile the Ottoman cities of Anatolia fell to the conqueror, who in December 1402, drove the knights of the hospital out of Smyrna. The Emperor Manuel had hoped that the disaster to Bayezid might end the Ottoman menace, but he was not strong enough to take action without support. The Italian republics were cautious. 
the Genoese hastened to make a treaty with Timor to preserve their Asiatic trade but, fearing for their Balkan trade and uncertain of the future, they helped to preserve Ottoman power by ferrying the remnants of Bayezid's army across to Europe. The Venetians held aloof. Their caution was justified. Timur's invasion had in fact prevented an immediate attack on Constantinople by the Sultan, and it preserved Byzantium for another half century. Had all Europe at once intervened it might have ended the Ottoman Empire. But the Turks were too well established racially in Anatolia and politically in the Balkans to be easily dislodged, nor had Timur the political genius of Genghis Khan. On his death in 1405 his empire began at once to disintegrate. The Mamluks quickly recovered Syria. In Azerbaijan the dynasty of the black sheep Turkomans arose and established a dominion from eastern Anatolia to Baghdad. There were nationalist stirrings in Persia where soon the great Safavid dynasty appeared. In Transoxiana Timur's descendants lasted on for nearly a century, but it was only in India that they founded an enduring empire. As the great Mughals of Delhi. 1444 The expedition to Varna in Anatolia The only ultimate effect of Timur's invasion was to introduce a new influx of Turks and Turkomans and thus eventually strengthen the roots of Ottoman power. When Timur died, the sons of Bayezid took over their father's inheritance. For six years they fought between themselves. The civil wars offered the Christian powers another chance of checking the further growth of Ottoman power but it was not taken. The Byzantine emperor won back by his diplomacy a few coastal cities, and the Knights of Rhodes were allowed to build a castle on the mainland opposite their island, at Bord Run, the ancient Halicarnassus. But nothing else was gained. When in 1413 Muhammad I became sole sultan the Ottoman Empire was intact. Muhammad was a peaceful ruler who avoided aggressive wars but firmly reorganized his dominions. On his death in 1421 the Ottomans were stronger than before. Muhammad's successor, Murad II, began his reign with an attempt on Constantinople. But he still lacked heavy artillery and ships, and after the Greeks had bravely defended their capital, without outside help, from June to August 1422, he abandoned the siege and concentrated his attention on conquests in the Greek peninsula, in Asia and across the Danube. In 1439 the Emperor John VIII, Manuel's successor, agreed in desperation at the Council of Florence to submit his church to Rome. His people repudiated the Union, and he received little for his pains. In 1440 Pope Eugenius IV preached a new crusade. Four years later an Albanian chieftain, Skanderbeg, declared war on the Turks and was joined by his suzerain King George of Serbia. The Pope himself and the King of Aragon promised to send ten galleys each to the east. The Hungarian army, under Sigismund's bastard, John Corvinus, surnamed Hunyadi, voivod of Transylvania for King Vladislav, prepared to make an incursion across the Danube. But after a few skirmishes the Allies lost heart and agreed to a ten years truce, which was signed at Zijedin in June 1444. Murad then prepared to lead his army away to deal with enemies in Anatolia, whereupon the paper legate with the allied army, Cardinal Julian Cesarini, persuaded its leaders that an oath sworn to an infidel was invalid, and urged them to advance. The Orthodox King of Serbia rejected such casuistry and would not allow Skanderbeg to stay with the army. John Hunyadi protested against it, but remained in command. He led the allied army of some 20,000 men, to Varna, where they arrived early in November 1444. But Murad, warned of their violation of the truce, hastened to meet them with about three times their numbers. The battle was fought on the 10th of November. The Christians resisted gallantly, and at the crisis the Sultan, who had the violated treaty borne into battle with his standard, was heard to cry, Christ if thou art God as thy followers say, punish them for their perfidy. His prayer and his numbers prevailed. The Christian allies were almost annihilated. King Vladislav, who was with his troops, was killed, together with the perfidious cardinal. 
Hunyadi himself escaped with a tiny remnant of his army. Scanderbeg's gallant efforts saved Albanian independence for another twenty years, and John Hunyadi, despite a disastrous defeat in a three days battle on the ominous field of Kosovo in 1448, kept the Sultan from crossing the Danube as long as he lived. But by the time of his death in 1456 the Turks had achieved the ambition that had dominated Islam since the days of the Prophet. In 1451 Murad II was succeeded by his son, Muhammad II, a youth of 21, of boundless energy, enterprise and ability. He made it his first object to conquer Constantinople. This is not the place to tell of the splendid, tragic story of the last days of Byzantium. The Greek divided against their rulers who had sold their church to Rome, rallied with superb courage to face their last agony. The West sent help that was hopelessly inadequate for all its bravery. The Sultan's vast resources, his careful preparations and his indomitable will were destined to carry him to triumph. Nor was his triumph one only of prestige. Byzantium had been a long time in dying but its death guaranteed that the Turks would remain in Europe. It was to give them the mastery of the eastern seas. It sounded the knell of the empires of Genoa and Venice, of the kingdom of Cyprus and of the hospital at Rhodes, and it left the Sultan free to drive his armies to the gates of Vienna. 1464, Pius II. The last crusader all over Europe the fall of Constantinople was recognized as marking the end of an era. The news was not unexpected, but it came as a bitter cause for self-reproach. Yet, except for the princes whose frontiers were immediately threatened, no one cared any longer to take action. Only the Cardinal Nuncio in Germany, the great humanist Aeneas Silvius, tried to rouse the West to its belated duty. But his speeches to the German diets bore no result, and his letters to the Pope told of his disillusion. In 1458 he himself became Pope, as Pius II. Throughout his pontificate he labored to recreate such a crusade as his great predecessors had sent forth. In 1463 his project seemed near to fruition. A timely discovery of alum mines in the Papal States provided him with unexpected revenues and threatened to break the Turkish monopoly of alum. The new Doge of Venice seemed to favor war. The King of Hungary at peace at last with the emperor, was eager for a Christian alliance. Philip, Duke of Burgundy, showed a welcome interest. The bullish illies, issued in October, mirrored the papal optimism. But as the months passed, the enthusiasm faded. Only the Hungarians, who were anyhow faced with a Turkish war, offered him material support. The Venetians hesitated. None of the Italian cities was ready to risk the loss of trade that a rupture with the Sultan would bring. Philip of Burgundy wrote that the plots of the King of France made it impossible for him to leave his lands. Valiantly the Pope determined that he would finance and lead the crusade himself. On his orders his agents assembled a fleet of galleys at Ancona, and on 18 July 1464, though he was weary and in failing health, he solemnly took the cross at a ceremony at St. Peter Apostrophes. A few days later he set out for the port of embarkation. His attendants saw that he was a dying man, so they hid the truth from him that not one of the princes of Europe had followed his example and that no armies were marching behind him to embark in his galleys for the east. Instead, as he came near to Ancona, they drew the curtains of his litter across so that he should not see out for the roads were covered with the crews from his fleet, who had deserted their ships and were hurrying homeward. He reached Ancona only to die there, on the 14th of August. He was mercifully spared the knowledge of the utter collapse of his crusade. Nearly four centuries before, Pope Urban II by his preaching had sent men in their thousands to risk their lives in the holy war. Now all that a pope who took the cross himself could raise were a few mercenaries who abandoned the cause before ever the campaign was begun. The crusading spirit was dead. Chapter of summing up that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. Ecclesiast Psi, 18 The crusades were launched to save Eastern Christendom from the Muslims. When they ended the whole of Eastern Christendom was under Muslim rule. 
when Pope Urban preached his great sermon at Clermont the Turks seemed about to threaten the Bosphorus. When Pope Pius II preached the last crusade the Turks were crossing the Danube. Of the last fruits of the movement, Rhodes fell to the Turks in 1523, and Cyprus, ruined by its wars with Egypt and Genoa and annexed at last by Venice, passed to them in 1570. All that was left to the conquerors from the west was a handful of Greek islands that Venice continued precariously to hold. The Turkish advance was checked not by any concerted effort of Christendom but by the action of the states most nearly concerned, Venice and the Habsburg Empire, with France, the old protagonist in the Holy War, persistently supporting the infidel. The Ottoman Empire began to decline through its own failure to maintain an efficient government for its great possessions, till it could no longer oppose the ambition of its neighbours nor crush the nationalist spirit of its Christian subjects, preserved by those churches whose independence the Crusaders had tried so hard to destroy. Seen in the perspective of history, the whole Crusading movement was a vast fiasco. The almost miraculous success of the First Crusade set up Frankish states in Outrema, and a century later, when all seemed lost, the gallant effort of the Third Crusade preserved them for another hundred years. But the tenuous kingdom of Jerusalem and its sister principalities were a puny outcome from so much energy and enthusiasm. For three centuries there was hardly a potentate in Europe who did not at some time vow with fervor to go on the Holy War. There was not a country that failed to send soldiers to fight for Christendom in the East. Jerusalem was in the mind of every man and woman. Yet the efforts to hold or to recapture the holy city were peculiarly capricious and inept. Nor did these efforts have the effect on the general history of the Western Europeans that might have been expected from them. The era of the Crusades is one of the most important in the history of Western civilization. When it began, Western Europe was only just emerging from the long period of barbarian invasions that we call the Dark Ages. When it ended, that great burgeoning that we call the Renaissance had just begun. But we cannot assign any direct part in this development to the Crusaders themselves. The Crusades had nothing to do with the new security in the West, which enabled merchants and scholars to travel as they pleased. There was already access to the stored up learning of the Muslim world through Spain, students, such as Gerbert of Orillac, had already visited the Spanish centers of education. Throughout the crusading period itself, it was Sicily rather than the lands of Outrema that provided a meeting place for Arab, Greek and Western culture. Intellectually, Outrema added next to nothing. It was possible for a man of the caliber of St. Louis to spend several years there without the slightest effect on his cultural outlook. If the Emperor Frederick II took an interest in Oriental civilization, that was due to his upbringing in Sicily. Nor did Outrema contribute to the progress of Western art, except in the realm of military architecture and, perhaps, in the introduction of the pointy Dutch dot in the art of warfare, apart from castle building. The West showed again and again that it learned nothing from the Crusades. The same mistakes were made by every expedition from the First Crusade to the Crusade of Nicopolis. The circumstances of warfare in the East differed so greatly from those in Western Europe that it was only the knights resident in Outrema who troubled to remember past experience. It is possible that the general standard of living in the West was raised by the desire of returning soldiers and pilgrims to copy the comforts of Outrema in their homelands. But the commerce between East and West, though it was increased by the Crusades, did not depend on them for its existence. The Crusades and the Papacy It was only in some aspects of the political development of Western Europe that the Crusades left a mark. One of Pope Urban's expressed aims in preaching the Crusades was to find some useful work for the turbulent and bellicose barons who otherwise spent their energy on civil wars at home, and the removal of large sections of that unruly element to the east undoubtedly helped the rise of monarchical power in the west, to the ultimate detriment of the papacy. But meanwhile the papacy itself benefited. The Pope had launched the Crusade as an international Christian movement under his leadership and its initial success greatly enhanced his power and prestige. The Crusaders all belonged to his flock. Their conquests were his conquests. 
as, one by one, the ancient patriarchates of Antioch, Jerusalem and Constantinople fell under his dominion, it seemed that his claim to be the head of Christendom was justified. In church affairs his dominion was vastly extended. Congregations in every part of the Christian world acknowledged his spiritual supremacy. His missionaries traveled as far afield as Ethiopia and China. The whole movement stimulated the organization of the papal chancery on a far more international basis than before, and it played a great part in the development of canon law. Had the popes been content to reap ecclesiastical benefits alone, they would have had good cause for self-congratulation. But the times were not yet ready for a clear division between ecclesiastical and lay politics, and in lay politics the papacy overreached itself. The crusade commanded respect only when it was directed against the infidel. The fourth crusade, directed, if not preached, against the Christians of the East, was followed by a crusade against the heretics of southern France and the nobles that showed them sympathy, and this was succeeded by crusades preached against the Hohenstaufen, till at last the crusade came to mean any war against the enemies of papal policy, and all the spiritual paraphernalia of indulgences and heavenly rewards was used to support the lay ambitions of the papal see. The triumph of the popes in ruining the emperors both of the east and of the west led them on into the humiliations of the Sicilian war and the captivity at Avignon. The holy war was warped to become a tragic fast dot apart from the widening of the spiritual dominion of Rome. The chief benefit obtained by western Christendom from the crusades was negative. When they began the main seats of civilization were in the east, at Constantinople and at Cairo. When they ended, civilization had moved its headquarters to Italy and the young countries of the west. The crusades were not the only cause for the decline of the Muslim world. The invasions of the Turks had already undermined the Abbasid Caliphate of Baghdad and even without the crusade they might have ultimately brought down the Fatimid Caliphate of Egypt. But had it not been for the incessant irritation of the wars against the Franks, the Turks might well have been integrated into the Arab world and provided for it a new vitality and strength without destroying its basic unity. The Mongol invasions were more destructive still to Arab civilization, and their coming cannot be blamed on the Crusades. But had it not been for the Crusades the Arabs would have been far better able to meet the Mongol aggression. The intrusive Frankish state was a festering saw that the Muslims could never forget. So long as it distracted them they could never wholly concentrate on other problems. The Crusades and Islam but the real harm done to Islam by the Crusades was subtler. The Islamic State was a theocracy whose political welfare depended on the caliphate, the line of priest kings to whom custom had given a hereditary succession. The crusading attack came when the Abbasid Caliphate was unable politically or geographically to lead Islam against it, and the Fatimid Caliphs, as heretics, could not command a wide enough allegiance. The leaders who arose to defeat the Christians, men like Nair ad din and Saladin, were heroic figures who were given respect and devotion, but they were adventurers. The Ayyubites, for all their ability, could never be accepted as the supreme rulers of Islam, because they were not caliphs, they were not even descended from the Prophet. They had no proper place in the theocracy of Islam. The Mongol destruction of Baghdad in some way eased the Muslim task. The Mamluks were able to found a durable state in Egypt because there was no longer a lawful caliphate in Baghdad but only a shadowy and spurious line that was kept in honorable confinement in Cairo. The Ottoman sultans eventually solved the problem by assuming the caliphate themselves. Their immense power made the Muslim world accept them, but never wholeheartedly, for they too were usurpers and not of the prophet's line. Christianity allowed from the outset a distinction between the things that are Caesar's and the things that are God's, and so, when the medieval conception of the undivided political city of God broke down, its vitality was unimpaired. But Islam was conceived as a political and religious unity. This unity had been cracked before the Crusades, but the events of those centuries made the cracks too wide to be mended. The great Ottoman sultans achieved a superficial repair, but only for a time. The cracks have endured to this day. Even more harmful was the effect of the holy war on the spirit of Islam. 
any religion that is based on an exclusive revelation is bound to show some contempt for the unbeliever. But Islam was not intolerant in its early days. Muhammad himself considered that Jews and Christians had received a partial revelation and were therefore not to be persecuted. Under the early caliphs the Christians played an honorable part in Arab society. A remarkably large number of the early Arabic thinkers and writers were Christians, who provided a useful intellectual stimulus, for the Muslims, with their reliance on the word of God, given once and for all time in the Quran, tended to remain static and unenterprising in their thought. Nor was the rivalry of the Caliphate with Christian Byzantium entirely unfriendly. Scholars and technicians passed to and fro between the two empires to their mutual benefit. The holy war begun by the Franks ruined these good relations. The savage intolerance shown by the Crusaders was answered by growing intolerance amongst the Muslims. The broad humanity of Saladin and his family was soon to be rare amongst their fellow believers. By the time of the Mamluks, the Muslims were as narrow as the Franks. Their Christian subjects were amongst the first to suffer from it. They never recovered their old easy acquaintanceship with their Muslim neighbors and masters. Their own intellectual life faded away, and with it the widening influence that it had upon Islam. Except in Persia, with its own disquieting heretic traditions, the Muslims enclosed themselves behind the curtain of their faith and an intolerant faith is incapable of progress. The harm done by the Crusades to Islam was small in comparison with that done by them to Eastern Christendom. Pope Urban II had bidden the Crusaders go forth that the Christians of the East might be helped and rescued. It was a strange rescue, for when the work was over, Eastern Christendom lay under infidel domination and the Crusaders themselves had done all that they could to prevent its recovery. When they set themselves up in the east they treated their Christian subjects no better than the Caliph had done before them. Indeed, they were sterner, for they interfered in the religious practices of the local churches. When they were rejected they left the local Christians unprotected to bear the wrath of the Muslim conquerors. It is true that the native Christians themselves earned a fuller measure of this wrath by their desperate belief that the Mongols would give them the lasting freedom that they had not obtained from the Franks. Their penalty was severe and complete. Weighed down by cruel restrictions and humiliations they dwindled into unimportance. Even their land was punished. The lovely Syrian coastline was ravaged and left desolate. The holy city itself sank neglected into a long, untranquil decline. The Crusades and Eastern Christendom The tragedy of the Syrian Christians was incidental to the failure of the Crusades but the destruction of Byzantium was the result of deliberate malice. The real disaster of the Crusades was the inability of Western Christendom to comprehend Byzantium. Throughout the ages there have always been hopeful politicians who believe that if only the peoples of the world could come together they would love and understand each other. It is a tragic delusion. So long as Byzantium and the West had little to do with each other their relations were friendly. Western pilgrims and soldiers of fortune were welcomed in the imperial city and went home to tell of its splendors, but there were not enough of them to make friction. There were occasional bones of contention between the Byzantine emperor and the western powers, but either the bone was dropped in time or some tactful formula for its division was devised. There were constant religious issues exacerbated by the claims of the Hildebrandine papacy. But even there, with goodwill on both sides, some working arrangement could have been made. But with the Norman determination to expand into the eastern Mediterranean a new disquieting era began. Byzantine interests were flung into sharp conflict with those of a western people. The Normans were checked, and the Crusades were launched as a peacemaking move. But there was misunderstanding from the outset. The emperor thought that it was his Christian duty to restore his frontiers to be a bulwark against the Turks, whom he considered to be the enemy. The crusaders wished to push on to the Holy Land. They had come to fight the holy war against the infidels of every race. While their leaders failed to appreciate the emperor's policy, thousands of soldiers and pilgrims found themselves in a land where the language the customs and the religion seemed to them strange and incomprehensible and therefore wrong. 
they expected the peasants and citizens in the territory through which they passed not only to resemble them but also to welcome them. They were doubly disappointed. Quite failing to realize that their thieving and destructive habits could not win them the affection or the respect of their victims, they were hurt, angry and envious. Had it been left to the choice of the ordinary crusading soldier Constantinople would have been attacked and sacked at a far earlier date. But the leaders of the crusade were at first too conscious of their Christian duty and restrained their followers. Louis VII refused to accept the advice of some of his nobles and bishops to take arms against the Christian city, and though Frederick Barbarossa toyed with the idea, he controlled his anger and passed by. It was left to the greedy cynics that directed the Fourth Crusade to take advantage of a momentary weakness in the Byzantine state to plot and achieve its destruction. The Latin Empire of Constantinople, conceived in sin, was a puny child for whose welfare the West eagerly sacrificed the needs of its children in the Holy Land. The popes themselves were far more anxious to keep the unwilling Greeks under their ecclesiastical rule than to rescue Jerusalem. When the Byzantines recovered their capital Western pontiffs and politicians alike worked hard to restore Western control. The crusade had become a movement not for the protection of Christendom but for the establishment of the authority of the Roman Church. The ruin of Byzantium The determination of the Westerners to conquer and colonize the lands of Byzantium was disastrous for the interests of Outrema. It was more disastrous still for European civilization. Constantinople was still the center of the civilized Christian world. In the pages of Vilhardun we see reflected the impression that it made on the knights that had come from France and Italy to conquer it. They could not believe that so superb a city could exist on earth, it was of all cities the sovereign. Like most barbarian invaders, the men of the Fourth Crusade did not intend to destroy what they found they meant to share in it and dominate it. But their greed and their clumsiness led them to indulge in irreparable destruction. Only the Venetians, with their higher level of culture, knew what it would be most profitable to save. Italy, indeed, reaped some benefit from the decline and fall of Byzantium. The Frankish settlers in Byzantine lands, though they brought a superficial and romantic vitality to the hills and valleys of Greece, were unfitted to understand the long Greek tradition of culture. But the Italians, whose connections with Greece had never been broken for long, were better able to appreciate the value of what they took, and when the decline of Byzantium meant the dispersal of its scholars, they found a welcome in Italy. The spread of humanism in Italy was an indirect result of the Fourth Crusade. The Italian Renaissance is a matter of pride for mankind. But it would have been better could it have been achieved without the ruin of Eastern Christendom. Byzantine culture survived the shock of the Fourth Crusade. In the 14th and early 15th centuries Byzantine art and thought flowered in splendid profusion. But the political basis of the empire was insecure. Indeed, since 1204 it was no longer an empire but one state amongst many others as strong or stronger. Faced with the hostility of the West and the rivalry of its Balkan neighbors, it could no longer guard Christendom against the Turks. It was the Crusaders themselves who willfully broke down the defense of Christendom and thus allowed the infidel to cross the straits and penetrate into the heart of Europe. The true martyrs of the Crusade were not the gallant knights who fell fighting at the horns of Hatton or before the towers of Acar, but the innocent Christians of the Balkans, as well as of Anatolia and Syria who were handed over to persecution and slavery. To the crusaders themselves their failures were inexplicable. They were fighting for the cause of the Almighty, and if faith and logic were correct, that cause should have triumphed. In the first flush of success they entitled their chronicles the Gesta di Francos, God's work done by the hand of the Franks. But after the first crusade there followed a long train of disasters and even the victories of the Third Crusade were incomplete and unsure. There were evil forces about which thwarted God's work. At first the blame could be laid on Byzantium, on the schismatic emperor and his ungodly people who refused to recognize the divine mission of the Crusaders. But after the Fourth Crusade that excuse could no longer be maintained, yet things went steadily worse. 
moralist preachers might claim that God was angry with his warriors because of their sins. There was some truth in this, but as complete explanation it collapsed when St. Louis led his army into one of the greatest disasters that the Crusaders ever underwent, for St. Louis was a man whom the medieval world believed to be without sin. In fact it was not so much wickedness as stupidity that ruined the holy wars. Yet such is human nature that a man will admit far more readily to being a sinner than a fool. No one amongst the crusaders would admit that their real crimes were a willful and narrow ignorance and an irresponsible lack of foresight. The chief motive that impelled the Christian armies eastward was faith. But the sincerity and simplicity of their faith led them into pitfalls. It carried them through incredible hardships to victory on the first crusade whose success seemed miraculous. The crusaders therefore expected that miracles would continue to save them when difficulties arose. Their confidence made them foolhardy, and even to the end, at Nicopolis as at Antioch, they were certain that they would receive divine support. Again, their faith by its very simplicity made them intolerant. Their god was a jealous god they could never conceive it possible that the God of Islam might be the same power. The colonists settled in Outrema might reach a wider view, but the soldiers from the west came to fight for the Christian God, and to them anyone who showed tolerance to the infidel was a traitor. Even those that worshipped the Christian God in a different ritual were suspect and deplored of the lack of a leader this genuine faith was often combined with unashamed greed. Few Christians have ever thought it in Congress to combine God's work with the acquisition of material advantages. That the soldiers of God should extract territory and wealth from the infidel was right. It was justifiable to rob the heretic and the schismatic also. Worldly ambitions helped to produce the gallant adventurousness on which much of the early success of the movement was based. But greed and the lust for power are dangerous masters. They breed impatience for man's life is short and he needs quick results. They breed jealousy and disloyalty, for offices and possessions are limited, and it is impossible to satisfy every claimant. There was a constant feud between the Franks already established in the East and those that came out to fight the infidel and to seek their fortune. Each saw the war from a different point of view. In the turmoil of envy, distrust and intrigue few campaigns had much chance of success. Quarrels and inefficiency were enhanced by ignorance. The colonists slowly adapted themselves to the ways and the climate of the Levant, they began to learn how their enemies fought and how to make friends with them. But the newly come crusader found himself in an utterly unfamiliar world, and he was usually too proud to admit his limitations. He disliked his cousins of Outremer and would not listen to them. So expedition after expedition made the same mistakes and reached the same sorry end. Powerful and intelligent leadership might have saved the movement. But the feudal background from which the Crusaders were drawn made it difficult for a leader to be accepted. The Crusades were the Pope's work, but paper legates were seldom good generals. There were many able men amongst the kings of Jerusalem, but they had little authority over their own subjects and none over their visiting allies. The military orders, who provided the finest and most experienced soldiers, were independent and jealous of each other. National armies led by a king seemed at one time to offer a better weapon, but though Richard of England, who was a soldier of genius, was one of the few successful commanders amongst the Crusaders, the other royal expeditions were without exception disastrous. It was difficult for any monarch to go campaigning for long in lands so far from his own. Curd alliance and St. Louis sojourns in the East were made at the expense of the welfare of England and France. The financial cost, in particular, was appallingly high. The Italian cities could make the Crusades a profitable affair, and independent nobles who hoped to found estates or marry heiresses in Outrema might find their outlay returned. But to send the royal army overseas was a costly undertaking with very little hope of material recompense. Special taxes must be raised throughout the kingdom. It was not surprising that practical minded kings, such as Philip IV of France, preferred to raise the taxes and then stay at home. The ideal leader, a great soldier and diplomat, 
with time and money to spend in the East and a wide understanding of Eastern ways, was never to be found. It was indeed less remarkable that the crusading movement faded away in failure than that it should ever have met with success, and that, with scarcely one victory to its credit after its spectacular foundation, Outer Ema should have lasted for two hundred years. The triumphs of the crusade were the triumphs of faith. But faith without wisdom is a dangerous thing. By the inexorable laws of history, the whole world pays for the crimes and follies of each of its citizens. In the long sequence of interaction and fusion between Orient and Occident out of which our civilization has grown, the Crusades were a tragic and destructive episode. The historian as he gazes back across the centuries at their gallant story must find his admiration overcast by sorrow at the witness that it bears to the limitations of human nature. There was so much courage and so little honor, so much devotion and so little understanding. High ideals were besmirched by cruelty and greed, enterprise and endurance by a blind and narrow self righteousness, and the holy war itself was nothing more than a long act of intolerance in the name of God, which is the sin against the Holy Ghost. Appendix the Intellectual life in Outrema in comparison with the intellectual life of Sicily or of Spain, that of Outrema is disappointing. It might have been expected that, as at Palermo, the contact between Franks and Orientals might have stimulated intellectual activity, but in fact the society of Outrema, which consisted almost entirely of soldiers and merchants, was not fitted to create or maintain a high intellectual standard. Amongst the princes and the nobility there were many men of culture. For example, we are told that King Baldwin III and King Amalric I were both devoted to letters. Reynold of Sidon was notorious for his interest in Islamic learning, while Humphrey IV of Tehran had a perfect knowledge of the Arabic language. And Outrema produced one of the greatest of medieval historians in William of Tyre. But we know very little about education in Outrema. As in the West there were undoubtedly schools attached to the chief cathedrals. But it is significant that William of Tyre went as a boy to France to be educated, and, apart from him, all the ecclesiastics who played a prominent part in the history of Outrema were men born and brought up in the West. Many of these prelates, such as the Patriarch Amory of Antioch, were interested in literature, or like James of Vitry, Bishop of Acre in the 13th century, in the scientific life going on around him and the various schemes for the later crusades encouraged an active interest in oriental geography. But on the whole Frankish culture in Outrema remained an occidental importation, with very little contact with native culture, except in the arts. Medicine was left entirely in native hands. The princes seem always to have employed Syrian Christian doctors. When Amalric I rejected his Syrian doctor's advice and consulted a Frank, he died of it, and the examples that Uzama gives of Frankish doctoring show it to have been remarkably crude. The Franks seem to have made no attempt, as in southern Italy, to learn from native medicine, though a certain Stephen of Antioch seems to have translated a medical treatise from the Arabic in 1227. There is no record of any effort by the Franks, apart from a few nobles to study local philosophy or scientific knowledge. The literary products of Frankish Outrema fall under three headings. First, there are the chronicles and histories. These, with the great exception of William of Tyre's history, and the work of some of his continuators, such as Ernul, were written by men born in the West and are in the tradition of Western chronicle writing. Secondly, there is a large crop of legal works. The colonists and their descendants were deeply interested in legal and constitutional matters, and were anxious to have their opinions and findings written down, to an extent unparalleled in the West. But the law that they reproduce is purely Western, though it showed some necessary adjustments. Finally, there was popular and romantic poetry. The colonists in Outrema loved the romantic epics of the time. Several troubadours and minziners, such as Rudel or Albert of Johannesdorf, went on the Crusades. Raymond, Prince of Antioch, was the son of the eminent troubadour poet, William IX of Aquitaine. The stirring events of the Crusades were admirably suited to enrich the themes of which the poets sang. 
Godfrey of Lorraine soon became a legendary hero, whose adventures were incorporated into the cycle of the Chevalier au Signe. Poems about his youth and ancestry were already in circulation in the East when William of Tyre wrote his history. But these poems were composed in the West. Similarly, the two versified accounts of the First Crusade, the Chanson d'Antioch and the Chanson de Jerusalem, were both almost certainly composed in the West, on information brought back by returning crusaders. The one epic which originated in Outrema is the Chanson des Chetifs, a curious story of crusaders made captive by Corbran Kerbuga, in which the stories of the First Crusade and the Crusades of 1101 have become inextricably mixed. This poem was composed by an author whose name is unknown, at the express desire of Prince Raymond of Antioch. It was still unfinished when Raymond died in 1149. The muddled inaccurate historical basis of the story suggests that the author was a newcomer to the East. The Franks found a romantic fascination in the fate of Christian captives in Muslim hands. The theme of the Chetifs was one which therefore enjoyed great popularity in Outrema as well as in Europe. Outrema produced other poetical works, but none of the known authors was born in the East. Philip of Novara, statesman, chronicler, and jurist who was Italian by birth but wrote in French, inserted verse of his own lively if not very poetical composition into his chronicle. Philip of Nantil, when captive at Cairo, wrote nostalgic poems about his French homeland. But, though Philip of Novara can be regarded as one of the founders of the provincial Frankish culture of Cyprus, the literature of Outrema is simply a branch of the literature of France. There was no indigenous literature amongst the Franks' native subjects in Syria, though in Cyprus and in Greece itself there grew up under Frankish domination a semi-popular Greek literature strongly affected by Frankish influences. The intellectual life of our dreamer was, in fact, that of a Frankish colony. The courts of the kings and princes had a certain cosmopolitan glamour, but the number of resident scholars in our dreamer was small and wars and financial difficulties prevented the institution of real centers of study where native and neighboring learning could have been absorbed. It was the absence of these centers that made the cultural contribution of the Crusades to Western Europe so disappointingly small.